will catch it. Easier, very easy. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Good morning to everybody, our esteemed guests, our esteemed colleagues at head office, teachers, my colleagues, a warm, 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 heartfelt welcome to all of you. Ishmael Talaria, it's happening. Physical Conference, Education Conference of 2022. Halalala! Halalala! It's happening. A dream of him. He will differ from me a bit. He'll tell me he organized a physical education conference, but sir, that was itself. This is the one. This is the one with all the guests here. So I am Jorita Hanakum, and my co host on my left is. Jamil Landis, and the two of us will be your program directors for the following two days. So sit back, don't relax. Over the two days, I would love you to think about the question, what is quality physical education? What is quality education? I'll remind you in the words of my colleague Colin Green, quality physical education teaches lifetime activities that promote the health and personal well being of every learner in every classroom and at every school. It prepares our youngsters for future activities as adults. This program offers much more than just sport activities. Ask any sport personality that was spotted in a phys ed class. We all know cooperation precedes competition. Learners does not naturally feel, they don't perceive themselves as being successful. Think about the role of phys ed. And lastly, quality physical education. Quality physical education looks to the future, the future of every learner and in every classroom at every school. So I wish you a happy conference. Get on board and go with us on the journey of igniting the passion to performance in physical education. And on this note, I'll give it over to my esteemed colleague, 
to introduce our quality first speaker. Just before, uh, I think Ishmael reminded me just to say that because of COVID-19, we couldn't invite every teacher like we wished we could. But sitting here, it means you are special. You were invited because you are special. I hope you feel special. Over to you, Jamil. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Jurita, for that lovely introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, to officially welcome us, is someone who in 2020 was named by the Malian Guardian as one of the 50 powerful women in South Africa in her field. In the last two years, I've watched how she's able to excite us via Microsoft Teams with every GT CSF. Now, those of you who know anything about Microsoft Teams, it is very tricky to get anyone excited, even with all your fancy backgrounds. <laughs> of course, she has a passion for education, but something that excites me is a general zest for life. I'm not sure if there'll be any jamming tunes or she'll expect you to dance, but it gives me great pleasure to introduce the director of GET at the Department of Education, Ms. Gordon Dudley. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Now, if you know anything about me, um, as Jamila said, he doesn't know if you are going to get up and rock the day away here. What does she have in store? Now, my darlings, this is a momentous occasion. This is an auspicious occasion. And so, I'm going to ask you, get up on your feet, come on. This is not now I know WCD. Come on, my darlings, this is physical education. I see a couple of them getting up a little. Ooh, that's great. right -o, and say, hashtag Phys Ed Rocks. Can I hear you? Hashtag Phys Ed Rocks. Come on, say it like you mean it. Hashtag Phys Ed Rocks. Come on, woo! Awesome, grab your seat, your comfort zone. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Western Cape Education Department, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you, as I've noted, to this auspicious occasion, the Physical Education Conference. And so this is a first, I want to agree with you, Rita, a first for the head office. We've had practical ones, yes, and that will follow later in July. And so as I want to acknowledge this morning, our Deputy Director General, and now ladies and gentlemen, when you see the next speaker come up, say good things. That's my boss. Okay, don't forget. You know, IQMS, PMDS, uh, I think we've got a deal. Do we have a deal there? Show me a thumbs up. Uh, there's it, there's it, no nepotism involved here. <laughs> All right, so ladies and gentlemen, we are extremely honored and privileged to be able to host this physical education conference for Western Cape Education Department together with all of our stakeholders. You see, this is not only our, uh, our conference in terms of WCED, it is all of our conference. It is a whole of society approach. When we gather together like this, we are like-minded people, and so we are a community of practice. Because a community of practice is where like-minded people come together to be able to ensure that we take the system forward, that we implement what we talk about, and that we bring about policy, change and that is what we want to do here today this is what we are saying we stand publicly on this particular platform today ladies and gentlemen and make that particular announcement and so it's absolutely exciting i'm extremely thrilled i really want to congratulate mr ismail taladia who heads our uh, life skills life orientation as well as mr ivan fortain for fet and the amazing team can we give it up for them come on guys and I noticed, Ismail, I'm a little surprised. This crowd is a little reserved. So we'll have to rock their, their, their boat a, a little bit over the weekend. They're not used to standing and saying, so let's do it one more time. Give it up for Ismail and uh, Ivan. Come on. Look, there we go. Oh, my word. 
I must say, when I was introduced, uh, the ego took a little bit of a damage there, but I just heard these very faint little, now darlings, we're not here. We're going to rock the system. If we're the movers and shakers and the trailblazers of this province, then there's no way we're going to stand and say, I think that uh, in the year 2023, we really need to implement this into policy. Ah, oh, come on, get behind it. Let me hear some oomph in that voice and say, we're going to get this right. I want to be part of this journey. Do you want to be part of it? Oh man, babies, now my heart is beating. If you hear a thump, it's my heartbeat, it's nothing else, he smell. That's all I'm saying. So ladies and gentlemen, as we gathered here, I think we know the importance and that is why we as like-minded people are here today. We know that physical activity promotes healthy habits. And that's what we want to be. We know the way a child, the way an adult, the way humans react, a lot of it is by form of habit. And so if we get that into them, it's part of their mindset. That already has an impression if we lead by example, not by what we say, but by what we do. And so one of the outcomes, I know Ismail will unpack it a little more, is physical activity and the role that it plays both in the teacher, in the adult, in the guardian, as well as in the learner's lives in terms of healthy habits. Another one that I really just want to touch on very briefly in my introduction of welcome is it positively impacts their mental well-being. Now we know later Mr. Mohammed may make reference to what are the three objectives of our HOD, our head of department, Mr. Brent Walters. And while him and the broad management team have agreed to these three outcomes, one of them are psychosocial support, psychosocial support. And so that is part of what the advantages of physical education brings. Besides the healthy habits, we also talk, ladies and gentlemen, about it positively impacts their mental well-being. And I think that fits in perfectly into what we call the wagon wheel and one of the three main objectives. Third one, physical active students perform better academically. And now I'm preaching here to the converted, obviously. You know, and so you'll notice when you take people into a zone of where they are comfortable and you challenge them, some people will either rise to the occasion and others will say, that's really not for me, it's okay, I'm fine, I've had my day. Darlings, you are, the day you've had your day is when they either cremate you or they put you six foot under, then your day is over. Otherwise, each day is a new opportunity. Each day is a day to reinvent yourself. Each day is a day of purpose that your creator has you here and for you to impact and change education. And so physical activity, imagine what that impact that you have, whether you be at a higher education institution, whether you be at a school, an NGO, an NPO, whether you in whichever social group, what impact are you having in terms of this? Fourth, I just want to mention five of them. It helps in morale development and strengthen peer relations. One of the greatest things for me is when I can take a youngster and they don't, and I empower them and strengthen them where they don't have to buckle to peer pressure and they can stand up for whom they are and whom they believe in what changes society. And of course, guiding them within those parameters. And that's the power that you have. That's the power of physical education. It's not just running around a track. It's not doing physical exercises, but it starts and there are particular steps, how we change with mind step, how we change with habits, how we lead by example, how we find purpose, how we include it in academic achievement, not I you can gain a bursary because of great uh, sporting performance, yes, but coupled with that, the academic performance of that as well. And last but not least, ladies and gentlemen, it helps students with self-discipline and other personal development skills. We talk about self-regulated learning uh, in the FET phase, in the GET phase, we talk about self-directed learning, but in order to help self-directed learning and self-regulated learning, you need self-discipline. And that is what this is all about here. And so I think that is why we celebrate, because this entity of people here in this room today 
in this auditorium and those watching on the live stream, ladies and gentlemen, which by the way, Mr. Tuladia right now is over uh, 800 and climbing, I do believe, I've just received the figures. And so the whole rationale of this particular conference, ladies and gentlemen, is to ensure that all children can move effectively and safely and that the outcome of physical literacy we talk about visual literacy, we talk about auditory literacy, but today we also, in the next two days, we're going to talk about physical literacy and its effect and how children can move effectively, efficiently, and safely. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it's an absolute buzz to have you here today. You might have thought that I'm going to come up here and be all officious, I hope. This is my cool side, by the way, so I hope it was cool, Ismail. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it's wonderful. We'd have loved to have had this auditorium packed, but we do know due to COVID regulations we're not allowed to. And so when Ismail came to us last year when we were doing our operational planning and he said to me, Corin, we've got to make it happen. It's two years we haven't had it. And I said, Ismail, let's do this. And we had the support of our DDG. And I think then the sky is not even the limit. People always say the sky's the limit. I say, no, the sky's not the limit. Don't tell me the sky's the limit when there are footprints on the moon. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote address to you for the day. I do bring to you apologies from our head of education. And Mr. Mohammed will tell you a little more about that. But as noted earlier, ladies and gentlemen, our keynote speaker for today is the Deputy Director General, Mr. Harun Mohanamad, who heads our particular branch, Deputy Director General for Curriculum Management, Teacher Development and Exams at the Western Cape Education Department. I don't know how he gets time to hike and to run and to play tennis and to swim with having such a huge portfolio and an absolute wonderful author and poet at the same time. So let me tell you a little bit about this gentleman who leads this esteemed team as an esteemed leader. Harun Mohammed assumed the duty as Deputy Director General for Curriculum Management and Teacher Development on the 1st of September 2021. The position he held before then, ladies and gentlemen, was as Chief Director for Curriculum and Teacher Development. He served on numerous platforms, we actually stole him from DBE, so we're very glad that he came down to Cape Town. I think he's glad about it too, because I mean, Cape Town's the best, don't you agree? Fantastic. So ladies and gentlemen, he's held a number of portfolios at Basic Education Executive Director. He served on ministerial review teams. He also served on the ministerial review for Curriculum 2005 and headed its teacher development working group. He holds two master's degrees from the University of Witwatersrand and the University of London. His qualification includes a BA HDIP, uh, he has a B.Ed. and M.Ed. diploma in strategic management and leadership. Mr. Mohammed has taught English at primary and secondary schools since 1979. Kim, were you born then, darling? All right, so now you, you're in the company of legends. All right, Mr. Mohammed has also lectured in humanities at a teacher training college and worked in an NGO in a range of community-based and non-formal programs. He has published many articles on curriculum and teacher development and sports development. He enjoys community work, is an avid soccer player, professional soccer player, uh, or should I say in his more youthful day, he's still very youthful, but when he wasn't so tied up in curriculum and examinations. And as well, at the moment, he coaches a junior soccer team. Once again, lectured in humanities, no matter what the bureaucratic uh, title is, ladies and gentlemen. At the end of the day, I know Mr. Mohammed says, I want to go back to the grassroots so I experience the child and where they find themselves in today's society. And so he enjoys reading, writing. He's got a beautiful book on poetry, uh, hike and being in nature. Ladies and gentlemen, remember what I said to you, be nice. Come on, I want the house to come down. Give it up for our DDG, Mr. Harun Mohammed. Good morning, everybody. Um, with a warm reception like that, I'm under pressure. <laughs> so um, let me see if I'm 
connected nicely. Yeah. Okay, so program director, uh, teachers. Uh, I've met many of you on uh, occasions um, on the life orientation, so good to reconnect with you again. Subject advisors, the colleagues from the higher education institutions, uh, specialists in the field, uh, presenters from across the spectrum. Let me uh, say good morning, Khoyamura Morweni. Let's hope everyone is well and adjusting to the context of uh, lighter pandemic uh, restrictions. Uh, and I'm particularly excited about being able to go and watch some live sport again. <laughs> um, yeah, but as uh, Ms. Dudley was mentioning, we are on a, on a slightly lighter footing in regard to the pandemic. Um, but one of the good things for me, one of the blessings of the pandemic is that it reminded us, one of the lessons of the pandemic is that it reminded us of the importance of psychosocial well-being and taking care of the people around us. And so let's not forget that because what what one of the tendencies I'm seeing is that with the return to the old normality, we then go back to old uh, bad habits. And so, you know, let's have the necessary sense of empathy and solidarity with each one of us. Thank you very much for the opportunity to make a few remarks at this important conference. And if you look at the program, I had a closer look at it yesterday. It's a very, very impressively um, organized uh, uh, event. And I am sure by the time you leave tomorrow, you will be leaving much more enlightened and informed and hopefully um, having made a contribution um, to the main objective of this particular conference. So. How can we strengthen the availability, for me, the importance of this conference is how can we strengthen the availability of and increase lifelong participation and competence in physical activities among all our learners, but also our educators and parents and citizens. And so, Ismail, for the next conference, please allow me to come with my tracksuit top, or oh, my tracksuit, <laughs> and everybody else as well. Okay. Um, then the outline of my presentation, I'm going to make a couple of comments around the aim of the conference and the processes, a couple of contextual points, and some points to consider um, as I complete um, the presentation. I know um, that, you know, this is a very, very strong lineup. Some of the things I'm going to be saying are things that are well known to all of you, but sometimes it's just worth um, going through some of them again. So why am I getting, yeah, okay, so for me, if nothing else in my presentation and nothing else uh, in this conference uh, comes through, the aim is let's boost physical education. As um, I think Jamil was saying, let's ignite, or uh, Dorita was saying, let's ignite the passion. And what I thought I'll do is just unpack that particular phrase. So if you look at the word boost, the word boost implies that something exists already, okay, because it needs to be boosted up. And although it exists, there are possibilities and opportunities for improvement. And if you look at some of the information I'm going to be sharing with you in a short while, you'll see that that is indeed the case. That we do have an already established environment. It's a complicated environment, as complicated as our country, as complicated as our world. Um, but there are gaps. Otherwise, we wouldn't be sitting here. And there are opportunities for us to improve. And then um, on the physical, oops, sorry, it's going too quickly. If, if you unpack the word physical education, I, I just Googled yesterday for the information that I've shared with you here today, so I didn't have the chance to go through journals as I would normally do. But this is the inv uh, one, one definition that came through which I liked. It says physical education provides cognitive content and instruction designed to develop motor skills, knowledge, behaviors for physical activity and physical fitness. I'm going to come back to the issue of cognitive um, content uh, later on. So, um, as Karen was pointing out, and I think all of you know very well, each one of us, I think, is, a, is an expression of that, appropriate physical activity boosts overall well-being, health, and provides joy to both the participant and the observer. I'm sure you all agree with that particular point, and there's, you know, um, millions of pieces of literature that confirms that. South Africa is a sports crazy nation. Am I right? Yeah? Okay. Um, according to this definition, it's practi practically a religion. The most popular spectator sports being soccer. Because I come from a soccer background, I, I am aware at the last point of research that there are three million players, so that, uh, uh, soccer players in South Africa, the, um, uh, the biggest, probably the biggest institution in the country in terms of active participation. I think rugby is about a million. I may be wrong. I, 
uh, tried to find some information and that's what I could get. I couldn't get any information on cricket, but as you know, that's the big three in South Africa. But we also know, uh, and just to indicate that in those three codes, we're one of the few countries in the world that has participated in all in the World Cups for these for these uh, um, competitions. So you know, it's a plus on our side, opportunity for us to say that there is space for us to take sports education further. But as you know, we've got athletics, basketball, boxing, golf, netball, swimming, surfing, and tennis. According to the sources, those are the next big codes in South Africa. Okay, just over 50% of children aged 9 to 11 in South Africa have participated in team sport. That's a good figure. And what this uh, study says is that it's similar to studies in more developed countries. So that's an interesting one because, you know, if you look at definitions of countries, South Africa is regarded as a developmental state. Four-fifths of our system is in the developing part. One-fifth is in the highly developed part. But on the sporting side of it, that's a good statistic for us to have. And then just the other interesting one is the girls are less likely to participate in South Africa in team sport, uh, which may be uh, explained by factors such as accessibility and self-perception. So that's another gap that we need to look at in this conference and in the work going forward, more opportunities for, for women and girls. Um, South Africa is lower to middle income country with rising childhood obesity. The figures that they show are quite low for the age group. It's about 3%, but it's rising. Among the older children, I think it's a much more serious problem. Uh, it's a growing worldwide problem. And so this conference becomes important again in the light of the need for us to, to tackle that particular issue. Um, the article which, from which I drew this information is titled Factors Associated with Team Sport Participation in South Africa. I think it's a group of UCT colleagues and others. So just, just couldn't obviously bring all the information in. Then the other interesting thing is that in the context of pandemic, there are increased behavioral changes. So we're quite lucky here as senior managers, although we don't physically get to all the schools, all 1,519 schools in the province, we do get a lot of information. And a lot of the information in the last two, three weeks with the full return of children to school is that the children are coming back with a lot of behavioral challenges. Those of you who are in the classroom will uh, attest to that. Now the reason I mention that is because I think physical education um, has a role to play in addressing that particular phenomenon. And I know from my own experience, well-structured physical activity just calms people down, it gives them something to engage in and so on and so on. Okay, so it gives us the opportunity to, to address that particular one. Then I just want to share a couple of um, what I would call skim over generalizations uh, in the context of what we're talking about. So for me, there are base structures and traditions in all the est uh, established Olympic codes in the country. So if you look at South Africa, irrespective of our poverty and inequality, you can go to anywhere. I mean, I drive on the N2 often, and you know what gobsmacks me is you'll see little children next to the highway on the smallest patch, rockiest patch, playing a game of soccer all over the place. If you drive past Kailicha, Crossroads, all of those areas. So wherever you go, you will find sport in some form or, or the other being played in South Africa, and there is some base from which to work on, albeit uneven. But even if you look at non-Olympic sports, there's quite a strong base in South Africa, as well as we've now got a well-established tradition of indigenous games, and I'd like you to look at the website on um, the South African uh, Department of Sport and so on, a lot of activities and so on. There are federations, albeit you know, we can be critical of the way they operate and lots of con controversies and dramas and all of that. Associations, organizations, clubs and communities, wherever you go. So, and although it's on an uneven playing field, the base structure for taking forward the work of this conference, as I'm indicating, exists. The history of uh, physical education broadly in South Africa for me is the following. We've got some very strong traditions, strong resourcing and achievements in some parts of the system. So if you take the best parts of su the South African system, some of the facilities and some of the uh, achievements and also some of the traditions that have been established can compare favorably with some of the best in the world. So if you, if you take our um, rugby and cricket teams, even though they're not number one as often as we would like them to be, they're in the top ranking countries. If you take hockey, you take um, some of our swimmers, and so on and so on. Oops, now my thing has disappeared. 
Okay, but there's also weaknesses um, in, in other parts of the system that this process can contribute towards. And then physical education, as you know, with the change in 1994 and the change in the curriculum and so on, in the Department of Basic Education and the then Deputy Minister of Education, Mr. Enver Suti, used to keep putting pressure on us. I was in the Teacher Development Directorate um, on the importance and the need for uh, reviving physical education. So that momentum has actually um, taken off, but the rate and the quality of the progress we're making is low. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why we're gathering here today, because we want to make a contribution to increasing the rate of the ability of the system to deliver on physical education, um, as well as the quality. Okay, for me, there is an abundance of talent nationally and provincially. In fact, one of my colleagues pointed out, I'm just trying to get confirmation of that, that the Western Cape is one of the strongest suppliers of uh, talent in certain codes. Okay, so I don't know whether that stat statistic is true or not, but the amount of talent in this province is immense. I, I work in the soccer field, I travel around to a lot of the, the areas, and I know there's a debate about uh, why there are not more uh, players from the Western Cape region in the national setups and in the clubs and so on, but what I see on the fields from the poorest areas to the most is the talent is just phenomenal in this province, in, in, in the soccer area, but I can say the same for rugby because I have a little bit of contact with that one as well. With which to take the specialized part of the physical education work further um, and enough for us to, to warrant the work that we're doing in this conference. Okay, and just to indicate that WCED is committed to the boost up. Our ASG, Mr. Walters, sent an, sent an apology, he's not feeling too well, but he, in his young days, was an avid table tennis player and actually, my first meeting with him was at a table tennis tournament here in Weinberg. And I remember his sister, I think, was a national champion. So he knows the ins and outs of it, and he uses uh, the, uh, uh, a sports metaphor often to compare educational performance. And he's saying that anybody, anybody has the potential, if you give them the right kind of structure, to move from where they are to at least an average level of competence. And I agree with him completely. So you have our support, is the point I'm making. Um, and we would like to see uh, Mr. Teladia and Mr. Fortain and all the other colleagues after this conference, quite a number of things. I'll say a few things about our sense. On the next two slides, you'll get a copy of the presentation. I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but what I thought is useful to do, since we are taking the time out to, um, to reflect on the work that we're doing, is just to go back and ask yourself the question, what are the benefits of what we're doing or what, what we're intending to do, but also to look at the negative sides of it because there are, there are negative sides of it. So just a couple of points so that may, which may not have been mentioned. Physical education has a fantastic role to play in the formation of character. And if you don't mind, a slight diversion, I'm just gonna share with you an example. At the moment, I'm involved in a little bit of work in capturing the history of the federation that I played in. Unfortunately, what happened after uh, unity talks is the, the federation I played in was a non-racial structure. We were involved in the establishment of football on a non-racial basis uh, prior to the demise of apartheid. And that structure has actually collapsed. And so we're now in the process of trying to rebuild the history. And I was having a discussion with one of my, my colleagues and I used to be a player coach at the time. And at the time I was less informed but because we used to have only a 40 meter square to train in, and you had to compete with about 10 other clubs, and in winter time, the, the, the dust was so heavy, you couldn't actually see. So, you know, you're a professional club, you've got 40 square meters to practice in. Those of you who know the arena will know it's completely inadequate, but then you've got the dust to contend with. So what we did was, we went on long, um, long distance running, and I d discovered in my latest studies that long distance running is actually counterproductive to football development. But what he, what, what he said to me is, Harun, no, don't be disappointed by the fact that you did that. Because what it did for us, uh, and the club was comprised of players who came from um, different areas. So some of the players used to travel 10, 15 kilometers to come, to come for training in and through the Johannesburg traffic. He said to me, no, no, you know, an abiding memory for me is the character building that that road running did. So I'm just you know, indicating that 
physical education has, a, has that particular value. I'm just sharing with you an example of um, how that can, can happen. The others are, I think, quite clear. It's pleasurable to do physical activities. I know from my own experience, some of the learners who were not very academically inclined but were very good at sport, the moment you gave them an opportunity to participate in the sport, they became alive. And uh, I know many other experiences of that kind as well. So it's pleasurable, it's rewarding. It helps to break the monoto monotony of um, school routine. It keeps you fit. Um, those who are talented, the opportunities for developing a career out of, uh, out of it, and as somebody was mentioning, the physical education classroom is also a talent identification um, um, hub uh, in many cases. Okay, and then it motivates children to attend school. I'm sure some of you will know that. Some of the cons are it could eat into study time, not meant for everyone, so maybe that's an important point. How can we design and organize the physical education activities in a way in which the different levels of ability are catered for. Uh, my own experience is that, although I enjoyed physical education at school, um, one or two of the teachers that we had were very exclusive and very specialist, and then left out the children who were not physically able. And that, that's not, you know, it's not inclusive. So that's something that needs to be, um, to be looked, at, looked at. I actually want to disagree with some of the comments that are um, in this uh, paper to say that um, it, um, it could eat into, into study time. In fact, I encourage my children to, even in the midst of exam, uh, do as much physical activity as possible. In fact, I'm a ex living example of it. I remember when I was doing my master's degree, on the Sunday afternoon I played my match, and on the Monday morning I was writing my exam. But I found it beneficial. I was organized because you know, I studied and so on. But my, my belief is that um, over-academization um, actually leads to blunting and the children need to, to, to be going out and expressing themselves. Okay, so maybe just have a look at um, this one. Okay, physical education, as I said, I quoted, cognitive content and instruction designed to develop motor skills, knowledge, and behaviors for physical activity and physical fitness. And it re-emphasizes the point, I think, that Karen or somebody was making about lifelong participation. Part of our objective is to, through the physical education offering, um, stimulate in such a way that the activity becomes um, a lifelong one. But I like the point in this, in, in this definition about the cognitive content, uh, because there is research that I've come across in the last five to 10 years that is saying that a lot of the physical activity that is conducted in physical activity programs tends to focus on the muscle or on the bone or whatever the case may be, but if the brain is not appropriately stimulated and trained, you're, going to, you're either going to have underperformance or you're going to have counterproductive uh, uh, performance. So if I can just use the soccer example, and I'm going to share with you the book from which this research comes and you can have a look at it at, at greater detail. In a sport like soccer, if you do lots of repetitive long distance running, you're actually um, countermanding what you're wanting to achieve because in a soccer match, your movements are intermittent and zigzaggy and so on and so on. So if you're doing repetitive running, your brain is becoming accustomed to the nerve impulses get trained to that particular form of activity. But in an actual match, you suddenly have to stop, sprint, jump, and so on. And so you need to train the brain to perform the, the, the intermittent functions. Okay, so I, I thought I'll just share that with you. I know many of you are specialists and I'm enjoying the nodding of the head. So for me, the point is train the brain, not train the muscles. And that can lead to quite a big shift in the knowledge formation and knowledge construction in this area of work because it could take us from what in many instances, not all instances, forms of training or forms of activity which are isolated and fragmented to much more holistic. And you know, you, uh, I've had the, 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 the sad experience of seeing some really gifted players become complete wastes in society because they were not well trained and not well looked after. I mean, besides the physical, also the life skills and so on. Um, um, and so you know, it, it, it's a crying shame for that to happen. And so it's our job, our responsibility to learn from those experiences and make sure that we give our children a better experience. You might not see this very clearly, sorry about that, but it's the best picture I could get. It's a chapter from a book called Maximal Training. I had about 10 years ago 
Uh, Ted Dimitru was the former technical director for SAFA, and I did a course with him before the formation of the uh, South African Football Association uh, coaching structures. And in this book, the Maximal Training, he's got a chapter called Training the Football Brain. And why I thought it's important for this is that he makes the argument that our physical activities need to take into account that first and foremost, any learning happens in the brain, and that for any particular sports code, you need to make sure that you take account of the specificity of the code and also the complexity of the code. Otherwise, as I said, you get underperformance or you get countermanding performance. You're actually doing harm to the processes. So we don't have the time to go into the detail, but just to say that sound understanding and implementation of brain science can lead to better performance and deduction of injuries. Okay, and let me conclude with the following. First point is, let's update through this conference our analysis of the opportunities and challenges that exist. I put a couple of points down, but I'm sure people in this room may have done more research than I presented here, both provincially and nationally. So what will be nice for us in WCED senior management to see is out of this conference, a nice little report that provides a report on the state of physical education in the schools. I know there is some formative information available already, but let's formalize it nicely. Ensure that the that maximum use of timetable allocation for physical education is actually the reality. I can guarantee you now that in many schools it's not being optimally utilized for a whole variety of reasons. Let's upskill the educators. This conference is playing a role towards that end, and I believe that there is a second conference somewhere in July, practical one, that is also being planned. So we are already on the road. And then let's do more advocacy amongst uh, youth and communities. I'm sure that's in the, in the thinking already. And then Mr. Teladia points out to me, he's not here at the moment, that there are possibly some imbalances in the higher education sector in the forms of programs that are being put forward. I don't have the detail of that, but I'm sure in the course of the conference that will come up. And should that be the case, let's make sure that we right-size that imbalance um, and that um, we, we uh, also, in, in particularly in the education faculties, in the preparation of newly qualifying teachers, the offerings for life um, orientation um, ensure that the, the, the students get the necessary background um, for, for doing the work that we're wanting to do. We need to boost up the school sports system in schools where support is needed. So as you know, if you have to drive out of this building, you'll go to certain areas where the fields are well laid out, the school has got all the resources and the structures, and the, in, in many schools, the same doesn't exist. And thankfully, WCD has got a good partnership with the Department of Culture, Arts and Sports uh, after school program but that needs much more support than uh, the resources available. So if we can play a role in supporting that particular program, um, let's see if we can do that. And then I know there's already, I know Mr. Taladia has been pressurizing me to make sure that the education assistants that are on the presidential initiative, that some of those education assistants be deployed for physical education and um, that support is there. And then also the use of former players and coaches to support life orientation teachers on the specializations. Uh, and I work in a structure where we're wanting to, to do that particular work. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that was useful and stimulating. I'm looking forward to the conference report and further steps in this important process. Um, and I'd be happy to take a couple of questions and points of comment. Karen just mentioned in her presentation that one of the things the department has done in the last year is in and amongst all the thousands of things that an education department has to do is prioritized on three things. So the one is um, uh, blended learning, blended digital learning, which the pandemic has catapulted us into. The second one is foundation phase, and the third is psychosocial uh, wellness and well-being. Maybe just on the foundation phase, the reason I thought I should mention this is that we're putting a very strong emphasis on play-based learning. So one of the things we would like Ivan to come out of this conference is a focus on the foundation phase. What are the things we can do more strongly in the foundation phase? And then also to indicate that we've succeeded through this approach. Th these discussions began last year this time. And between last year and now, um, after many, many years, the senior management in WCD was able to persuade provincial treasury to allocate more money to education.
So we've received about two, million, two billion rand in addition for this year's budget, this coming financial year budget, and a big proportion of that is going to go to foundation phase. And so there are resources available there, and Karen heads the GT directly. Let's keep an eye on that, and let's see how from this conference some of the things can actually come further together. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take one or two questions or comments, and uh, wish you everything of the best, and uh, looking forward to the conference resolutions as the program indicates. Thank you. Right, I'm back. I don't know where. I was going to say it's age and youth and beauty and the beauty and the more beauty on that side. You will be coming. Um, now that our conference is officially opened, I would just like to do some house rules for the day, the two days. Uh, I'll start with the bathrooms, 60 plus. The bathrooms is on my right and would be on your left. On this level is one and downstairs on the first level is also uh, bathrooms available. It's on my right, but you can be assured it's separate rooms, but it's all on the right side. Second one is mobile phones. People like those two people that were just up here, this is their lives, the money, they, this is their work. So we really don't mind you having your cell phone, but the request would be to manage it in such a way that it's respectful to all the participants today. Then, of course, COVID-19 protocol, please just follow that. Don't forget about that. And then um, the last one is please respect time. We actually started on time, and the little minutes, few minutes that were lost, we will catch up on that. So that's the house rules for the two days. Uh, I first want to start by thanking our two presenters of this morning. Um, Karen, the sky is not the limit from today, I'll believe that. There's footprints on the moon, so thanks for that. And I think part of this conference is taking visit to the footprints on the moon. Thank you very much. Your passion, your... Um, I actually want to say the two of you, in your previous lives, you must have been phys ed teachers, eh? in your previous life, yes. So thanks to both of you for the support, for your passion and your commitment. And Mr. Harun Muhammad, I thanks that you always refer to the value of phys ed. We're so thankful for that. And thank you for seeing that this is an opportunity to take physical education to the next level. And I want to introduce someone, someone that sees an opportunity. Someone so great, the driver of all of this. He is currently serving as the Senior Curriculum Planner at Head Office for Life Orientation and Life Skills. Life Orientation is Senior Phase 7 to 9 and Life Skills is 4 to 6. 30 years of his life, you could guess his age at a later stage, but 30 years of his life he spent at Spine Road High, the Spine Road High. Some of the highlights when he taught at Spine Road was, he was the recipient of the National Teacher Award. Not just the award, National Teacher Award for excellence in high school teaching. Congratulations, my boss. He started, initiated the online safety curriculum with Google. That's him. He manages the CSE, that is the comprehensive sexuality education. He's, 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 he's got it. He's got it. He was a part-time lecturer at UCT and CPUT. 
some of his academic and professional qualification. He's got an MA, a BA, and a BA degree, all obtained at UWC. Then he did his higher education diploma at UNISA and is currently reading for his PhD. Of course, he has sporting qualification. He's a coach for volleyball international, not just, you know, not just here. And he's also a coach level three for cricket. So I would really love you to put your hands together and give a big round of applause for the driver of this conference, Mr. Ishmael Teladia. Thank you, Jodita. Um, good morning, colleagues. And um, I'm really excited to be here. If I look around the room and, and I see um, all of the colleagues from the various universities and people involved in our national sporting federations, then I'm excited. Um, one of the things that, that we want out of this conference, and, and I want to make it clear, that we're not just going to be talking things. Um, Professor Travel said earlier, um, he's got gray, he's moving to retirement, and I'm supposed to be moving to retirement, and a number of others should be moving to re towards retirement. And so we've gone through the system before, but we haven't moved the system. And so we are here today to look at doing whatever we can, Professor Travel, before you leave, so that we can at least begin to move that system. And, and that is why we are here today. Um, one of the, you know, the, the important things about what we are looking at, and if, if I look at our previous two speakers, Ms. Karen Dudley is a former national volleyball coach. Mr. Arun Muhammad, a former professional soccer player. You've just heard I've, I'm an internationally qualified volleyball coach. It's got nothing to do with me and Karen being in, in, in the same department. Um, but, and I'm also a, a Cricket South Africa level three coach. Um, I couldn't do level four at the time because there were other obstacles that were put in place. Only certain people were allowed to then go on to do level four at the time. And that's part of why we are here over the next two days, colleagues. If you look at some of the speakers that are going to come up uh, later, um, just want to mention uh, Dr. Iso, teacher, chess master, and also a national chess coach in academia. So, so the, the, there's something to be said for people that have been involved in sport and where they find themselves. And so, if we're not laying the foundations, and I'm moving off my slides here, colleagues, if we don't move and get our learners to be active so that we can get them to participate in sport, we're not going to create those opportunities that we've experienced in terms of getting where we want to be. So, colleagues, our, our discussion here today, is, today and tomorrow is critical. One of the things that we want to be looking at is to ignite the passion for participation in physical education. The participation in physical education could be the only structured activity, physical activity, that hundreds of thousands of learners could be engaged in in a particular week. If they don't get that structured physical education activity in school, they may not get any structured activity anywhere else. So we have a responsibility. All of us sitting in this room have a responsibility. And I just want to contextualize for you why we are in this room today and, and tomorrow. So often I, because I, I do community radio, often you hear people phoning into the radio station or at various platforms 
People will ask me this question and will make that statement. We must bring physical education back. And I want to choke somebody closest to me because I get heated. I get excited because people are 2022 asking this question and making this statement which means there's a disconnect between what is happening in terms of we, the realm that we're working and the perception in our communities. Because then it's not happening in our communities. Parents are not sending their children to school with the idea that one day in the week they're going to do physical education. Because they wouldn't be asking this question. And this question is coming up far too often. And so, what do we have in our province and in this country? On the one side, we have our Model C and private schools carrying on business as usual. And on the other end, we rather want to take away the PE time so that people can do mathematics. And so what are we doing? Do we, do we accept that? We cannot. Because research has shown that participation in physical activity leads to cognitive development. It leads to better performance in mathematics, and there's tons of studies that will say that. But I want to contextualize the importance of physical education. I want to take some of my own examples. When I was at Spine Road, uh, teaching physical education, I taught all the grade 11s. You always have the learners wanting to test you. So they'd come and say, or oh, I would challenge them and say, oh, you guys are slow, or oh, you guys, oh, you can't even jump high enough to, to block my, my spike that I do in volleyball. And they would say, sir, what? I'd say, okay, let's race. Okay, I'll challenge you to a race and I'll show you that I'll beat you. And I'm now talking 10 years back. So 10 years back, I was, I was, I was still good. Um, and, and I knew my strength over 40 meters. So fortunately at Spine Road, and again for the colleagues that are in the room, Spine Road I, one of my ex-learners, Dale Santon, became a Springbok rugby player. Norma Jordan, second learner from my school, became a Springbok rugby player. The only school in the country from the disadvantaged communities that produced two rugby players. Spring box. So Dale came back and with the South African Rugby Legends, we put together a synthetic pitch. So we do our physical education on the synthetic pitch. So the synthetic pitch is 40 by 60 meters. And I'm pretty quick over 40 meters. Even at this age, I'm still pretty quick. So I'll put out a challenge to you. So, so what I did with the, with the grade 11, so the boys are always challenged. I said, right, okay, come. I'll beat all of you over 40 meters. And so they would come, and I would have six, eight, ten boys standing, different classes, and I was challenging, but I was sure that I'd do my warm-ups because I could easily pull a hammy. And, and I then set off, okay? So I call on your marks. I know my strength, and I beat them every time. And so I walk around the school and say, hell, you guys are slow, man. Hell. To this day, colleagues, when I bump into them, that is our point of discussion. First point of discussion. Can you still run? Can you still remember? And that is our, our point of discussion. I'm talking 10, 15 years on. In that, those lessons, I also identified who, were going, who of those boys were going to be in my volleyball team. And in 2007, Spine Road High School won the national volleyball championships. In 2008, we went to Croatia. Now, you know Spine Road High School is in Mitchell's Plain. 2008, we went to Croatia, participated in the International Schools Federation Schools World Cup. We ended 28th out of 36 countries, which for us was good because 
all the other boys that we were playing volleyball against were two meters and, and, and about 190. Our tallest guy was, I think, about 188. One of those boys went last year to qualify for the Olympic Games, went to Morocco. Colleagues, do you see the link between the PE lesson and where that youngster was last year? So we cannot underestimate the importance of physical education. And we've seen earlier people saying the levels that one could go to. The second example I want to sh share with you. So when I became a subject advisor, I then went around to the schools to see what they were doing in life orientation class, but also I want to see a physical education lesson. So I rocked up at Weinberg Boys Eye, met the principal, Mr. Keith Richardson, and I looked at his timetable, no physical education. So I said, sorry man, physical education is a policy issue in life orientation, so I need to see physical education on your timetable. So he said, but he doesn't have to do physical education. All his boys participate in sport. So he doesn't have to do physical education in his school. I said, no, sir. I'm coming back in two weeks' time. I want to see physical education on your timetable. One of the boys I had in the points, I can't remember the gentleman's name, Springbok Canoeist. Three months later, I get letters on my desk saying that the physical education being implemented at Weinberg Boys is too strenuous for the boys. Do you see the issues, colleagues, in terms of Weinberg Boys could easily appoint somebody from outside? The boys were not used to getting PE. The gentleman, the specialist, introduced PE at another level, and we got complaints from the parents. One of the examples that he, or the activities that he put in place for the boys was they needed to run a three kilometer circuit that he, that he put in place and they needed to have run that in about 12 minutes, which is pretty sharp. And so parents complained about it. But they were complaining about the physical education levels which is good. It means there was physical education being implemented. So colleagues, I want to share that context with you in terms of where we find ourselves in this province and in the country. And so I'm not going to talk around the issue of, of physical literacy because we've already touched on that. And then I got a letter on Monday, yesterday from a teacher that was supposed to be here today. She couldn't, she put it in an email for me and I just took out some of the salient points out of, um, out of her email. And it speaks to the issue of this teacher who has been in the education system for over 35 years, saying we must emphasize the issue of physical education. She wanted to be uh, uh, I picked up on, on some of those issues. So the teachers are being moved around in life orientation, and so we don't have physical education specialists teaching physical education. Because now anybody that's in the life orientation class is responsible for physical education. We don't have the suitably qualified physical education experts. And through our sister department, the Department of Cultural Affairs and Sport, they've set up MOT centers. So this is an example. At her school, They've, at Heidefeld High, they have six basketball teams. But they have, at the adjacent school, Kathkin, I think, is where the Mott Center is being uh, placed. They're putting an emphasis on basketball. And so she's saying there's a disconnect between what the area requires and how we boost particularly basketball. I'm, I'm saying, why are we not having volleyball on there? One of the issues that she raised with me, and I chatted to the colleagues yesterday, at the school with the athletics, she was saying in the 80s, 90s, 
When you go to an athletics meet, the children all are looking for spikes. And she said this year, since they went back to inter-schools athletics, people were running in tackies. There was no focus on wanting to get a, a pair of spikes to do the sprints in. And it shows what the digression that has taken place. Yes, in our top schools, you, they're definitely going to provide those, those spikes, but athletics into schools a couple of weeks ago, there was no interest in getting spikes for the learners. So this is some of the, the comments that she, that she made, and, and she's really upset about what is happening with the digression that is taking place as far as physical education is concerned. Colleagues, the important points here, and this is to our academics, and we have 12 universities that will be connecting in this conference, is the fact that we are not getting qualified physical education teachers out of our universities. We need to be looking at what it is that we need to work through with the qualification in order to make anybody coming out of university with a teacher's diploma to go into uh, the education system. I've seen in terms of where we are at that physical education is almost finding itself in a forgotten space. Because if I look at the university's uh, curricula, I see high performance and I see sports management. But what's happening to the masses? And so we need to be looking at how do we address the masses. But talking on the issue of physical education colleagues, it is a curriculum imperative. It is policy. It must happen. So every teacher sitting in this room that is teaching life orientation must be implementing physical education. And if I ask you to sh just show by hands all the teachers or the principals, are you implementing physical education at your school every week? You see, Western Cape is always good. <laughs> but we also know that there are gaps, and we acknowledge those gaps. And so it becomes important for us to ensure that we close those gaps as a matter of urgency. And I'm saying the Western Cape is privileged in that we see the physical education being implemented. Because one of the instructions to the subject advisors is when you visit a school, you want to see a theory class in life orientation, but you also want to see a physical education class. Because we want to see that physical education is being implemented. There is assessment that needs to be done for physical education. So we cannot move away from that. And I'm happy to see that uh, our representative from DBE is here. Welcome, uh, Martha. And I hope Mr. Ah, Mr. Jerry Zita is here. Well done, uh, DBE. I'm extremely excited and happy. So this debate is really going to go to the surface. OK, we're not holding back, uh, Jerry. OK. So colleagues, just some of the things that I've, that, that I've picked up, and, and as I said, we need to close that gap with our academics, um, our HAIs in terms of saying, what do we need to do to ensure that the programs that are being offered at our universities is going to produce the physical education teachers that we want in all of our schools. And so colleagues, just in, in terms of some of the outcomes that I'd like to see from this conference, the role of our universities, we need to know what the role of our federations are, our, our national federations, and what they are doing in terms of assisting, because we have gaps. And how do our national federations help to close those gaps? We have Mr. Gary Dolly here from South African Hockey, we have Ms. Marty Eri, and you'll listen to them later in, in their demonstrations. They're from two national federations that are doing excellent work in trying to promote basic fundamental movement skills. But there are 
a number of other federations that are also playing a very important, or should be playing an important role. And I would, if, if I were to ask SAFA, so what is SAFA doing? If Mr. Mohammed had indicated three million uh, members, uh, participants, is that being translated into our schools? And the answer to that is almost no. And, and so we need to be uh, talking to uh, SAFA. What is the role of our NGOs? And we, we will have Cool Play talking to us tomorrow. We have Sporting Chance there, Mr. Brad Bing. So what can you do to assist and in terms of closing those gaps if government is not able to do it by themselves? So those are important questions that we need to deal with. We need to ask the question to our SGBs, our school governing bodies, what are you doing? Are you allowing, as parents, because if I look in, in, in the greater Cape Town area, we have hundreds of people in the running clubs, but I don't see the running happening at our schools. So if the parents are very happily running for the various running clubs in, in Cape Town or, or in the cycling clubs, what's happening at our schools? Because those two codes are, are really not at the level that we wanted to be. So parents need to play an important role. And then, of course, colleagues, I've invited Sascock to be here. And Sascock hasn't taken up this particularly important discussion. And so it becomes important when we elect leaders that our leaders are focused. And let me say to you, and, and I'm taking a bite at, uh, at Sascock, I contacted the president himself, had a conversation with him in December, and he gave me the name of the person that he's supposed to be, and that was a lost. And yet these people are supposed to drive our sport in this country. If we don't get the grassroots right, we're not going to end up with the elite sport that we want. And those learners are not, or athletes are not going to come from disadvantaged communities. And then finally, colleagues, and it's the reason why we have a couple of individuals in this room uh, from the Institute of Sport, we're looking to bite into the physical education teacher assistance. We need to take 50,000 of them and say, these are the young people that we want to train to deliver physical education. Not at the level that we want because they're not qualified, but at least ensure that physical ed education is being implemented. Even if we do the elementary activities, let's use these young people, let's train them up, not only in terms of delivery at this point in time, but also to get them into a qualification. And so that is part of our discussion that we're going to have over this weekend, uh, over these two days. Colleagues, I need a commitment from you. We are committed from the education department in terms of making this work, but we need the buy-in from our HEIs from our NGOs, from civil society, to make it happen. And then just finally, uh, colleagues, we need to create access for all our learners to be participating in physical education at least once a week. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, um, it says the sport has the power to change the world. I want to change it to Mr. Ishmael Teladia has the power to change the status of life orientation, including physical education. Thank you, Ishmael, for that beautiful, beautiful um, presentation. Um, I his, the, the Two slides before that, I'm sure you all identified yourself. I spoke earlier about all the role players and all the stakeholders. This is really our chance to take hands and take visit to the next level. And I will now give over to the beauty and the, and the beauty beast. <laughs> thank you, Jerita. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deladia. Um, those of you that don't know the man, 
he has shared on our subject advisor uh, WhatsApp groups. I've seen little videos, I think two, three years ago, of his 18-month-old grandson doing pull-ups. So the man's a keen advocate on physical education. Ladies and gents, um, our international speaker, let me just give a brief introduction. She holds two doctorate degrees in sports management and motor learning. She served in education for 45 years. She's a three-time Hall of Famer, namely, she's been inducted into the American Volleyball Coaches Hall of Fame, the National Association of Sports and Physical Education, and the Illinois State University College of Applied Sciences and Technology for her contribution to physical education, coach and education, and sports education. Please put your hands together, all the way from Chicago, Illinois, Dr. Darlene Kula. Good morning, ma'am. You're alive. Good morning, sir. How are you? You can go ahead. And start the second session. Right, we can start now. Start now. Yes, ma'am, you can start. Well, thanks to all of you uh, for allowing me to be part of this exciting conference. I'd like to give a special thanks to Doreen Solomon, who is one of my dear friends for many, many years, and Ishmael Tala. Uh, Taladia for their trust in me to deliver for you today. In the time of COVID across the world, that has included physical distancing and also sometimes in some places, online physical education, it's more important than ever to create a culture where even at home, students are motivated to participate in physical education and activity. Providing students with multiple opportunities to participate in movement, as well as multiple role models who are also excited to engage in physical activity are key. Whether it is structured play in physical education class, extracurricular clubs or recess, physical activity contributes to building a better school culture. In some cases, more time in physical education leads to improved grades on standardized tests. Physically active and fit children tend to have better academic achievement. Evidence links higher levels of physical fitness with better school attendance and fewer discipline issues. But we all know that. Next slide, please. Thank you. K through 12 standards 
are designed to develop motor skills, knowledge, and behaviors of healthy, active living, physical fitness, fair play, self-efficacy, and emotional intelligence. Teaching school-aged children the science and methods of physically active, healthful living is very important. Developmentally appropriate physical activities are designed for children to develop their fitness, gross motor skills, and health. These provide a perspective on physical education in the context of schooling. Elaborated, elaborate on the importance of physical education to child development. Provide consensus on characteristics of quality physical education programs. Examine barriers to physical education quality and solutions for overcoming them. If standards are the gauge for quality, teachers make the difference in schools in terms of the extent to which students can achieve the standards. Certified physical education specialists can provide more and longer opportunities for students to meet physically active guidelines compared with classroom teachers trained to teach physical education. Next one, please. So how can we establish and maintain a culture of physical education in schools? You can see here on the slide that we need to ask a few questions about what is occurring. What do parents believe about physical education? Should there be more or less physical education in your school? Can physical education help control or prevent childhood obesity and type one diabetes? And can daily physical activity help children do better academically by being part of the school curriculum for all students? The next one, please. When you look at the things that are listed on this slide, uh, specifically, a name is something students carry with them everywhere. And it's a part of their identity that does not change. Addressing each student by name demonstrates that you care about each of them as individuals. It is a simple first step establishing trust with a student. Development of relational skills such as sharing and using kind words during play is also important. Students can work in pairs to create objectives that involve both verbal and nonverbal communication. An example, three to five students hold the outside of a hula hoop and move across the play area until the teacher says shipwreck. They must drop their hula hoop, which is the ship, and stand inside of it. The last group inside the ship must go back to the starting line and the first group gets uh, to, that gets to the finish line wins. When presenting a jump rope unit, set up three poster boards in the main area of the school that lists students who participate in one minute, two minute, or three minute jump rope routines each week. Students sign poster boards after accomplishing their goals for the entire school to see their success. Teachers, students, and staff train perhaps two days a week after school for 10 weeks through a program that could be called something like FIT, F-I-T, and the school's name. So in this case, it could be something like um, FIT Lamprecht Music School. Each week, a character trait can be developed during training, perseverance, and how to strive for a goal, hard work, 
goal setting and being our personal best could be focused upon during different weeks. At the end of the program, participants could run a 5K in the community. This is an opportunity to celebrate their accomplishments. It also allows the school community to come together to support one another. Next one, please. Thank you. So here are some ideas that I thought I would share with you uh, to uh, get this conference really started and, and going. And if some of these work for you, fantastic. If others don't, then throw them away. But it's just some other ideas for us to consider. Principles can be major change agents. Discuss academic and behavioral benefits of having students out of their seats and moving in classrooms. Go noodle or brain breaks. Offer easy to use activities to add to classroom activities. Very short, but can be incorporated into the classroom. So if you would like to know more about that, if you don't recognize those uh, two sources, uh, look on the web uh, because they've got some really interesting and fun ones to do with, with students. You could also have a lunch running or walking club that can be coordinated with the school schedule to provide opportunities for activity during the school day. You might also want to offer a morning walk club where students, teachers, and staff can meet a few days a week in the morning and walk around the school grounds. This allows for improved physical well-being and interaction in an informal way. Perhaps engage teachers and staff in physical activities at school. Perhaps an after-school dance activity program. Play day, tug of war. Adults can serve as role models for healthy living and an active lifestyle. The next one, please. Thank you. So perhaps there's a way to also look at sport and community development and develop a lab at universities. Many of you have uh, wonderful opportunities to meet up with universities. And universities are consistently making sure, especially in South Africa, to have things that go from grassroots through the university. So perhaps community building can include the initiation of sport for all, opportunities organized by university and community leaders. Devise professional development for teachers and staff to, to acquire new knowledge and skills related to professional and academic subject area, job responsibilities, and work. There are also research opportunities that avail themselves. Next slide, please. Thank you. There could be some opportunities to determine what happens when people who are adults referee after they have completed their um, sport par participation. Could also be physical education as a pathway for participation in organized sport. And I know that's one of the things that uh, Ismail had told me that you're going to be discussing. Or the need for qualified physical educators in the school. Oh, that one is a good one. And bridging mass participation and individual participation and elite participation in sport. Next slide, please.
Here are some additional thoughts to consider. Sometimes our classrooms have a tremendous number of participants. I've had the privilege, uh, Doreen was kind enough to uh, allow me on several occasions to see the kinds of um, experiences that uh, students are having in Western Cape uh, uh, um, primary schools and secondary schools. And sometimes those classes have just been unbelievably large. This presents a real challenge for the person who is teaching because it is hard to know 60 children and their names and what's occurring. However, if you can do these things, it will help tremendously in terms of creating an environment that is going to really want physical education to be a part of the school day. So one of them is my physical education teacher notices me. All right, and sometimes where, as the children come into your area, uh, you may have a sign that says, uh, um, what would you like today? And one of the things might be a high five from the, each student, might also be a hug after COVID, of course, <laughs> but a hug. Another one might be uh, nothing at all. So it would just be a wave. But each time the student comes into the classroom, and this is not hard to do because you can stand at the, at the, uh, at the doorway or wherever they're coming in, that way each student has an opportunity to interact and also an opportunity to make a decision. My physical education teacher cares about me. This is a really important one. We do say to the world that we have an environment that allows us to be um, very informal yet caring. So we need to prove that. How do we do that? My physical education teacher wants me to succeed. Positive, 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 or positive when you're giving feedback, positive, negative, positive. Because what is the behavior that we're looking for so that they can try to model that to succeed? My physical education teacher challenges me to become a better person. Do you set up an environment that allows them to make decisions so that they can become better people? Right? Provide meaning and increase pleasure in participation. It truly is possible for you to create an environment where there is marvelous participation and marvelous fun and marvelous learning. All right? And so how do we create an environment that will allow them to have fun in the participation and truly learn some things? Individual goals and set challenges. Okay, those are goals for each of the students, not your goals, but their goals. Create activities and situations for active movement. Okay, standing in line with 10 students waiting for one opportunity to touch the ball or touch the, make the swing or whatever it is, that's not good enough. The number of touches that an individual has will allow them to be more and more successful. So when you create those activities, don't have them standing in line for five, ten minutes. Then they also get themselves in a little trouble. Increase the contact with others and the environment. 
Can you arrange a, a, a lesson or all of you lessons or many of your lessons in a station work so that they have a lot of contact with others as well as with the environment? So how things are presented does make a difference and provide students with opportunities for decision making. Nothing is worse than to sit and listen to a lecture. Nothing is worse than that. And so if you take five or 10 minutes to explain whatever it is that they're supposed to be doing, you will lose them. So all of these additional thoughts to consider really make a difference when you're dealing with how to make sure that physical education adds to the curriculum and enhances the opportunity for students to genuinely have fun and learn. I thank you for listening to me. I know that we're a little bit behind schedule, so I'll cut this a little bit short. And I sincerely, again, appreciate, if you go to the last slide, There we go. I hope that I have included all, all of the uh, ways in which we can say thank you in South Africa. Uh, I'm familiar with uh, uh, a little bit of Afrikaans and uh, maybe a little bit of Sutu, but the rest of them I'm kind of at a loss. Uh, but uh, so thank you. And, and uh, I hope that you've enjoyed this morning with me. I uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Klucker, for the presentation this morning. Thank you for waking up early so that you could uh, share uh, some of your ideas with us. Um, and, and we're looking for further engagement uh, with you. I, I, I don't care what time of the day it is. I absolutely love this. And uh, I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed to be with you this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. A true ambassador for life orientation and physical education. Colleagues, we're going over now to the question and answer session. Um, and to explain you more about that, I'll give over to the beauty beast. Beauty. <laughs> Thank you, Jerita. Um, just a reminder, with a question and answer session, can we just ensure that we have mutual respect for one another? Um, let's keep the questions appropriate to the theme. And can you please keep your questions uh, fairly concise? Uh, it would help the rest of us, please. So if there are any questions, please feel free, raise your hand, and we can try and pass a mic on. Yes. Colleagues, just before we go over to the question, do, do we have the mics, three mics? They will. Good morning, Gary Dolly from SA Hockey. Just uh, was the Western Cape uh, Department of Sport invited to the conference? Thank you. Uh, yes, they were invited. In fact, uh, the Chief Director will be part of our panel discussion uh, later today. Thank you, sir. You happy? Okay, next question. My question, my question is the following. Mr. Taladi spoke about uh, the learners in the disadvantaged areas. My question is, um, I'm the acting principal of Silverstream Primary in Menenburg. 
I actually have the mod center coach here. We employed him on the school governing body. We're actually paying him. As we all know, funds, it's, it's, a, it's a great issue in the disadvantaged schools. When is it going to be possible that Mr. Taladia spoke that each school, especially in the disadvantaged areas, will be given a full-time visit coach? Thank you. That's definitely an, a question for Mr. Deladia. <laughs> the, if you listen to my presentation, I, I did say that we are looking at the presidential uh, teacher assistance uh, program as one of the kickstart programs to address that particular issue. Are you happy, sir? Thank you. This is the start of everything, we hope. We can take hands and make it happen. Another question? Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, John O'Connor, a lifelong activist for physical education and school sport. Um, I, I just want to make a really sh short comment to say, well done to the Western Cape. I cannot believe him. I'm in South Africa. Um, uh, from 1996, that something like this is truly happening to the DDG, the director of sport, Karen, and Ismail Tuladi, and everybody else. Really, really well done. I, I'm actually having goosebumps about what you guys are doing. Thank you. I think a round of applause. I think we must get Miss Karen again here to give us that boost. Hashtag life orientation rock. Next question, please. Hi, good morning. My name is Bevo Valinsky from South Hill Primary School. Um, just one or two questions. Um, I think to Mr. Teladia. First, let me first say thank you to Mr. Teladia for organizing the conference. We really appreciate that. Um, do we have the data in terms of how many of our 1,519 schools are offering PE um, as a subject? I think that's a good starting point to know the data around that. Um, the second question is, would DCAS exist if schools are doing what we are supposed to be doing? And then the third question is, one of the indicators of the WCD is to um, promote sport. Um, I would like to know, did our HOD attend the recently held um, Western Cape Athletics um, Primary School Championships or even the High School Championships? Because recently at the um, National Athletics Primary Schools, we had the HOD of the particular province in Northwest present, as well as the MEC for Education. So I would like to know, um, was the HOD in attendance at the primary school championships or even at the high school? Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your question. I think start with number three. Okay, please note that uh, there is a DG. DDG <laughs> and a director here that can also answer, uh, answer some of the questions. But uh, just a couple of simple answers. One, um, every school in the province, as we said, physical education is policy, and therefore every school in the province um, must deliver on physical education. And so the feedback from the subject advisors visiting schools around the province is that physical education is implemented but at different levels. Mm -hmm. So it is happening, but it is not happening consistently across all schools in the province. We are embarking on another survey in terms of trying to establish how many qualified physical education teachers we still have in the system. We did a survey probably about eight years ago um, and we haven't done a follow-up, and so that is one of our challenges is around the number of qualified physical education teachers which is currently in the system. So we need to establish that. In terms of the HOD being at the athletics championships, uh, no, he was not. Um, he was not at, at any of those championships, but we do have our school enrichment colleagues that have been to these championships, and Mr. Ivan Fortain, our FET, my colleague uh, at head office, and uh, one of our subject advisors attended the provincial championships as well. Thank you. The answer the second question. Thank you. I'm Sabrina Seisman from Cascade Primary School in Middlesbrough. 
We speak about lifelong learning. What I want to know is how do we promote physical activity beyond primary school into high school and beyond high school. Our learners are not moving into different codes. It's stopping at high school, which is at a minimal level. The question I want to ask is, what is the department of Western Cape Education Department, uh, DCAS, uh, the municipalities doing to upgrade our stadium, our sport fields, or even assisting schools to maintain their fields? Because it is an exorbitant cost. So, money would rather be spent, the little money that we have on the infrastructure but not maintaining our fields. How can we get support in that regard to maintain our fields where a school then can be identified as a hub for cricket, as a hub for soccer, as a hub for hockey? Before, before you answer, Ishmael, you may answer now, but I just want to tell her that I love the way she posed the question and saying, how can we? So it's we all part of the solution. It starts right at the school and all those stakeholders that we often say, what is the department doing? What is that? But it starts, like you said, with we. And I think that's one of the main, main objectives that Ishmael had in mind. Thank you for that very, very good question. All yours, Mr. Taladia. Thank you. And, and so in ans answering that particular question, we will have, as I said, the Chief Director from DCAS here this afternoon, and he will form part of a panel, and, and I'd like you to um, take that question to him as well. But just from, from the Education Department side, um, we do have a school enrichment um, directorate that will try and assist. They do not have the budget, but they do have the propensity to make the links between what is happening in our schools and link that to either DCAS or the local government. Tomorrow afternoon, as one of the panel discussions, we're having the deputy mayor of the city of Cape Town as part of the panel. Um, uh, Mr. Eddie Andrews, Alderman Eddie Andrews, he will be here. And one of the issues is to discuss and to ask of the city, what are they doing? Firstly, to create access for our schools to the stadia, which, which was a problem with athletics, and then also to the other municipal fields at lower rates, because it is uh, quite exorbitant to use the municipal fields for our sporting activities. So we have invited uh, uh, Alderman um, Andrews to be here tomorrow, and we are going to pose those questions to him. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Nikki van der Merwe. I made a joke about this at the previous conference we had when we were at Newlands there, the High Performance Center, when Vicky Lambert presented. And I said, she's Vicky and I'm Nikki. But um, <laughs> I just, more than a comment and a request, I want to uh, uh, support what we just said. Thank you very much, Ismail, for what you've done here and for the DG and all the people here. But my concern is, I addressed it at SOPR. I see Quibus Ruiz here as well, South African University's Forum for Physical Education, that we are our own worst enemies. Because at university level, the M count for life orientation and life skills, or life orientation, and is not even counted to get these students into the university. And physical education is unfortunately one of the outcomes. But again, coming back to what I said to you then, Ismail, I'm so glad this is happening in the Western Cape. What about the rest of the provinces? <laughs> Please, Mr. DG, DDG, take hands with the National Department of Education. I said to Dr. Granwell Whittle and Whitty Green and those guys, we need to get hands together and work to get it up mm -hmm. because we are fighting a losing battle against ourselves. Mm -hmm. But it's not. So the request, if you can assist so that we can take this further and go on to national 
we are prepared and we are willing at the HEIs to, to do the training and assist the teachers. That's what we're going to present as well to try and convince you about this. But once again, thank you very much. Listen to our plea. Take hands with the National Department of Education. It's not only the Western Cape in South Africa. We need all the other provinces included. Thank you very much. Thank you for that comment, sir. Um, that will be the last question. Thanks. He wants to answer, Mr. Yeah. Harun Mohammed. Yeah. Yes. I, can I just correct? I think the question and answer session is on what happened this morning. So we would like to relate the question to the present what was presented this morning. Like the ladies, a beautiful question, but that is actually for tomorrow, one of the sessions tomorrow. So it would be we appreciate the comments on what happened this morning. Thanks for that. And then just a request from the camera people, if you pose the question, would you just stand so that uh, they can see you? Thank you, Mr. Harun Mohammed. You can. Okay. No, thanks. Thanks very much. I, I thought I'll just respond. The questions that are coming up is actually giving us the size of the challenges. Mm -hmm. And so our job when we were doing the presentations was just to sketch the big background. But I'm glad the questions are being asked because the size of the problem that we've got is huge. Mm -hmm. But what is important for us to do is collectively, as yes. you indicated, let us at the end of the conference come up with suggestions about what can be done. And then from our side, and that's why I emphasize the report, because if the report is nicely done, as WCED, we will play our respective roles, and I'm glad the National Department is here. And I also happen to be a committee member of the Review of Teacher Education and Development nationally. And we had a summit recently in November, so we can assist with joining of the dots, so you know, the issues of higher education playing a stronger role, what changes can be made, and so on. We can play that facilitative role. But thanks very much for all the questions, and as I said, our role as this conference is to put the problem down mm -hmm. and then to mm -hmm. think about, imagine mm -hmm. what the, the solutions mm -hmm. can be, and step by step we can move further forward. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Mohammed. Yes, okay. thank you. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Kaltuma Benjamin. I'm an educator at Sari Primary. I do believe Sari Primary is one of the lucky schools where I teach phys ed only. I started eight years ago as a foundation phase phys ed educator with my two hours a week per foundation phase class. I was then moved to teaching phys ed to the whole school, grades one to seven. I now have a one hour session in foundation phase and two half an hour sessions for intermediate senior phase. My request is, can we please have someone specifically for foundation phase someone specifically for intercent phase and both male and females to separate our groups when we take them out. It is very difficult. My biggest challenge, foundation phase, I have no problems because my kids come dressed, shorts, whatever our PT attire is. The moment they step into grade four, it's a new school to them. So now it's, I don't want to wear PT uniform, I don't want to wear tacky, so I'm not in the mood for PT today, so I'm telling teacher I have a tummy ache, so teacher keeps me in class. So it does become a struggle. Yes, Mr. Daladia, I do assessment, foundation phase. My teachers come out and they come and assess the learners to what I've taught them for the term. Intermediate senior phase, I need to do assessments on my own. So it is difficult assessing a child for visit that has spent half the time in the sick bay because they are not in the mood for visit. And like you said, teachers take my period for English, for mathematics, for social science. So I miss out on some classes throughout the term. When it comes to doing assessment, it's difficult for me to do an assessment with a class that has missed a few sessions. So that is just something that I would really like Mr. Zaladia and his team to work on when they are doing the meetings with the life orientation teachers and all the other teachers, especially intermediate senior phase. My periods is my periods. I need your class to get a proper assessment from the learners. Thank you. I, I heard the question there, and um, <laughs> I don't want you, sorry. It was a statement with a question, but your question is, can't we get foundation phase, intermediate, and um, senior phase teachers, and my, Beautiful colleague here on my left said, 
We must just ask the DDG and <laughs> got them to swipe their credit cards. There's no money, so their credit cards, it could perhaps happen. But thank you, ma'am, for that statement and questions. This is exactly like Mr. Arun Muhammad said. We want those kinds of comments, statements, and questions so that we can build it from here, get solutions for all. We won't get all of them, but at least we can start in the right direction. So thanks a million. Was that the last? Yeah. Oh, Marley. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning. My name is Marty Heri. I'm from the Marty. Gymnastics South Africa, but also a passionate mentor for teachers. My question is, leading to what Nikki, my friend and colleague, found him over from Sportchester University, you are the only university who is actually training teachers still. And where is the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture? I'm so glad to see someone from the National Department for Education. We do have funds available in the national uh, funds. And it's wasted, big time. I have the frustration of working with Department of Sports, Arts and Culture. And I openly say that. Because all this talent that we nurture in physical education, then they go to a school's championships and they cannot go any further. And we can't just blame the pandemic. We don't have governance in national school sport. So we cannot nurture the talent. We might be able to identify them and work very hard and passionately to give them opportunities, but those are falling apart. So my question is, where is the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture? That's the people on the ground. Thank you, Mark. Simple answer, yes. And that would be the last, Mr. Teladia. The simple answer to that is the invitation was extended to the Department of Cultural Affairs and Sport. As it is, the Chief Director, Mr. Lyndon Bauer, has committed himself to be here this afternoon. And he said to me, if he doesn't come, then Mr. Paul Hendricks will represent him and the department. So we will wait until lunchtime when they arrive and we will take up the conversation with them. Thank you. Right, thank you colleagues for that good session. Uh, we're breaking now for mid-morning tea, but just before you break, just a few announcements of what follows after the tea. We will break up in break up groups. You received a little band this morning. So I would like to ask Ms. Fairus Kasim with a yellow. If you got a yellow band this morning, it means you can stay or come back rather to the auditorium. Mark has a blue and Mark will be in Hall A14. It's on the building next door. And then last but not least, Miss Michelle Peterson has got an orange band. So if you are on a venue and you don't see a, that orange lady, then it means you're in the wrong venue. So you may go enjoy your tea now and after tea, auditorium A, Hall A1 and Hall C1. Yes, dear, a question? Yes. It's a blue, orange, and a yellow one. Yes. Thank you, colleagues. Go enjoy your tea, please. And thank you. Sorry. If you don't have bands, please go to reception in front and they'll assist you. Charita.
But first of all, I'm Fairuz Kasim. I'm the subject advisor for life orientation in Metro South, which covers the Mitchell's Plain, Grassy Park, Philippi East, Samora Michelle, Weinberg to Simonstown. I sound like a conductor on the train. Um, but those are the areas that I cover. And I'm so happy to see so many of you here today um, to help us to provide quality physical education for every child in every class, in every school in the province. Um, our first speaker or presenter is going to be Professor Charles Roux. Um, and then we're going to have Dr. Deborah Zeller. Along with her is Danielle Dolly. Professor Lloyd Leach is at the back there. And then is Dr. Shahid Talib in the audience yet? Not yet. OK. All right. So over to you, Do uh, Professor Ru. That's at the back. Right. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And also, thank you, um, Ismail and government who made this possible and also for the invitation to be here. I have to admit I haven't done this for a long time. I think most of you as well due to COVID. But not only that, I'm not used to the English anymore. <laughs> and I'm definitely not used to shoes anymore. So bear with me. If I kick it out, it's because I'm not used to it anymore. Um, also, just, uh, apologies for the odd um, start for the, for the first slide there, but when I saw the invitation and I read, I read through the, the slides that was posted as well and shared this morning, um, I was quite intrigued by the invitation as well as the theme. And I immediately asked myself, but who? I heard this morning we, but quite often in the we, the I disappear and we don't take, take up that responsibility that is actually at our door, that we need to take that up and carry it over to the next generation or to the next phase. So yeah, um, I also looked at that, uh, the establishment of a culture of physical education in the schools. Somebody must do that. And what does it mean? What is this culture of movement or physical education? So yeah, I'm gonna try to address some of these um, and also, like Dr. Nikki said this morning, um, what about the other eight provinces? I'm very glad, I said to Debbie, it's so nice to see we have physical education teachers here. Otherwise, it was academics talking to one another and we <laughs> I swear sometimes of things that's not happening. But uh, real stakeholders are not always there to listen or to carry it out. So yeah, I'm very glad you're here, and I believe it's part of your holidays, so a special welcome to you people as well. And then, although physical education programs are there mainly for the learners, hence our number one beneficiary of physical education programs. At school, the teacher is the main influencer, and therefore our teachers are very important, and also they have a huge role to play. So how are we going to support whatever has to be done? And you'll see also, I will jump right back to the primary school. Because I think, and that's another debate, we should talk again about the window of opportunity, about early learning and all of that, where physical education or movement is almost natural. And then we heard this morning in grade four, it disappears. Why? How come? Things that we need to debate as we go along. Um, if I can just show you there, I'm also a qualified physical education teacher. And I'm glad to say I'm on retirement back at UJ as a senior research associate, but I'm also teaching. I'm at a local primary school where I teach, not physical education, only, but whenever there's a teacher missing, I put up my hand. And what do we do? Movement. So, don't tell them, but we move. Through the desks, everywhere, but we move. And I think that is a almost attitude that we should have. 
to, for, with physical education. There are more things that we need to discuss, especially the part in blue there, focus on the elite sport. What is elite sport? What is sport? And I know that is another career that we can't take away from our learners. But we talk about physical education and the link with sport or sport education. Where is the link and how much should we do not to put sport in place of physical education. So that is a fine balance that we should reach at some stage, or talk about at least. Um, with the introduction, the interest of young children in learning through play is a dimension that forms an essential part of learning in the early years of childhood, especially in the primary school. Hence, the primary school educator should be able to provide opportunities for all learners to develop holistically by engaging in a variety of age-appropriate physical activity and games. Physical education is a fundamental right of all learners and an essential part of lifelong education. It is essential for the holistic development of a child, hence the health in umbrella term, well-being and an active lifestyle is emphasized by the World Health Organization it is also the entry point of lifelong participation in physical activity and school sport. And then also for excelling one day or some, for some perhaps into elite sport participation. For, uh, physical education combines body and physical competence with values based learning and communication, providing the gateway to developing the skills and physical literacy necessary for academic and sport success. In South Africa, studies found a strong correlation between motor skills and cognitive functioning. This we've heard several times this morning as well. Um, both of which influence academic performance. We can the, uh, then say that the teacher is therefore seen as the most important school-based influence on the learning, learner's holistic development. Not on sport or game or physical activity, holistic. And that is another essence that we need to unpack. What does it mean? Um, and academic performance. The notion of importance of physical education was and is still supported by the Human Rights Declaration of the UN of 1948. The UNESCO and International Charter of Physical Education and Sport of 1978. The Ministers of Sport meeting on Physical Education Minutes 1 from 1948 in Paris Minops 5 in 1978, Minops 6 held in um, 2017 in Kazan, Russia, as well as the first regional conference of African ministers on the implementation of the Kazan Action Plan for Africa in Madagascar of 2019. Although PE in um, primary schools optimizes children's holistic well-being, children are increasingly physically inactive and more exposed to a myriad of sedentary alternatives, such as computer games, social media, and the internet. Inactivity, in addition um, to unhealthy habits, are global crises and often ignored by families, communities, and media. Physical inactivity could be strongly associated with a prevalence, prevalence of communicable disease and uh, social ills. Concurrent to this, Educators, especially the generalist classroom teacher, often express their lack of confidence, uncertainty, and especially the lack of competence to teach physical education. These teachers claim that this is due to various, uh, con to various uh, temporary issues such as a loss of curriculum time because of privileging and supposedly more important subjects, lack of e uh, equipment, lack of facilities in, in, and infrastructure, large classes, often classes are combined with PE or for PE, the shortage of appropriately qualified educators, it's a worldwide concern nowadays, and the lack of preparation of general sp uh, primary school teachers and lack of content knowledge to teach physical education, all also globally matters of concern. So, and all of these came out with a discussion this morning already amongst the teachers.
Although a global debate on the state and status of physical education, there is a paucity of evidence around the educators' perceptions of physical education in practice. With the social transformation and change in academic priorities, physical education in South Africa since 1994 underwent considerably policy-related restructuring. Physical education was a standalone, non-exam subject in a few privileged schools due to the apartheid regime in South Africa. Since then, the school, school curricula were transformed with the introduction of outcomes-based education and curriculum in 2005, and PE has only enjoyed peripheral status since then and remains a relative under-resourced and undervalued subject due to the so socioeconomic inequalities that affect the majority of South Africans. In lower quintile schools, those ranked 1, 2, and 3, in the 1 to 5 quintile rating system, social issues um, because of high unemployment, low educational levels, and high disease burdens related to inactivity are prevalent. I don't have to tell you more about the development of the curriculum. I think we all know how it has developed. And, and this morning, on one of your slides, I think, Ismail, you had it as well. It is important to remember that PE is part of life orientation. And don't, please don't forget life skills and primary school physical education. And again, I want to stress about the window of opportunity that we need to look into. For all, and it's compulsory for all schooling phases. Assessments are compulsory. Physical education can be an introduction to school sport and maybe also to elite sport participation, to summarize that slide for us. South African schools, like many other schools around the world, adopted multiple approaches to delivering physical education. These modules include the employment of physical drills based on the Swedish gymnastics and competitive games. It's still available at schools. Also improving sports skills or sports skills development. And additionally, the teaching of sport education based on the work of Sedentop, offering game-centered pedagogy with sport-focused outcomes that could lead physical education knowledge and skills into school sport and ultimately into community and elite levels of sport participation. The physical literacy approach developed by Whitehead, Whitehead was introduced as an alternative to the sports model. This approach presents a multifaceted conceptualization of holistic skills and educational development through movement for lifelong participation. As part of the national research project of 2018, it was uh, um, referred to this morning as the SAPIA research, one well, aim was also to conduct a situation analysis and to reflect on the perception of educators on the state and status of physical education in public primary um, schools in South Africa. The objectives then to determine the state and um, the state of various resources and activities presented in the physical education space, to collect data from selected public primary schools representing differing. Uh, geographic, geographical context, rural, semi-urban and urban schools, as well as socio-economic status as per quintile school from all nine provinces. And also I want to, to ask again, send all of this to all the other provinces as well. The data collection for this study, and specifically for the primary school section, um, we had semi-structured interviews with decision makers, hence the principals and the representatives of them, and HODs. The HODs and teachers as implementers also co um, completed questionnaires. Then uh, focus groups, discussions were held, observation protocols were followed, documents were an analyzed, and all of this were triangulated to come to um, the uh, discussions or the uh, data as such. The data were then ana analyzed um, when uh, descriptive statistics were employed, hence the quantitative uh, data, and the qualitative data um, were sorted into units of meaning, themes, and sub-themes. In 
if you look at the results there, and unfortunately, I, I don't want to turn my back on you, but just to give you a summary, 34 primary schools were included in the study. The participation level of Northwest Province was the highest, and Limpopo Province, on the other hand, the lowest. The uh, response in Limpopo Province was lowest due to the lack of quintal, quintal four and five schools within the 150 kilometer radius that was set up in the methodology of this research of the University of Venda, the chosen point of departure, because there was a point where you had to work around for the data collection. Um, schools were clustered according to their quintile rankings, and there was evidently a bias towards the quintile four and five. You can see there, starting at the light blue, working around to the dark blue. In most cases, class teachers, the generalists, were responsible for implementing physical education, especially in the quintile one to three schools. In the quintile four and five, combinations of a few qualified physical education specialists, generalists, external service providers, and NGOs delivered physical education, as well as franchised movement programs such as monkey gymnastics and play ball. Often, boys and girls participated in mixed or co-educational settings and concerns about unmanageable unmanage class sizes were raised. Most HODs and educators in life skills or in physical education educate, uh, indicated that they had five years or more teaching experience. Often this experience was through in-service training or learning. Educators indicated that they had attended multiple workshops and seminars on various matters of the CAPS document and not necessarily in physical education. A minority of these educators had a formal qualification, actually 38.1%. However, most indicated that they had completed short courses in life skills education, PE as well as sport training. From these primary schools, 9.1 educators indicated that they do not teach physical education regularly. Educators indicated that they often utilize physical education periods to catch up, it's not old news, or new, it's old news, um, periods to catch up with subjects such as mathematics and English or allow learners to do homework. During the focus group discussions, it also became evident that educators need time to catch up with the heavy workload of marking and administrative work required by CAPS that allows for little teaching time. Some, um, especially the non-specialist um, educator, indicated that they prefer the theory part and only take the learners out for the prescribed um, assessments. In this slide, the activity, uh, activities offered uh, the most frequently in physical education is depicted with structured physical education lessons and sports skill development uh, perceived as being offered the most often. It was indicated that uh, schools had the necessary policies and governance structures to provide direction, mentorship and leadership. Educators also agreed that a well-managed school ensured that all role players um, teachers, parents, learners, and the community understood and promoted the value of physical education. It was also perceived that the integration of values-based education in physical education programs um, played a significant role in the schools in which it was introduced. Most of the, indicator, uh, of the educators who participated in this study were in agreement that a shift in focus from assessment focus approach to presenting a curriculum with a holistic approach provided a wide variety of activities offering skill development, enjoyment, social interaction, and the potential to instill values such as spirit, discipline, respect, and fairness. The challenges perceived. The three main challenges reported by the educators are access uh, and quality of facilities availability and quality of equipment at the, and the CAPS document as a prescribed curriculum. Other uh, challenges such as training, budget, and support from parents were identified by the HODs as major challenges. The educators agreed with these 
as major challenges, but rated workload of the educators and the lack of mentoring of educators as additional major challenges. Proportionally, educators found access to and quality of facilities as a bigger challenge than the HODs in being able to deliver physical education. Almost 60% of educators indicated that the current CAPS curriculum was not a problem. Yet specialists and qualified educators reported challenges and limitations such as focus on physical activities rather than on meaningful education and holistic development, as well as the theory-practice divide, life skills theory versus the poor sport prac. At most of the, um, as most of the educators ap appeared concerned about the offering of physical education, they freely reported their key recommendations in the questionnaire without any external influence or probing. The most frequently listed recommendations uh, evident from the questionnaires as well as the focus group discussions include number one, the revision on an adaptation, adaptation of CAPS document to clarify content and reduce assessment requirements. Number two, improvement of um, physical resources with the recommendation that the upgrading of existing facilities and new facilities such as multi-purpose and sport facili uh, specific facilities erected to ensure optimal and safe participation for physical education. This recommendation directly linked to the training of educators and the uh, on the maintenance and optimal utilization of these facilities and provisions of quality equipment. Number three, the training. Training of qualified physical education teachers, especially in-service training, needs attention urgently. A need for a, a timely workshops, accredited workshops and courses to allow school and NGOs staff to deliver quality physical education, especially in the lower quintile schools, was voiced. Um, just in conclusion there, if you can, and that will be my last slide, um, uh, physical education, physical education, physical activity and sport activities have a positive effect. This can help with um, the prevention of various uh, illnesses. Physical activity and extramural sport activities are not qualified uh, quality physical education. PA and school sport cannot solve complex challenges that is rapidly growing. Social ills such as drug abuse Gangsterism, violence, and discrimination um, can't solve that as well. Um, there are good practices in physical education, and this should be shared amongst everybody. The role of the schools, we should appoint quality or qualified physical educations who deliberately encourage learners to participate in quality physical education, participation in school sport, and continue with participation in physical activity remain physically active and live in a healthy lifestyle. The next slide is just a re recommendations that we should be part or in line with what UNESCO and ICHSPE has to say about I think the, also the uh, Kazan Action Plan of what is needed for delivering quality physical education. But the dilemma is still there. Who are we? Who is responsible for what? And I think that will be debated and discussed as we go along. I thank you. Physical literacy? <laughs> Almost like me. <laughs> <laughs> Old. Now, a physical education teacher, I think um, it's somebody, we heard this morning, uh, we teach management, we teach sports science. A physical literacy teacher should have all of that, um, but to deliver on the holistic development of a child. So a, a 
t a good teacher, a qualified teacher, should be able to pick up on the needs of every child in that class. And with that needs, develop outcomes for that specific lesson to address all the domains of that person. But in the same time, should be a role model of a mover. Still be in movement, not necessarily at the gym, but I like that idea of an early morning walk, a lunchtime stay steps or whatever in the class that we do, did this morning. Showcase who you are in movement. And with that talk, we grew up as physical education students do push-ups, and nobody ever told me why a push-up is necessary. I still hate it, because from there we went to the army and we had to do push-ups, and it was painful. That's all I learned from that. We should be able to tell them what is the need and what is the outcome of doing a specific thing without uh, with addressing the needs of every child. Thank you, Colin. That answers your question. Actually, hello, hello. You. I don't know what yes. okay. Next speaker. Prof, I just want to know what is the disjuncture between these quintiles, quintile number one up to three, and quintile number four to five in terms of this uh, physical education? You, I think number one, it's a fluid system um, because people want to up, uplift their social ability, if I can call it that. Uh, pe uh, people, t uh, especially parents, go and see what school feeds into the university, what high school, and then what primary school feeds into the, that high school. And that school will be my child's school for them to become a student at the university. That I found in Limpopo, where people move from the quintile one to the quintile two, from the quintile two to the three, etc., to be on top or on par of what is being offered. But if you look at the, the resources and things, it's, it's a huge difference between quintile one and quintile five on resources. Not necessarily movement, because you get in quintile one excellent movers. People would draw or still draw netball courts with a stick on the ground mm -hmm. and they play. They run. They run to school. So they don't have to run more actually because they have done their movement for the day. But then you get to a school with an astro hockey field and they can't run once around that field. They can't dribble a ball but they've got that. They I don't know. I can't say what they do with it. <laughs> Does that will. answer your question with regard to a quinta? Partially. Okay, thank you. Um, good. <coughs> Sorry, good morning, everybody. Um, Professor, I would, I would like to go to the, the key recommendations um, that you flag there of, of what the teacher said the adaptation of the CAPS document and, and, but for me, most importantly, I think I did not hear um, how the teachers rotate in life orientation. They did not say that each and every term there might be a new teacher for LO. I, I didn't hear that. Maybe I just didn't actually get that part. Yeah, maybe I don't understand you very clearly, but um, what we found with the life orientation and physical education teachers, mm. it's quite often that the physical education teacher or the life orientation teacher sit in somebody's that just left um, like last term and they couldn't appoint somebody and they take that teacher to go and teach there. Um, so they get somebody out from the community to come fill in for physical education. And quite often it's somebody that dance or do art or a good footballer etc and they come and do whatever they're good at to come and do the physical education part but it's not a pattern there's not a real um, answer to say but what they do do they rotate do they um, how often do they theory how do often do they do the practical um, some of them never go out some people haven't got even space to go out to 
So, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm from another province. I'm from the Northern Cape. And in the Northern Cape, there would be a teacher, a new teacher. So I should have actually said novice teachers. Every year there's a new teacher. So when we do develop and empower a teacher with regards to, because I'm working with the department, the sports department at, 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 the, um, at the department. So it would be then, if we want to empower and develop a teacher, then the next year there would be another teacher in that same grade. So which means that, that what we did was fruitless. There's no growth. Can, can yes, exactly, there's no growth. Can and then my second that? part, which has been, um, I am, I was, I've been a, a, a life orientation subject advisor since 2001. And then in 2008, I um, enrolled at, at UJ, um, specifically to be trained also in at least the part of the physical ed. I did my B at honors, and I was really very disappointed because I got salts. Um, it's not me. I know. <laughs> <laughs> they said I had to take it up with the management of UJ, but then, of yeah. course, I didn't have any time, and I didn't have the measures to go there. But I, that was a challenge that I posed within the B at honors course, that when people go and do B at honors, the, the focus is really not, or is minimal, or hardly none on physical education. I'm not sure if the status is still the same because I did be it honors life orientation 2008, 2009. Thank okay, you. Thank you. If, if you don't mind if I answer that question on behalf of you. Um, I think that is the, the purpose of, of, of that's what we're to see at the end of this conference is that conversation that we need to have. And, and, and I think that that is a, a problem that we experience across the province with regard to life orientation, uh, uh, students not being trained in physical education. That's a, that's a report we got back from some of our young life orientation teachers who are helping us um, um, over this conference. Mr. Valensky? I can just add there from the UJ perspective. UJ is currently just teaching physical education with undergrad life orientation and life skills. In the honors, there's only the two programs, sport, uh, management, uh, teaching management or school management and something else. But we're busy working on an honors um, course yeah, in life orientation, physical education specifically. Oh, okay, you want to support me. Okay, all right, thank you. <laughs> Northwest University. Northwest is the only university that develop or teach physical education. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Can, can we have that lady over there and then Mr. Valensky is our last, is our last person to ask a question? Ma'am? Hi, everyone. Hi, Prof. Um, I was just wondering, obviously, these schools that you've done, because they are government schools, they have the CAPS curriculum. Have you done any similar studies or are there existing similar studies on independent schools or schools who are not using CAPS curriculum? Because I imagine that there could be different data, like maybe the same end result but for different reasons and um, so just interestingly you know what curriculum they're following whether they're finding it easier or more difficult and also what the status of their teachers are because often in independent schools they might not be the same requirement as a teacher um, you know qualification wise and job description wise um, I just want to tell you as well that you've seen this was all government school related but um, I work very closely to a private school set up as well where I stay. Um, and I think at some stages we don't have to stand back as government schools on what we offer our learners, what our teachers do, especially the salary. There's a wrong perception that they earn a lot of money. It's not the case. But the physical education at um, independent schools and in private setup, it's sport related. It's only that, uh, it's what we've spoken this morning about. Those few that plays in the first team hockey will go out to play hockey. Those who play football will go fl uh, play football. The others must go and do something, self-study on the corner of the field with a ball, <laughs> something. Thank you. So I hope I answered, I just want to ask, 
I think if you get gray or turn gray, your <laughs> ears start closing up. So I've learned over the last few years to read lip. So if I don't hear, I at least want to see lips moving, and then I know what the question is all about. It's difficult to hear without sound. Thank you, Professor. Mr. Walensky? Thank you. Um, Professor, firstly, I just want to make a statement. Um, I'm a product of the old Hewitt College of Education. And in our first year as being um, training as a teacher, um, physical education was compulsory. Whether you were useless or not, you had to do it. So, so I would want to ask if a teacher was trained at the, at the teacher's college, um, and like I said, it was compulsory, is an excuse for you to not offer PT? You might not have the expertise, but you have had some exposure in terms of, of um, um, studying PT. And then the other question I want to ask is, um, why is it that some of our teachers and some of our principals are so lazy? And the reason I ask that question is because if I listen to the suggestions, then doing PT is quite a simple thing, it's not rocket science. And hence I ask the question, why is it that some of our teachers are lazy by not doing the basics? And why is it that our, some of our principals are not motivating the staff to address these issues? If I listen to the colleague that's, that's from the Northern Cape, um, I would simply ask the question, but what does your timetable say in terms of these people being, rotating, being rotated as far as life orientation is concerned? And then my last question is, you spoke about filling the void of quali qualified PT teachers. My question to you would be, what practical suggestions would you have in order to fill that void in terms of the lack of quality, um, qualified PT yeah. teachers? Thank I you. Know, sorry, I don't know how much time we've got left. Um, actually, our time is up. <laughs> um, uh, but um, um, Mr. Belinsky, do you mind if we answer that question at the end of the session so we give the other speakers an opportunity to come up? I just want to refer you to my first slide, the so-called first slide. That way the ignition must take place amongst the teachers because our learners, especially at primary school, are naturally movers. We must keep on doing that. So we must be the passionate person who can take that passion to move to our learners throughout. And I think the principal, number one, and the district officers, number two, should make sure the um, inspectors, what do they call them? The other? Subject advisors, they should make sure that people jack up their jacks. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, um, is Janita and Lovu in this session? Okay, um, we're now going to welcome Dr. Deborah Zeller and Danielle Dolly to the stage to do their presentation. So there's no, nothing on here to see what's your presentation on somebody. No. Let me see. Yeah. Button to push. Which way did you push it? That one goes that way. If you want Perfect. To reverse, yeah. Okay. Huh? Okay, perfect. Good morning, everybody. You see, you all need to wake up. Where's Karen? She needs to be here. Thank you very much. You <laughs> All right, I'm Dr. Debbie Zeller from Wits University, and I'm presenting today with my colleague from NMU, Daniel Dolly. And basically, what we're talking about is the professional development of non-specialist physical education. So what we have been dealing with today and looking at is that we are lacking physical education specialists. And yes, we, where's Quibus gone now? We need to do something about it. The higher education institutions have been hamstrung because they are told we need to train life or orientationists and not physical education specialists. So we start right with the teachers coming out of varsity. But what we have to deal with are the teachers who are in schools currently who have suddenly been asked to do something so incredibly complex. So we know physical education is an incredibly exciting subject. It has the potential to make a difference. We can change the lives of our learners we promote holistic development. It's all been said already today, but we've got to believe that we can be mad. 
we as physical educationists can make a difference. Now, what happened is physical education went from being standalone to part of life orientation or life skills in the foundation phase and intermediate phase. And we can understand that because physical education orientates learners to life. And I've always been the advocate that physical education can do it all. We do social development, we do physical, de uh, physical development, we do personal development, we teach about human rights through activity. So physical education can actually orientate learners to life. And in fact that we are now facing an obesity crisis makes physical education even more important. And we need to get our nation moving. We are an incredibly sedentary nation, and it's up to us to develop not just the skills, but the knowledge, and more importantly, the values, that we value and know why and know how to get moving. So, internationally, it is known we should be employing quality physical education programs in our schools, in our country. And that requires specialists, good curriculums, support, time, as well as equipment and space. Now you just look at those things. We are really battling. And we start right at the top where we don't do the, uh, produce the teachers or we don't have the teachers in the field, and that's the most important. Because if we have the teachers in the field and we're producing specialists, they will know how to cope with the deficits that we have there. But we can't do that. So South Africa is actually falling short. So we know we need to try and get specialists teaching physical education. Because many or most don't have the requisite PCK, the pedagogical content knowledge. And we need to understand that teachers who are required to teach it actually have said, you know something, I'm not comfortable doing this. And you can't blame them because they actually really don't know what they should be doing. So let's look at it. In South Pierre, the, what Corbus has just spoken to, out of that paper by Cora Burnett came the fact that 62.3 teachers are non-specialists. The recommendation that came out of that paper, we need to train in service. We need professional development. Now, I did my master's in 2009, and a case study of 25 teachers, of that 24 had no phys ed qualifications. 23 had never even received any phys ed training, let alone all the other things that were there. So we know that our teachers in South Africa face huge barriers in trying to implement quality programs, and through no fault of their own. And what we have researched is that professional development can help them. And our teachers are saying, please help me because they're getting very little support. Our subject advisors generally are not physical education specialists, because they're life orientationists. And physical education is such a complex subject that these poor life orientation teachers have got to be all sorts of specialists, from guidance to careers to human rights people. How can they fit it all in? Now you must jam phys ed knowledge in as well. So phys ed is actually falling short. So, professional development is needed because if you have a look, this is an implementation model that's in the development. You'll see the program that's often given to our children, that is the middle block there, and you'll see at the top of that is the teacher. What does the teacher need? And what we never ever talk about is that bottom bullet point, motivation to teach it. How many of our teachers in the field actually go, oh, you know what, I don't want to do it. And they throw them a ball or say go and do something. They're not motivated because they don't know why. 
they need to do it. And unfortunately, if we're talking about this teacher, this is the teacher that's got to encourage positive physical activity participation for all learners, not the sportsmen. They're getting extramural coaching. We need the fat, fatty, sedentary, lazy lump who doesn't want to do anything. we the ones who have got to work with those. Our doctor who gave the presentation from America spoke earlier, and she said, we need to relate to everybody. Those are the kids we want to draw in and make excited about moving. All right. So, we know their benefits, but I also have to warn you. Physical develop uh, professional development programs are sometimes a waste of time. So for some people, you just mentioned you did a course that you felt you got no benefit from, all right? We have got to actually be concerned and very considerate about what we put in our prof professional development programs to help our educators. There's so many fly by nights who are coming in and saying, come do this training, come do this training, it's going to help you, and they leave and they still know wiser as to what they were doing. So research has shown if we are going to do professional development programs, there's got to be ongoing support where the teachers can actually come and say, can you refresh, can you help me? There's got to be some continuity with what they're doing because it's a lot to take in in one program. We've got to supply them with quality teaching learning support materials. So they need lessons. They need teaching cue cards. They need things they can work with. Because otherwise, what they do in the professional development program is forgotten. So give them something they can continue growing with and working with. Most important, what you put in to the program has got to be curriculum driven, that they can use and understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. But I also found out that how you put it across. The pedagogy of your program is as important. And this is what I found, is that our teachers at a professional development program want to be involved practically. They need to be moving. They need to see what's happening in order for them to model. They want practical activities. They need to practice. So what you're doing with them, they can take and they can use in their own classrooms. But most important is that whoever's doing the program has got to understand the context in which the teacher operates. Because the majority of our teachers are functioning in schools with no space, no equipment, classes of 60 up. If they don't uh, know how to cope with that, they're going to go home and say, well, this doesn't work. And bang goes the phys ed lessons again. So... I've started working with NMU, who are developing a wonderful, wonderful program, because I do believe that our teachers who are non-specialists can be helped, if they're helped with the right program and helped in the right way. So, we are looking at... Thanks so much, Debbie, for that introduction about the need for um, the in-service training of physical education. So I'll be speaking more towards the Kazibantu project. As you can see, Healthy Schools for Healthy Communities. My name is Danielle Dolly, and I'm from Nelson Mandela University. So the Kazibantu project is a collaboration between the Nelson Mandela University, together with the Department of Sport, Exercise, and Health from the University of Basel in Switzerland, as well as the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute in Basel, Switzerland. We do have a wider team. Um, oh, sorry. So my presentation for today, I'm gonna speak a little bit on our previous study that we did, was the DASH study. I'm gonna speak about the Kazibantu project, and then I'll give you a little bit of preliminary results on what we did with our research. Um, I'll speak towards the Zwide, Zwide Sia Pakama Schools project that we've uh, started, and then I'll go on to speak about the short learning program that we've developed that Debbie spoke about. So here we go. 
So we do have a wider team than what is displayed here today, but I'll be focusing specifically on uh, the Kazibantu project. So you can see Debbie is over there from Wits University, and I am the South African project coordinator for the Kazibantu project. So here we see our Dash story, which began in 2014 and went up until 2017. This was disease, activity, and school children's health. It was a multi-fold intervention program, but with our background here today, looking at physical education in movement or movement education, our focus will be on the intervention in yellow, which was physical education, physical fitness, uh, the physical fitness program as well. You'll see also, because it started in 2014, we've been collaborating with the University of Basel for the past 10 years, so we're also quite proud about that. So the Kazibantu project is an expansion of the DASH research project, as I've mentioned. Kazibantu began in 2018 and is a school-based program aimed at the practice of quality physical education and ensuring the healthy, active living of both school children and teachers. We have students from both Uni Basel and NMU who have obtained their master's degrees through the research conducted in the Kazibantu project, as well as two PhD uh, students. And the, the, at the moment, currently, we have five PhD students, including myself, who's working on their research. So rather than talking too much about what we offer, I'm going to show you a quick video on uh, the Kazibantu in a nutshell. And there's no sound. Oh, no way. So you can see at the bottom um, how we came to Kazi Bantu. Kazi meaning active and Bantu meaning people. And that's why we have Kazi Bantu being active people. When schools are filled with healthy teachers and learners, children have a better chance at reaching their full potential. But in disadvantaged and marginalized communities, this is not always the case. Kazi Bantu is working to make a positive contribution by giving teachers and learners the tools to live healthier lives. This Swiss South African initiative is improving the health and well-being of teachers and learners at low-resource schools in several African countries. Guided by the UNESCO Chair on Physical Activity and Health in Education Settings, Kazi Bantu is rolling out two key projects, Kazi Kids and Kazi Health. Kazi Kids is a holistic educational toolkit which teachers can use to promote healthy behaviours. Linked to the South African CAPS curriculum, the Kazi Kids lessons can be used in life skills and life orientation classes from grade 1 to 7. Kazi Kids uses games, activities and music to guide children through the content, covering three key pillars. Physical education. Moving to music. Health, hygiene and nutrition education. All the Kazi Kids lessons and songs are freely available online, along with summarized cue cards which can be used when teaching outdoors. The four Kazi Kids cartoons also bring the pillars to life in a fun and interactive way with Kazi and Tandy showing Principal Pumla, Jabu and Lulu how to apply Kazi Kids at school. All the Kazi Kids teaching material is available in English and French and has already been used at selected schools in South Africa, Senegal, Ivory Coast and Tanzania. 
The Kazi Health Programme is providing teachers with the knowledge and skills they need to improve their own health. Kazi Health offers a five-step programme where health practitioners work with teachers to achieve their personal health goals. It includes individual risk assessments to determine teachers' current health status, using the online Kazi Chat assessment tool, a personal health risk profile which is generated using a traffic light model, helping teachers understand their assessment results. Lifestyle coaching sessions with a biokineticist, dietitian and psychologist, providing information on physical activity, nutrition guidance, stress and sleep management. Self-monitoring, motivation and goal setting, where teachers can use the innovative Kazi Health mobile app. Evaluation of personal goal set through an individual health risk assessment. And in their own time, teachers can also complete a Continued Professional Development CPD, accredited online health and wellness course. This looks at understanding and changing personal health behaviours. Complementing the Kazi Bantu programme, Kazi Play aims to assess schools' needs around hygiene and playground infrastructure. When teachers and learners live healthier lives, they can build stronger communities and better futures. Join us and let's promote healthy schools for healthy communities together. I don't have many slides left because that basically said everything about the Kazibantu project. So part of Kazibantu, we've also got some research that we're busy with. Here you'll see our protocol that was published, um, the, the study protocol that is. Uh, the study was done in, from January to September in 2019 um, and the aim of course is to assess the effect of school-based health interventions in marginalized communities and that is specifically in Kibeha, uh, Eastern Cape. To give you an overview of what we've done, um, we looked at the anthropometry and clinical assessments, obviously looking at BMI, um, body fat percentage, um, looking at the full blood lipids, looking at cholesterol, what is the, the status of diabetes, um, physical fitness, physical activity, cognitive performance, academic performance, um, also uh, as well as what was spoken about earlier was the psychosocial health. So the population we worked was the intermediate phase, so grade four to six learners and that was eight quintile three schools, quintile three primary schools. Um, and then quickly just to speak about our Zwede project that we've started. So this is a collaboration that started basically from last year between the Khaleesi Foundation, Ubuntu Pathways, which is a school-based NGO in Port Elizabeth, and United Through Sport, a sports-based NGO, as well as the Kazibantu project. So research has been the foundation of our Kazibantu project, so that's why we see this collaboration as an opportunity to move closer toward community engagement. Uh, the Zwede Sia Pakama Schools Project is the Khaleesi Foundation's inaugural education and sports development project, named for Sia Khaleesi, as well as his mother, Pakama. So Sia Pakama means we are rising. It seeks to address physical education, malnutrition, academic education, life skills, and youth empowerment to help children and youth exit the poverty cycle and become active and positive contributors to society. I'm just gonna speak lastly on the short learning program, which is why we are here. So part of the two-step process that we're gonna be working with in this video project is to support school nutrition, but that's not what we are here for. We're here to speak about the training of educators using SACE accredited programs. So what we developed with, well, sorry, according to teaching staff, the implementation of quality physical education is not feasible with the current curricula, resources, and physical education trained teacher constraints. Teachers are required to obtain 150 SACE points in every three year cycle. So we therefore identify state run continued professional development uh, frameworks to be a promising pathway to upskill non-specialist teachers. So Debbie, myself, and a group of colleagues in the Kazibantu team have been working together since 2020 on this physical education program. 
and toward the end of last year, our foundation phase um, SLP was SAIS accredited. So this is a two-day course, and it offers 15 points covering the various topics over there. But in a nutshell, our foundation phase, as well as intermediate and senior phase um, short learning programs, is curriculum uh, derived. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask Professor Leach. Professor Lloyd to come up and do his presentation and if you ladies don't mind if we could take all the questions at the end of the session then rather. So if any of you had questions for the ladies and for um, the previous speaker, please jot that down and keep it for later on and then this is just to make up some time for us during the program. Thank you ladies. Again a round of applause. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you to Ishmael and his team for organizing the um, conference. I think it's really a good event and long overdue. And I'm looking forward to future events as well. I'm not too sure if the slides are good to go. Um, Okay, so I think while we're getting the slides ready, uh, just a bit about myself. I'm at the University of the Western Cape. My colleague, Prof. Travel, is the head of department. He's here with me as well. And I think I've also got a few students presenting at the conference as well. So it's been a fantastic event so far, and uh, I'm looking forward to future events as well. Uh, in our department, we've got a whole range of different programs, but essentially we have a program in sports science, um, sports management and also biokinetics as well. And so my presentation this afternoon is focusing on the research on physical activity and physical education over the last 20 years. So I know that it's quite a challenge to select research that's done countrywide um, and to decide which ones to include and which ones to exclude. So it's very likely that many of you, um, I know there's many academics here today, that's also involved in research on physical activity, physical education. And um, I may have left out some of your studies, so my apologies, Nikki, for having left out studies from Northwest or from Nelson Mandela. I know that you guys are doing quite a lot of research. And so uh, if you would bear with me, I've got a few articles that I want to present the research on. And then maybe we can, in the open discussion, discuss some of the other research that may not have been included in this, in this presentation. Okay. Seems like there's no presentation. So. Okay, any questions? <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. I told, the, I told the organizer, please make sure the slides are all clear, but you know, my work is, <laughs> My work is never done. Um, so maybe we could just take one question quickly on the previous presentation by Danielle and Debbie. John? In front, um, Ivan. Thank you very much, John O'Connor again. Um, thank you very much for the presentation that comes from the more practical side of what we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in our schools. I did want to ask a question about the fact that we have these two bands of education. One is the, is the more academic band, which is the university band, the higher education band. But we now have the QCTO band, the, the vocational band. 
and that vocational band stretches all the way up to NQF level Just 8. Question quickly. Um, and there seems to be certain qualifications that now sit on the ETDPC scope that kind of that is for further education um, and training practitioners and the extent to which those are, are going to be recognized by, by, I suspect some of our experts, most of our experts in the room are essentially coming from the H -E, uh, uh, CHE band or the HEQC band. Um, and the reason why I'm asking that question because if, you, if I look at the intensity of what you've presented, I mean the intensity of the program and how beautifully it was done, then I suspect it cost a lot of money. And therefore, if we look at the statistics that you showed from Professor Cora Burnett as, as well as that Professor Wu showed, then there, there is a huge amount of money that's going to be required to train our physical education non-specialist, I should say. And, and it seems to me that that money in South Africa is now primarily available on the other side, on the skill side, in the National Skills Fund in the CETAS and in some of these presidential programs. So for instance, we now have this teacher assistance that we want to deploy into the schools. And I just wanted to hear what your opinion and some of our other colleagues' opinions are about this other band. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for that. My apologies for the delay. So uh, I'll get right into it. So my presentation looks at research on physical, physical activity and physical education in South Africa over the last 20 years, 2000 to 2020. And uh, so it's a selected study, obviously, uh, based on what I consider to be uh, useful. And just to mention that our university turned 60 a few years ago, so it's also a milestone for, for our institution. Okay. Okay, so the question I have for you is, are South African youth sufficiently physically active? So I present you a bit of data, and hopefully by the end of the presentation, you can answer that question. So to start out with, just giving you some global statistics by the World Health Organization. So we see that approximately 28% of the world's population are deemed to be physically inactive. And this was a study, uh, research published in 2016. I tried to get some latest data, but it doesn't seem to be anything more recent than that. Of this, of this 28%, we find that more females are physically inactive, 32%, and 23% are, are male. And essentially, they define physical activity as individuals engaging in at least 30 minutes of moderate physical activity for at least five days of the week, or 20 minutes of vigorous activity for at least three days of the week. In addition, we found that on a global level, at least 81% of adolescents aged 11 to 17 were insufficiently physically active, also uh, stats published in 2016. And of this 81%, at least four out of every five adolescents aged 11 to 17 did not meet the recommended daily minimum requirements of 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity. Of these, once again, females had a high percentage at 85% and males at 78%. So these are quite, you know, um, disparaging figures if you look at, 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 at what it reflects on our youth. Uh, it also shows that more than 60% of adolescents spend at least two hours a day on recreational screen time, which is quite, quite um, um, substantial. If you look at the South African statistics, uh, we see that South Africans were among the least active on the continent. 48% of adult women and 45% of adult men were physically inactive. The National Youth Risk Behavior Study in 2008 found that 41% of our youth had insufficient or no physical activity in the week. Once again, females slightly higher, 46% uh, compared to males at 37%. Uh, in addition, the South African National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey in 2013, this was done on uh, youth 18 to 24 years, 
it showed that 66% of males and 38% of females were considered to be physically fit. So once again, you can see it's a reflection on gender um, in, the, in the sense that females having a lower um, percentage of physical fitness. Uh, my apologies, this is quite a busy slide, and I'm not too sure you can see much of the information, but essentially, the study by McVeigh in 2004 looked at the relationship between socioeconomic status and physical activity patterns in South African children. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'll go through it, I'm not too sure if you can see the data, you know, at the, but I'll go through it uh, and just highlight some of the, the, the key aspects. And so we see that uh, it's a comparison between essentially white and black children. And the, the, first, the first section, um, the first section here deals with white children, and you've got females and males, and the second group looks at black children, uh, females and males. And if you look at the different um, variables, look in the first column, you see the physical education, uh, and those, those who answered, Yes, to participate in physical education, we see that amongst the white children, the highest percentage was amongst the white males at 93% were participating in physical education. Next were white females at 89%. If you look at black females, they were 34% and black males at 27%. So we can see there's a substantial difference just in, in participation in physical education. Uh, um, in the school curriculum. And then the breakdown goes to look at the amount of TV time. And we look at then the next, the next variable on, on TV watching. We see here yeah, that on average, there's a score for, for females was 14, for white males it was 17, and for black females it's 23, and for black males it's 26. So you see, once again, a substantially higher percentage of TV time for black children compared to white children. And then I think the, I'm not going to go through all of them, but the last variable that looks at the amount of net physical activity. So essentially, that is a measure of physical activity in terms of energy expenditure. And comparatively speaking, we can see here for the white children, we find that the white males had the highest energy expenditure at 22 net physical activities. Next were the white females at 14, and then the black females at 8, and the black males at 10. So essentially, the black children were expending half of the energy compared to white children. And so clearly there's quite a, quite a substantial discrepancy in terms of physical activity participation. And this was study done in 2004, and not much has changed uh, since then. If you look at the results from the study, essentially, you see that children who had a high socioeconomic status, these were mostly white children, had mothers with the highest education levels. Generally, they came from dual parent homes, both parents. They were highly physically active. They watched less television. They weighed more, but more importantly, they had a greater lean tissue mass. And they were more likely to participate in PE classes at school. So quite um, um, critical results produced from this study in 2004. If you look at the more recent study done by McVeigh in 2014, and here they looked at physical activity and sedentary behavior uh, in an ethically diverse group of South African school children. And this study showed that the time spent by these children in moderate to vigorous physical activity declined over the school years for all race groups. So as these learners progressed from grades one and two, up to grades 10, 11, and 12, there was a steady decline in physical activity, both moderate and vigorous intensity physical activity. Also, there was consistently lower participation in girls compared to boys. 
with increasing grade for both boys and girls for all race groups. So as these learners progress from grades one and two up to grades 10 and 12, the amount of sedentary time increased, irrespective of gender, irrespective of race. Additional results produced by the study show that black and Indian children were less physically active than white children. Black children also spent most of their time in sedentary activity. Black children had the highest percentage of overweight. And regardless of ethnicity, children who spent more than four hours a day on screen time had twice the likelihood of being overweight. So this is quite important information, that the more time you spend watching, you know, working behind a screen, it translates directly into you being more likely to be overweight or obese. And so this, this, this study results showed, um, and here we see in the lower grades, on the lower grades, you can see here grades one and two, we can see here that the lower bar indicates the physical activity, and the upper bar indicates sedentary time. So you can see that in the lower grades, there was the bars are quite, quite um, wide, indicating a large amount of physical activity, but also an equally large amount of sedentary time. But as they progress towards the higher grades, you can see here the bars decrease in size, indicating here that the amount of physical activity time decreased with increasing grade, and the amount of sedentary time increased with increasing grade. So just once again reflecting the results that they've reported uh, for the study. Uh, this study uh, was done by Lambert, just giving an overview of the physical activity country card for South Africa. So this is some statistics reported for across the entire country. And so maybe just to highlight two things about this slide, and the one is around the deaths related to physical inactivity. So if we can then quantify the amount of people who are dying because of being physically inactive, it shows here that in South Africa, 14% of our deaths are due to physical activity, physical inactivity. And once again, if you look at the general statistics across the population, we see that for both genders, 53% of our adult population are physically inactive. And once again, females being at a higher percentage um, can't get this. Uh, males, physical activity is 58%, and females, physically active, at 48%. So once again, uh, a gender di discrepancy in terms of uh, which gender is more physically active. And we see then even more recent data on the um, population statistics. Not much has changed from 2013 to 2018. And so we see then that in terms of physical activity, the, the percentage for males is dropped down from 58 to 53, and for females, from um, dropped down to 34%. So clearly, with, with the passing years, more and more males and females are becoming, becoming increasingly inactive. Um, Okay. So, a more recent study by uh, Kinsman, and this was done on rural South African girls. This study showed that physical inactivity and sedentary behavior were high generally in the uh, South African uh, population. Adolescent girls especially were at high risk. Um, physical inactivity also fueled the expanding epidemic of NCDs. So there's a direct association be between the amount of physical inactivity and the increasing burden of non-communicable diseases. So participating in school physical education was associated with a higher level of physical activity and a lower level of sedentary behavior. So the more kids that were participating in school PE translated into being more physically active 
and sitting less. Children who engaged in PE classes also tended to be more physically active on other days, on other weekdays as well as other weekend days. So giving these kids physical education at school translated directly into them being physically active on other days as well as over weekends as well. And so just some statistics by a study done by Prioreshki in 2017. This study was done on cardiorespiratory fitness levels and the association with physical activity and body composition in young South African adults aged 19 to 20 years, and this was done in Soweto. And so if you look at essentially the, the data, the first graph indicating this is the average minutes per day. This is the amount of time spent per day. And we see here the amount of sedentary time is the first one, and the dark bar, black one indicating males, and the lighter one indicating females. And so we see here, for both of these genders, the amount of sedentary time on a daily basis was quite high. Okay, compared to all the other um, bars, the most significant one was the one for sedentary time. If you look then at the next light activity, okay, it was substantially less, but also, once again, a large amount of time spent on light activities, both in males and females. In terms of vigorous activity, we see there that there's much less time spent in moderate activity for males and females. And once again, the gender split, more males are moderately active than, than females. And in terms of vigorous activity, we see that mainly the males were in participating in vigorous activity and little or no females were involved in vigorous activity. So the take-home message from this uh, data is that too much time is spent in physical inactivity for our youth. And if you look then at the link between activity and body composition, and the next, the next set of data looks at the... Just check it very really carefully. My apologies, my I said it's not all that what it used to be. So the black bar indicates the participants who are underweight. The white bar in the middle indicates those of normal weight, and the bar with the stripes indicates those uh, participants who are overweight or obese. Okay, and so the first the first set of three bars indicates the body composition of males. And the second set looks at the body composition of females. And so clearly we see here that in terms of VO2 cardiorespiratory fitness, we see that the females have got a higher level of cardiorespiratory fitness. All the bars are much higher on the left-hand side than the bars on the right. So females have got a lower level of fitness, cardiorespiratory fitness, compared to males. More importantly, it shows here that the males who in the stripe bar, those who were in the obese and overweight category, had statistically significant lower levels of fitness compared to the learners who had normal weight or those who were underweight. So once again, a higher level of, a higher body composition in the category of being overweight or obese translates into a lower level of activity and into a lower level of cardiorespiratory fitness. Okay, so I think my time is up. So I've got a bit more data, but I think if my time is up then, thank you very much for the time. Professor Leach, um, there's just a comment I want to make. Um, I, I like the comparison to between the activity and the inactivity and the, uh, the fact that there's a lot of screen time being spent. And the comment I want to make is that um, recently the Western Cape Schools Athletics, the high school tournament was supposed to be at Greenpoint Stadium and it got kicked out on the Saturday because of e of an e-sport launch. So that, that is a bit of an irony that I wanted to share with you. Um, questions we'll keep to at the end after um, 
Dr. Issa's presentation. Um, I've noted the two questions that must all be answered, the one by Mr. Valensky and the one by John. Um, and so we will um, take the questions further at the end of Professor, uh, Dr. Issa's um, presentation. Yeah, so just please note that instead of um, Dr. Shahid Talib from um, CPUT, we now have Dr. Umar Iso from the University of Stellenbosch. Right, thank you very much for having me. Uh, yes. I want to thank uh, Mr. Taladia for reorganizing his program. Dr. Shahid Talib was a cricket player with me. <laughs> Dr. Shahid Talib played cricket with me, so I could convince him to come tomorrow, and I'll come today. That's why I'm here, without the proper preparation. But I have a daughter that's graduating tomorrow. For me, I only got one daughter. So I thought that's more important than sport. I've been busy with sport since, you know, since whatever. And uh, I participated, you know, from a junior right to senior. I, I'm still a junior though. And I've, I've been at school for about 35 years. Been a PT teacher, a maths teacher, whatever, anything. And I ended up being a chess coach, so I thought, look, instead of just talking, I even wrote the book. So with the presidential um, initiative, we went round to about, I think it was about 20, uh, 20 schools in the Western Cape, which was about, uh, we trained about 800 um, educator assistants. So that was just in chess. Athletics did the same in case the athletics uh, people don't know about it. But my topic for today, and I want to re relate that, you know, I want to, to intertwine between the two and just to make the conversation more lively. So I talk about improving education through sport towards a more vibrant and all-inclusive sport program in the Global South. Look, we're part of the Global South. So if Zimbabwe goes down, we go down. If Zimbabwe goes up, we go up. So that is important to note. You cannot live in isolation thinking our school got a big electric fence and that township school down the road, they will never come by us because we will shock them. So I feel when we talk about sport and holistic sport, we need to, to be all inclusive and we need to take cognizance of the fact that in South Africa, the majority of our fellow human beings don't have what, we got the biggest GDP. In fact, there's the biggest gap between the haves and the have-nots. So yes, uh, Shai probably would have spoken about cricket and how the finesse of batting and all that. I had to be in tomorrow, and I think tomorrow is a political part of sport, so that's why I'm bringing this up. So just to look at my first um, slide, there's two papers that we can talk about in the South African context. And this is for the academics and all of us. Two papers. The one paper can be, and I'm going to, this paper focuses on the challenges and complexity of changing and decolonizing sport in the Global South. We need a set of conceptual frames to move us forward. And in South Africa, there has been a gradual shift in the debate and the discourse from the apartheid era, you all know the apartheid era, through to the transformation era. You recall during the Isasa period or sports, we spoke about transformation. And then afterwards, there was that clarion call for social justice. And then, of course, we're now into an era where we say we need to decolonize. So those are the different eras we're looking at in the sport, in sport when we talk about, you know, sport in South Africa. 
We cannot have blinkers. We need to know it was apartheid, it was transformation. And I think a famous saying in the transformation that I always heard, the late uh, Steve Sweet, he used to say, um, in fact, this was, uh, he used to say, look, a child in court, you know, a child in sport is a child out of court. But then also, transformation is not just about black kids wearing white t-shirts. And there they go play, play for all, everybody. And then, of course, the money goes to the, the manager. And thank you very much. We made a lot of money. But we also tried to promote uh, so-called uh, grassroots sport. And the NGO goes home to a great uh, bank manager, etc., etc. So the research question in this instance can be, how do I go about decolonizing sport? This is the one paper that we can write. And then, of course, when we look into the era that we find ourselves, where we need to work together in this melting pot, the next paper can be, in this paper, I critically reflect and unpack how our school sports programs could be enhanced. There appears to be a will, and this is true, eh? I've gone to the different schools now over the last month, there appears to be a will among some sectors to make school sport vibrant. But in the main, school sport is not happening. And that is at the majority of the local township schools. So the research question for this paper uh, that I think we should address, how does engagement by educators enrich the lives of learners and bridge the gap between the public, which is the mass-based state school, and the elite private schools. So that is another paper that we need to unpack. And yes, uh, it's not us against them because we are all in, in South Africa or in the global south. It's about how can I sort of take my school, if it's a township school, and provide quality physical education or quality sports programs so that we can also become like bishops or like sex. Instead of saying, no, sex must be burned down, you see, because we're decolonizing, we must, uh, these people can't have such a grand life, they must come live by us. Instead of saying, yes, we can be proudly South African, we've got some, uh, uh, there's an example of how a school can be if given the privileges. And then, of course, we can, I don't say we can aspire to that, but we must strategically think, how can we make and empower all our schools in South Africa? And not by minimizing or shouting slogans like, let's boycott that school, man, and as you see a wit person in your path, go with the fillers block, or if you see a so-called, you know what I mean? And it's for us to, in the melting pot, see how we can come together to put it in easy words. So these are the two different questions. And I've seen protagonists, and I've seen activists, so-called activists, and I've seen some people sloganize, and they shout that uh, there can be no sport in the new South Africa, or no normal sport in the, I mean, these things are all good. But how do you take the country forward? And I think that is the beauty of this uh, this forum or this uh, gathering or this conference that Ishmael is having, how can we try to promote something positive in our country? And that, I think, is the beauty of the conference. So, when you look at the apartheid era, this would have sound well. Improving education, yeah, oh my nerves, yes, I'm looking at, this could have been, uh, yeah, like, yes. First of all, yes, just to look at the different theoretical lenses that we look in our academic papers. We can utilize critical race theory and we can look at things in a way where we say, look, let's hate the others or let's uh, try to, to be strong and, and, and assert ourselves like Muhammad Ali did, etc., and say, this is us. But at the end of the day, 
we don't want to take the stance and this is us, we'll get the rest. We want to be all inclusive. So the critical race theory one needs to ask, is that the right theory that we must utilize in a contemporary South Africa? Well, if you read the works of people like Bell Hooks, she's passed on, but also a good way to empower or give you self-confidence if you were of the disenfranchised. And then, of course, you all know Cornel West, because if they look at the master, if you look at the, the master thing on television, if you want to be a critical theorist, you must follow Cornel West. And then if you want to be a great feminist, Gloria Ladson Billings. And then, of course, if you're talking about Franz Fanon, everybody knows about uh, changing economies, and everybody knows why Steve Beaker was killed, or they think so. And then, of course, you have Jonathan Jensen. On the one day, he says, close the schools, and the next day, he says, open the schools. So, so these are our contemporaries. Then you have Mbembe. He thinks he knows everything about decolonization. And according to him, everybody must go a certain route. And then, of course, you have the beautiful arch Desmond Tutu. So I want you to look at these critical theorists and the contemporary eras and see where do we fit in as uh, human beings. So yes, this was during the apartheid era, this would have sound right, uh, Mr. O'Connor. I have a dream, you know, <laughs> where I see my four little children that were killed, or no, will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, by the content of their character. And yes, people will say, viva, and I'm going to walk down the road now, and the first person I see that doesn't agree with me, say, Corpus weg. So, or you can go what the art says. Do your little bit of good where you are. It's those little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world, you know? So, so yes, this is the... the, the the slide that I suppose will suit most of us, or all of us, you know, do the little bit of good where you are, it's those little bits of good put together that will overwhelm the world. So this is the challenge for us as sports persons. We can easily sit back and say, no, we will never reach that level, so we won't go out and do PT, I will keep on my jacket, I've got some fat, but I've got lean tissue, Lloyd. <laughs> so the lean tissue is hidden. So we are not going to do physical education because we see that as a white privilege. But I think at the end of the day, there is the debate. If you're saying sports for all, everybody must have the right to physical education, whether it's in the morning or in the afternoon. The other thing that worries me as we talk about physical education during school, Sometimes you sweat more than others. Now you've just, you've got PT nine o'clock in the morning and you were fit enough running around, you come back in the classroom, you, you're tired for the day. You can't do mathematics, you can't do the other stuff, so now you've done PT early. And there's not showers at the school, Ishmael. So what do you do in that case? Because when students or scholars reach high school, we need to have maybe in the afternoon, maybe at 2 o'clock or 1 o'clock. We don't say the school closed, but the school is going to have a mass-based uh, physical education program. And then after an hour, we're going to have uh, Tai Chi or Karate or whatever. But we need to split the school in a program like that. And it must come from the department legitimately to the principal, because principals when they see the subject advisor, they think it's their salary package coming. So they say, here's a subject advisor, no, we can't do PT, you know, and then, but I think it's the, it's, it's, and it's not in the principle, it's not in the policy yet. What does the policy say? What's CAPS document 2.1.3.4? And all those type of stupid arguments and nothing happens at school. I think we need to put up practical stuff where we can go out there and just live a happy, 
a happy, easy, and a, a lucky life at school. But you can't expect schools to be, you know, you come into some schools, the teachers are tense. The learners, they are frivolous. Why? Because maybe there's no physical education. The teachers worried because half of the staff is on contract. If half of the staff is in contract, everybody's standing and, and, and want to do the right thing because they're scared they're not going to have a job the next week. So we need to look at all those things before we can really say, listen, let's make this a happy PT or PE school. So coming to some other issues that I, I'm just pointing out in random, I'm not here to, 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 to leave you with any statements. So the next slide is the issue of institutional culture. Along I come, I'm a good chess player or a rugby player or a cricket player. They say, look, when uh, you're from Bonte, you will, you know, Rosewood Primary, but we've got a bursary for you. You can go to Rondebosch Boys and you can go play cricket there and you can walk on the best fields. Now, when I come to Rondebosch Boys, I can't bat properly any longer because now I'm not playing with my friends. I'm playing with people that got the same capital that I have. And I can't be creative. I'm not in my element. So the issue of institutional culture, and this is the way things are done at certain places. So I'm not going to go into that. I just wanted to touch on that. I see my five, I didn't even start talking yet. I'm just trying to warm up, you see. <laughs> so uh, institutional culture, the way things are done, you know, at certain schools or at certain places. If you don't fall in line, you're either going to lose your job or you will never make the A side in the cricket team, etc., etc. If you must know how I came out to be a chess master or a chess coach, I, I had an athletics team, you know, that I trained day and night at school. We wanted to come first. I don't know who taught me the idea you must come first, you know. I think, I don't know if it's, if it's not Ishmael, but Ishmael mentored me in a lot of things. But that time I was still with athletics and cricket and rugby and as a rugby club we always thought you must win at all costs. It's, a, it's not a good thing to teach the, the learners. And then I, I, I trained the athletics team, uh, Mr. O'Connor, the first year. Now you must know I trained everything, 100 meters, 200 meters, uh, 800 meters, high jump, long jump, uh, javelin even, shot put, nearly fell on my toes. But all those things. And it takes years to build a sports team. It doesn't take overnight to win. So it was the fifth year already, and our school would come first. And then, of course, uh, when it came to the relay, I think uh, the under nine learner was about 40 meters ahead, going to win already. Long comes another guy, and he grabs the the, 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 the baton out of a hand and says, you disqualified, you know, and the child cried and, uh, you know, I knew how each child, you know, is mine. If you train an athletic team, you know exactly how, how they feel at different moments. I ran up there and I had a conflict with the, the man and the rest is history. I was suspended of all contact codes and that's why I went into chess. <laughs> So anyway, that is, <laughs> that, is, that is a short history, but that is how you can't teach kids just to become, you know, want to be number one and want to win. You need to train them to, you know, to probably have a lean tissue, something good like that, you know. But competitive sport and mass-based sport is two different things, and it's for us to enhance the physical makeup of our learners at school in such a way that they must be able to differentiate. It doesn't mean that the other schools have beautiful massive fields and good rugby fields that now we mustn't play. We can have a good chess team. You know, we can be the best baseball team. We can be the best soccer team, but we don't need to have all codes of sport. And I think what is important, we need to to tell our teachers, our schools, 
that we can all be unique in our own little way. And I think that is the beauty that we need to go out and teach. I still got a lot of slides, but I'm not going to go. I just want to skim through so that you can see how it was spoken about white privilege. Now, what white privilege means is we must know that we have a privilege over the years. If I come into a shop and a so-called, they're going to say, watch out for, for me, uh, Professor LaRue, I can't steal you. Ik praat nou nie van Yuri Roo nie. <laughs> ek praat nou van... Ek praat nou van... <laughs> ek praat nou van uh, Zelt Marie. But what I'm saying, there were two of them step in the podium. People are going to see that one is the one that probably ran away with the money. Then, engaging with racial issues. We need to talk about that. Wherever we're going to find ourselves, whether it's on the sporting field or at schools, I can't have a separate kitchen or a kitchen behind a kitchen or a group behind a group. We need to say, look guys, it's a melting pot, man. Let us have a prat and check how we can make this a better situation. <laughs> then there's different research designs that I worked out for the different questions. But transforming sport, of course, I, I wanted to talk about that, Fairus. Uh, and then, of course, the issue of, uh, you know, post-apartheid South African society at the national level exhibits a deeply rooted conviction that sport creates a sense of nationhood. But given the lack of facilities and support for poor communities, sport administrators are challenged not only by historical deprivation and inequalities, but also by the rampant professionalization and commercialization of amateur sport at community and township level. Sports clubs situated in poor township communities cannot easily compete with clubs that reap the fruits of apartheid. Clubs from privileged communities are usually well provided with facilities such as playing fields and clubhouses, which were mostly non-existent in townships created during apartheid. So what are the implications of decolonizing sport? You know, we, I'm not going to go into that politic. I just want to come to the good, the niceties. At the time when a community is in transition, the higher levels of uncertainty and chaos are perceived as threats or conflicts. But in our case, we must use it as an opportunity. And then finally, because I'm a chess player, I'm always thinking like this gentleman, the world as we have created it is a process we need to think creatively. And I think we've got the capacity as South Africans. We don't need to run to Russia or to, you know, any other country. We've got the capacity and we can utilize it to make this not only a better society, but a good example for the global world. Thank you so much. Dr. Iso, always entertaining. Um, never a dull moment when he's around. Um, yeah, you've given us a lot of food for thought there in your presentation, as short as what it was. And there's a lot of um, things, information, there's a lot of information in that presentation that can be used, Ishmael, as, as, as discussion points at, at a later stage as well. So thank you very much, sir. I know you, you, you swapped around and it was important for you to swap around your times. Um, but I've asked earlier on that we um, postpone the question and answer session to after everyone has done their presentations. And I think Mr. Valensky had a question for Professor, was it for you, sir? Um, Mr. Valensky, do you want to repeat your question? I'm sorry to do that to you now again. Um, if you don't mind. And then I think, John, you're going to repeat your question again to Debbie and, and Danielle. My, my question was around the practical suggestions in terms of um, how do we fill the void as far as not having qualified P um, PT teachers. And, and I think my question is sort of relevant to all the presenters as well, because I think um, there's a lot of theory, and I think we're intellectualizing this conversation. I think yeah. we need to get back to what are the practical suggestions, because that's what's needed. Okay. And I think also, we need, we, I don't think we need to add fuel to this flame that there are certain restrictions within our system. 
I think we should be looking at solutions and the suggestions as to what can we do when we go back to school on Tuesday. I would like to see this, this motivation for teachers to leave here and to go and implement despite the fact that they are not qualified. Thank you. Absolutely. Anybody want to attempt to answer the question? The practical solution that we can take away from here that the teachers can apply, sir? Thank you. Um, I think, first of all, uh, we need bodies. And uh, I've heard that there are people that can be trained or educated to teach um, or to be assistants for teachers. My question, and, and there are also export, elite sport uh, uh, um, players that can be utilized in this space as well. My question is just, Will there be somebody that can support those people with the um, necessary didactics or pedagogics to support the, these people to help a teacher? If I l heard to one of the ladies here behind me um, who said that um, there's not every year or every six months there's a new person in any case in physical education. So I think that is a starting point. Get people to stay in their position first of all, get people, new people in to come and assist and educate the others, um, the NGOs and whoever who would like to be part of the physical education um, team and give them the necessary education and support. Sure, Debbie. Our problem is, is that we don't have the status of other subjects. So if you're a life orientation teacher, it's anybody can teach life orientation, that includes physical education. So you've got the gap in your timetable, there we go, you're doing grade eight life orientation. And that's the major problem that we have. We've got to actually go to the top. And I mean, even our subject advisors are not trained. So they, they are not imparting the importance of what this is about. So we've got to go right at the top where we've got to change people's opinion of the importance of physical education so that the status is increased. Only then will the state be able to, the state of physical education will be able to be improved. And the way we can do it is when people start backing the subject for in-service teacher training. Sorry. Thank you, Debbie. So the emphasis of my question, John O'Connor again, was, was really on that QCDO band, and, and I did mention the funding part, but there's a more important emphasis. The emphasis is the fact that, like the lady from the Northern Cape has said earlier on, she could have done a skills program that was fully accredited if it was in the vocational band and not a full qualification at honors level. What we also find that in the, in the vocational band, essentially your modules are broken into three main streams. You have your knowledge mod modules, you have your practical modules, and you have your work experience, or work integrated learning modules, kind of. And, and that kind of says to me that why wouldn't we want to actually use the vocational band to do short course training or skills program training for physical education teachers. Number one, it allows you to build up a qualification over time and you can do skills programs that are fully accredited. Number two, there seems to be more money in that band than in the other band, otherwise you must get a bursary if you can't afford it, or the state must then pay uh, f for whenever a big program like that is. It is advanced, and that's really the question that I wanted, especially our academic colleagues, to ponder about and so on, because it seems to me that this vocational ban is a lielika stiffkant in this whole debate, and that's really, I wanted some comment from, from our colleagues about it. Thank you. Yeah, just to say to, um, just from the Western Cape Education Department in terms of what we do with, with regards to teacher training and, and some of the programs that we have. Firstly, uh, to Debbie and, and to the rest of the colleagues, within our subject advisor uh, grouping life orientation uh, in the Western Cape Education Department, 
we have six physical education specialists. Yes, you can clap, it's no problem. <laughs> you, can, you can applaud, thank you. We have six, and, and, and so those six individuals is part of the steering committee for putting this thing together. Because we wanted the expertise, we wanted them to put uh, the, the questions and, and the focus of where we're going with this particular conference. So if you listen to what I said earlier, I said when they go and visit schools, two things they look at. One is to sit in a theory class and sit in a physical education class. Because we want to see physical education being implemented. So in our province, that is what we are doing. We do have the experts. We do run programs, um, training programs for teachers. In fact, uh, just before COVID, we took our 60 teachers out of class for 10 days, two weeks, out of class, and we got 60 substitutes for those teachers while they were busy with physical education training. Gary was part of the training, and uh, Marty and, and a whole host of other professionals were part of training including our subject advisors as part of that training. We had a program with the with National Treasury um, about five years ago. We, we took 150 young people. We took them for one week of training in order for them just to assist the life orientation teacher to implement physical education. So colleagues, it's not that we're not trying. If we get a budget, we will employ in this province 3,000 physical education teachers, no issues. And we will train them and we will put them into, into each of our schools. Not necessarily as physical education specialists, but at this point in time as teacher assistants. So it's something that we are doing. And, and we are linking with uh, NGOs and, and, and corporates to try and assist us in ensuring that we provide Job opportunities, and this is job opportunity, colleagues. Whilst our HEIs are not taking our, our students to a three-year training program, we are prepared to employ young people, put them through a training program, a short course, so that they can at least assist. They're not going to have the specialist training at this point in time, but we can take them on that path. Thank you. Mark? Yeah, just something on the HIs. Look, uh, uh, I'm, I'm in the education department at Stellenbosch. Now, we used to have the sports science department. You know, the sports uh, guys, they were part of the, the, the program, but they've gone to the health sector, meaning they're part of the biokinetics, so that's a very elite type of thing, lean tissue, etc. So, what what is missing is when they made me life orientation lecturer, I even brought in this, the history of sports, and then I saw I'm doing the same that another gentleman, Cleophas, is doing in the, in the, in the sports uh, science. And I am arguing that, you know, if you want to be a teacher or, or educator, you need to do PE, or we need, uh, need to be part of our curricula. Now, what I just wanted to say, actually, is the department or the faculty, they only do what the school subscribe. If you got robotics, we'll send you a robot tomorrow. <laughs> if you want anything, so if you want a physical education teacher coming from the education department, we will, we will teach them, we will create them. So it's that type of thing. It's funny that I hear the department says they're waiting on the HEI. The HEI is waiting again for I, for you. <laughs> that, is a, that is how I, I understand it. Yeah, that's why we're here. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yes, uh, Gary. Thank you very much. I, I think there's a lack of col collaboration. That's the reason why I asked the question early on. You know, the first question was, where's the Department of Sport? Because they also have, in fact, a program that's embedded in the school as well. And there uh, seems to me a lot of this jointedness, you know, even with the uh, teacher assistants as well. The, uh, we are training. We are, we are training, but I think we're training the wrong people. So I think it's critical when, when, you know, when the Department of Sport comes here that we ask these questions. Because I know that, uh, and I'll say this, I mean, Ismail is aware, uh, very little is happening in the other areas. I travel a lot throughout the country uh, as part of my job, and there's a, lot of there's a lot of dysfunctionality. I think we must be frank and honest about it. When it comes to you know, teacher training and 
the support that teachers receive in all parts of uh, uh, the, 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 the country, it's almost non-existent. So I think the collaboration is critical and those are the things that we need to focus on going yeah. forward. Thank you very much. I think if you look at the Department of Sport, the, the DCAS, they, they, they focus, Ishma, help me if I'm correct, if I'm, if I'm incorrect, but their focus is, is after school programs. The Mod Centers is after school programs um, and not in school programs. Um, and our focus here would be in school programs and then just to share with, 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 with the delegates here, um, we started a program, a physic program, Ishmael, you know about it, Ivan knows about it, but in our district, um, we have started actually training teachers within that particular term for that particular assessment, all right? Um, I've, I have one of the presenters here and we have some delegates here who are also here. So we're opening it up. Uh, I'm going to open it up, Ivan and Ishmael, to, to, to other teachers from other districts to join us. In May sometime, we will have a term two uh, a phys ed practical session as well. Um, and, and, and yes, I'm, I'm sticking my neck out when I say I, I'm going to open it up to all teachers who would like to come and, and, and do um, that particular training session with us. We will keep you um, informed via your subject advisors as to where it will take place. All right? Um, there's a question at the back there. Um, Sorry, I do have a question, but before that, I, I just thought I'd like to try and like summarize what I've experienced so far here. It, it seems to me that when we look at this, there, there are a number of problems, and I, I agree that we can't keep rehashing the problems, we have to look at solutions. So there seems to be a problem with like having sufficiently, um, having sufficient PE trained teachers, but then there's also a problem with having people who are teaching PE not being teacher trained, and teaching in a school and having those other teacher qualities, pastoral qualities, administration qualities, the reporting qualities, um, also negatively impacts the program when the person who's facilitating that doesn't have all of that. So I agree, yes, we need that, and we need that training, both of those. In addition to that, uh, we've spoken about the problem with school support, so maybe having a timetabling problem or the lack of value, which is, is in most schools, um, if not all of them. So you become a PE teacher and you live and die in the PE department. Um, and then there's obviously a problem with the learner experience. So them not being able to get physical education. And so I would argue that the first three of those four problems are things that we are waiting for, either money or training or whatever. But perhaps we can focus on the learner experience so long. And would it not be possible in the spirit of collaboration, somebody said, to create a pool of resources where you do have PE trained teachers who can provide lesson plans for 30 minutes, one hour, whatever, where people who at least are willing to do it but don't yet have the training can follow something that's fairly easy to follow to be able to address the problem of the learners not getting PE right now. Because the other things are gonna take time, like we know that, and they require money, and they require government permission and legislation and lots of red tape. But can we not, in the meantime, address the issue with the students, with the learners themselves? Because the AXA report has come out twice and the results haven't changed. Nothing has been implemented yet. So what can we do as a community of PE teachers right now that will at least give the learners something that they benefit from? Okay, I think Ivan's got an answer there. Oh, you got answer. Oh, I've got an answer. <laughs> okay, so the one is um, we provide training for, for our teachers within the districts um, uh, as, as subject advisors, as qualified phys ed um, teachers. And, and secondly, my appeal is to principals. Um, if you don't mind, my appeal is to principals is to not to use our subject as a filler subject. And that the teachers who are, who are life orientation trained teachers actually be placed correctly on the timetable. And that we not be placed after the math or the English teacher. Because often you find that it's the English teacher who is also the life orientation teacher. And, and, and the one thing that I want to finish off with is that if you take life, if you take physical education, you take mathematics and you combine the two together, you get a powerful subject. Um, many years ago, Ilana Meyer had a program where she combined the two together, you know? Um, and so my appeal is, yes, we will have training for teachers, practical training. We are prepared to offer to teachers, even if it's a morning session, uh, a Saturday morning session where we provide you with activities to do for the term. And then my appeal to principals, 
is to make sure that we are not a filler subject. Right? Ishwan, you or Ivan want to add? Colin? I don't want to add, I, I have a question. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, the question is direct to Professor Zellers. Yeah, uh, I think uh, we will all agree that, that education uh, is the heart of what is going on in our schools. And, and when the E in PE is under attack, I think that, that it urges an urgent call from education for education. Now, in your presentation, I know that uh, uh, the YALF benefits are driving in what you have said in your presentation is very attractive to physical education uh, teachers also. But uh, I'm just afraid that we can miss the true educational potential of physical education in the curriculum by driving the YALT agenda. What is your comments on that? But I've always been a very strong advocate for the fact that physical activity is so much more than physical. Please understand that. Whether it's the emotional, the social, the cognitive, I am emphatic in emphasizing the point that we need it for holistic development. So if I did mention it, it was just because of the obesity crisis. But please understand, physical education, that's why I also say physical education is for all because too often we focus on the kids that can rather than the kids that can't and they miss out and they're the ones who need to develop all of those aspects more than your sporty kids and we can go into a whole discussion on that I could get on my platform and talk lots but I'm with you hello, hello. Is, is it my turn okay my question is on the importance of all subjects. In our school, it is overemphasized, or rightly uh, emphasized, that maths and language are very, very important. In the Western Cape, as for, for this thing, the, the systemic evaluation uh, performance, if you do well in, in maths and, and, and language, in our primary, I'm a, I'm a primary school uh, uh, principal, then the department is going to give you accolades. This lessens the importance of the other subject. As these teachers who are teaching physical science and the other subjects, they see themselves as lesser professionals than these who are doing maths and science. So my question is on this way. How can we, what can be done to level the importance of all subjects in their own right, not lessening the maths and, and language? What can we do for that? Thank you. Ishma, you want to answer that? Well, it, uh, it looks like uh, those heavy questions are thrown at me. Um, the first and foremost, we've already had a battle just to get uh, recognition for life orientation. Remember, there was a ministerial task team about four years ago that recommended that life orientation be taken out of the curriculum. So it was a battle for us just to get back in there, get to the teacher unions, get to the national department, and emphasize the importance of our subject. We've managed to do that, and I can safely say that life orientation is here to stay. Ultimately, we would like to see physical education being a standalone subject. Under the current uh, regime, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen in the next five years, uh, but we need to look at the 10-year plan in order to get it changed. And so there is a window at this point in time within the broader education movement in South Africa to change curriculum. There is a move towards changing curricula, there is a window, and we want to try and strike while this window is open around the issue of the importance of not only life orientation, but all of the other subjects. We know that the department has now looked at bringing in 13 new subjects. It was piloted last year. 
There are 30 new um, skills focused subjects that have been brought into the curriculum. It's currently only in technical high schools, but it could be going into the mainstream school uh, program. So there are changes that are taking place. It becomes our responsibility as a collective, and we have the teacher unions here uh, today and tomorrow, and one of them will be on the platform after this. We need to address it with our teacher unions as well, because they are with the principals forum, and we have members from the principals forum here as well, where we need to speak to them. Because it is the principal that will decide, as a leader of the school, who are the important subjects in your school? Who's, who are your champion teachers that you're going to be putting in there? I've seen my top life orientation teachers being moved to other subjects because they are top, they got an award for life orientation. So it becomes important as a collective that we take a responsibility. And I, I make a reference to SGBs, I make a reference to principals forums, and all of us as a collective need to recognize the importance of all of our subjects. Yes, there is an emphasis on maths and science because they, we need to build this economy. And s unfortunately, the skills requires your mathematics and your science. And so we need to take that particular process forward. Uh, Professor Travel wants to add? I can, but may I support Andre? You would have known about this economic impact in Europe. They had, it is a late study, I haven't seen the recent figures there. A study, 2014, 2015, they did a study on the uh, uh, economic impact on, cardio on diseases, these cardiovascular diseases, obesity, whatever, in Europe. What it was costing the economy. And the figure or the amount they came to was 85 billion euros that could have been reduced through physical activity. What did they do? They came up with this idea of the street sports and those musical stairs. No elevators day, one day per week. Street sports, all the companies competing to get physical activity driven to get that amount reduced. It's coming back to one thing that Debbie said. It's all about perceptions and the state and status. We must be able to tell my headmaster, if I've got a, mo a moderate fit child, he can concentrate better, he can sit up right and right, not lying down like this, writing in the class because he's got muscle toning and he can concentrate and he can perform academically better through this. Uh, it's all about communication, it's all about perceptions. We must get the SMTs and the SGBs and the parents and the headmasters and the school governing bodies to realize what are we playing with? Our country's future if we don't improve the physical activity and physical education.
Thank you very much, sir. And thank you very much to all of you for spending this time with us. I like that. I like the way you said headmaster. You said headmasters. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine, but I just like the way in which it came. So thank you very much, Mr. Vivalensky. You are the absolute last person. Thank you, Miss. Um, oh, and the okay. colleagues. Uh, again, I want to to speak about practical suggestions. Um, we speak about the presidential um, employment initiative. There are some schools that have received about 17 assistance, and and Ishmael refers to the uh, the principals forum. I used to be the chairperson of the Principals Forum for two years, and we've raised the issue with the, with the WCD, and we've asked them to, to escalate this particular issue to DBE as well. And, and I'm, going to be, I'm going to try and be as nice as possible. Um, so, so for me, DBE, and, and I want to also maybe include WCD, there's certain aspects where we lack the vision in terms of what is needed. So let me use the Presidential Youth Employment Initiative as an example. Some schools receive 17 persons that is attached to a particular school. The simple question is, we complain about a lack of teachers. The question the Principals Forum has asked, why can we not convert some of those 17 assistants to employing qualified teachers? There are mass, masses amounts of teachers that are unemployed. Why can't we say six of those 17 positions will be converted into teacher posts? We could have solved this PT problem. Um, I mean, the presidential initiative program is going to go until, I think, June now. So for the six months of 2022, if what was suggest suggested by the Principals Forum in 2021 became reality in 2022, we could have had qualified PT teachers at schools for six months already. The question is, it's a simple strategy. Why is it not being implemented? And therefore, the question is, do the people in charge have the vision as what is needed? So that's a practical suggestion. What I would like to appeal to our colleagues here, because I think, again, I want to say to Mr. Teladia, he and his team are doing excellent work. But now the challenge is for us as teachers and as principals and as unions to drive this message across to the powers that be because they are the ones that need to change the policy so that we can have the benefits on the ground. So, so colleagues, Mr. Teladia and his team, they need our voice of support. And again, I'm saying to you, colleagues, let us not over-intellectualize this conversation. It's a very simple thing. At, in our um, presidential youth initiative program, there are teach assistants that are supposed to, to provide support. Again, I would ask, so why is PT not happening? If there is a particular category that addresses sport in particular. So for me, again, there should be no excuse why not all of the 1,519 schools in the Western Cape should not be having PT. And hence, I started my conversation by asking, what is the data on the ground? But I do not believe there should be an excuse for any school not to have PT being taught. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, you know, I was listening to, to the presentation that was done by Professor Leach, and I'm actually shocked to the extent at which um, physical activity and physical education is lacking amongst the, the black child. So I just wanted to check with the professor what, what could be the reason that are attributed, attributed to that kind of lack of activity amongst the, the, the black child. Because being in the education sector, probably we need to turn that around so that all learners are, are, are actually brought to the same level. Uh, that is really my, my, my question. I also want to check, uh, I liked the program, the Kazubantu uh, project that you, you presented. I think it probably it's one avenue that we could actually use as well and, and, and say we'll use it to, to bring our, our teachers to the level that we require. What are the possibilities of, of replicating that to, to all provinces? Because I've seen it is probably only in the Eastern Cape that is where it is implemented. So those, those are actually my, my, my question. Thank you. 
Ishma, we are about ready to go to lunch. You are going to answer something. No, no, no. I'm, I don't want to answer. Uh, I think we, we're going to take that offline. That is um, Mr. Jerry Zita from TBE. So the National Department is represented. And there are a couple of questions that we're going to take offline so that we can uh, unpack that and make it part of our response at the, um, at the end of the conference tomorrow. But I think Ms. Uh, Professor Leach needs to just respond to that first question, the first part of Jerry's question. Okay. Um, very, very tough question, and there's no simple solution. You know, I think the black child is a manifestation of the broader educational problem that we face countrywide. You know, it's just that it's, it's escalated and a lot more pronounced at that level. You know, and I think for me, I can only answer it as an, from an academic point of view. It's, it provides a very fruitful avenue for research. You know, and um, how do we take this forward? So for me, what I find attractive here is, one is the needs assessment. What exactly that, you know, are the problems that need to be addressed? You know, in one of the slides I mentioned to you earlier on, you know, why does the white child benefit? One, he's got good parents. You know, two-parent household. Parents are well-educated. The parents are well-resourced. Schools are well-resourced. These kids are actively doing physical education in schools. There's a whole myriad of things. It starts with the family, you know? And so how do we translate this benefit across all kids at school, you know? And so, um, you know, um, it's for me, let's first have a conversation with all the relevant stakeholders. Even the learners as well are key, you know, um, voices in this conversation because a lot of the planning that goes into education often forgets about the learner. And so the programs are misplaced, you know, and lose focus because of the relevant stakeholders don't have a voice and take ownership of the programs as well. So I know I haven't answered your question, but I think it's something that this conference really should take on as a serious challenge. And I think we've got, you know, a collection of good minds here who can really take this, take this challenge forward. Thank you. It, it's actually not a black-white thing. Sorry, it's not a black-white thing. It's a socioeconomic status. Unfortunately, that is fairly equated in South Africa, you know, race and, and class. But, but it's really a socioeconomic status which links to the levels of education and so on. And, and that's what the research says. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues, for a good session. We, unfortunately, you, you, you've spoken into your lunchtime. So uh, please grab something and we're going to try and, and munch through that as quickly as possible. Thank you.
Welcome back, everybody. <clears throat> Thanks for being so um, on time. It's five to so. Congratulations, uh, everybody. Uh, it's my honor now. We're going to have a panel discussion, the first panel discussion of the three that we're going to have over the two days. And it's my great honor to, to introduce Mr. Umar Esso. He is currently a senior lecturer at the Department of Curriculum Studies at this University of Stellenbosch. He, I would like to say that he went the full circle. He started as a teacher, he became a HOD, and then he became a deputy principal, and then he was an acting principal. So in his 23 years of teaching, he went around. So you must check him out. He has it all. Then he holds his academic and professional qualifications. He holds a PhD, MET, BA honors, and a BA degree, which he obtained at UWC. He's been at the University of Stellenbosch for 13 years as the senior lecturer. And uh, the other groups missed out, but he's currently the vice president of chess. You see, head full of chess. And he's also an active sports journalist for Radio 786. Mr. Dr. Omar, all the best with your panel discussion. And then before, before he takes over, I would like to give it first the mic to my colleague and co-presenter, Ivan, I've got it right, the beautiful Mr. Jamil Landers, to introduce to you the panelist. Thank you. Good afternoon once more, ladies and gentlemen. Um, to my far left, we've got Mr. Gary Dolly from the South African Hockey Association. Next to him, we've got Professor Andre Travel from UWC. In the center, we've got Professor Charles Roux from University of Johannesburg. Then we've got uh, Mr. Jerry Zita representing DBE. And to my near left, we've got representing Satu, Mr. B.C. Mkonwa. All yours, Doc. Uh, thanks so much uh, for introducing them. And uh, yes, the panelists, of course, they all belong to different organizations. And we are here at the Physical Education Conference. And the question is, you know, how can we promote physical education in our schools? And the other question is this, we can't expect Mr. Ishmael Taladia to do it alone. We need to be a collective. We need to work together. And, then, and, and there's many wheels that makes the car turn. So here we have uh, the respected organizations. Mr. Hockey himself, you know, he's only representing one code. But the question we're posing to him is the question that holds for all the various codes. And then, of course, our, our own professor from UWC. And then, of course, uh, you already saw Yuri, not Yuri Ru, Professor Ru from, <laughs> from uh, Limpopo. And then uh, our respected DBE chief, of course, and then Satu. I was a founder member of Satu also those years. So, so yes, comrade, you got the right shoes on. <laughs> so having said that, we are all in the house. And uh, by, if the, by way of introduction, we haven't done justice to introducing our panelists, it is also uh, it's going to be useful if you also spend time in your deliberation just to say, you know, a bit about yourself. So well, let's start and ask, uh, you know, our federation. And we asked uh, uh, Mr. Dolly, you know, we asked the federation first, and we asked him, Gary, look, uh, we're promoting physical education, but as a federation, you know, what do you feel, what, what, what are you going to bring to the party? You know, and I'm going to ask the same question to all the panelists, so I'm not going to intervene again. It's all about what you're bringing to the party to make physical education work at schools and how are you going to assist us in doing it. It's easy to sit, you know, on the sofa and say, oh, I told you. <laughs> but now we're asking you, take us forward. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. In terms of physical education, and I think what we have done as a, a national federation, hockey in particular, and also because of my background, I've been involved with education for about 20 years, formally as an educator as well. And I think I understand a very good understanding of, let's call it the sports ecosystem. The important role, uh, you know, in my upbringing was the teacher. The teacher was critical. The teacher, in fact, was uh, involved with our clubs, etc. So taking from that, as a national federation, I think uh, it is critical for us. We've realized uh, if we want to grow the game, if we want to grow the game, specifically from a volunteer perspective, right, the, the, the corps that's available to us would be, in fact, uh, the teachers as well. So hockey, uh, most probably 99% of our operations are volunteer-based. So as part of our growth strategy, it was very, very important for us to include, right, uh, our program and to align our program with physical education. So you'll notice that even the, the language that we use in our coach accreditation is all linked to the education department as well. So when we train, right, we train within uh, the Department of Education broadly. So we'll talk about ECDs, what are the skill sets in terms of the core muscle groups within ECDs, right, when we come to the uh, foundation phase, we have a lovely program there about the fundamental movement skills, and in the intermediate phase, we talk about modified sport. And you'll notice that we've aligned, in fact, our hockey curriculum with the CAPS curriculum. And, and that for us is very, very exciting. And later on, I will demonstrate the fundamental movement skills as well as the modified games. And we believe it is a very, very cost-effective way, uh, you know, to introduce sport uh, at all levels. Modified sport, in our opinion, is the way to go. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Dolly. Um, you know, I, I, I've got one of my uh, colleagues now, but from my student days, Debbie. When I, when I started at university, uh, there was, a, for the older people, a cartoon is those little drawings, funny drawings, not the stuff that you see on TV, so the younger people won't know what I'm talking about. But there was Beetle, Bailey, and his sergeant. There are these, I don't know if people remember them. But I can remember the cartoon where, where Beetle, Bailey, was standing with the sergeant, always had problems with him with this rope that goes to the ceiling of the gym. And the sergeant said to him, I want you to climb to the top of this rope. And Beetle Bailey looked at me and said, and then what? He said, then you climb down again to you. And Beetle Bailey looked at him and said, but I'm here already. <laughs> now, now that, that sounds like you know, a funny comment, but, but this is actually our business. Why do you make people who's already here climb up this rope and come down to the same point? run five kilometers just to get to the same point. What, what purpose did you serve? I'm already here. It is what happens during that period physically and in, when you play games, what happens socially as well. So it, uh, uh, my, my perceptions of the role of a university is to give people an understanding of that. So if, if people talk to you about the significance of active lifestyle, then you can argue with them. It's not... I want to play games. I want to play games for the following reasons. If you look at, uh, and, and in our previous discussion, we, we spoke about you know, the, 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 the benefits and the context and so on. If you look at COVID at the, at the moment, the suicides in our communities because of lack of socialization. Now, sport has got a critical role to play in socializing people. You know, so, so our role as academics is to get full insight into the real benefits and values of active lifestyles and how you could use physical education to achieve those kind of objectives. Now, I've listened to lots of talks today, and I think there's a lot of conflation about terms that we use, physical activity, physical education, PT, and so on. Now, I think it's important that we do talk about physical education, and I know Colin alluded to that question earlier on. That education part, it's not called physical education for nothing. It is located within the school because it's got an educational role. Now, once again, I think, you know, as academics, we've got a, a role to play to make people understand the difference in those concepts. And then, I, I'm not going to talk too much, but if, if you talk about uh, the, the, the other critical role, role I believe universities can play is... Is, is the context in which something happens because that, that becomes a critical component of what you're actually going to do. 
And, and, and in fact, I so, so happen to have, uh, in fact, one of them is here at the moment, PhD students looking at context-specific physical education. Because what you do in different kinds of communities is going to determine what kind of success you're going to have. In, in the study that, uh, that Corbus was talking about earlier, and I was part of that, that project, uh, I went to this one community, and as I drove through the community, there were these kids dancing in the street, and this, you know, there was dust and sweat and real physical activity. And when I interviewed them, I asked them about their physical education. They say, no, we don't do physical education. I said, why? We don't like it. And I thought to myself, if you had to bring that dance program into the school somehow, these kids will chive, and whatever the dances are that they do, the physical education will work within that community if you can get your context, understand your context, and bring that into your school environment. So I, I think we've got a critical role to play. Lloyd had an interesting presentation on the status of, of people's health, children not participating. How do we deal with that? And that all, all those information comes through universities we are ideally situated. To, to gather the information, we've got the skills and so on. I'll, I'll just stop there, Chair. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think if somebody says I'm from Limpopo, I can just take it as is. Because <laughs> I'm, I always also started as a physical education teacher here in Cape Town, and then later on did all the studies needed, and then I ended up in the higher education institutions, starting off with teachers education at Durban Teachers College, and then moved to Zululand, then moved to Potchefstroom, then moved to Johannesburg. I'm currently retired, but also appointed as a senior research associate, long word, I don't know what it means, at UJ. But I'm also teaching at uh, Pretoria University in their education department for physical education teachers. So in essence, I think physical education, it was also discussed earlier, that it should be in class. I don't agree. It should be everywhere there is a teachable moment. It can be here. It can be on the sport field. I just said during lunch, I attended an athletic, um, what do you call it, participation at um, uh, a little district, and there was five different schools, six different schools, and the one school didn't know about staying in your lines when you run the 100 meters or the 50 meters, etc. So the rule for athletics will say um, you are disqualified. They d didn't disqualify them, but they didn't tell them what went wrong. So if they left there still knowing I can run wherever I want to go. It's, I don't have to stay within the lines. And if I do, I do it, there is no such rule that will disqualify me. So that is a good opportunity where we could have had um, physical education at the, on that moment. And that is what we should teach our teachers as well, to become activists for movement, to look out for teachable moments, to address the holistic um, domains, all the domains of a child. And wherever we go, wherever we are, the starting point is just in a classroom, structured physical education. But that should flow into the parents, that should flow into the participants, that should flow into the spectators, wherever, whatever is happening. Um, another thing that I think, uh, since the a teacher is very close to my heart, I think we should start thinking of how we can support them where they are at that moment. So if there, there is a university close by, I don't think, although we're doing research, we publish the stats and all we do all that, we've got some answers to some questions. But we forever looking for a place to do research and to communicate research with current data, etc. So if something happens in your community, in your school, contact the university, bring them on board, see how they can be your uh, wind be, be um, below or underneath your wings and lift you up to the next level as a teacher. Don't forget ab about them. It's not your ex, um, what you call it, lecturer. <laughs> it's a partner for life maybe to go back and ask them questions again on what do we do from now on. 
And then to the um, department and uh, especially at uh, Western Cape that have taken so many uh, good strides. What about the universities who don't offer physical education as yet? Um, especially the newer ones. I doubt if there is anything happening because I don't know. But maybe it's a set of research that we can look into. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm Jerry Zita from the Department of Basic Education. I'm in a unit that's responsible for curriculum implementation and then quality improvement. I think being in that unit um, has placed me in a first best position to be able to say I think our concerted effort will, will actually make a difference in terms of how we, we go forward in terms of implementing uh, physical education. Uh, being out there, having been to a number of schools to monitor curriculum implementation has given me at least an idea of what obtains in the schools. The disparities that are there are very much glaring. You go to the school, you go to the school, the first thing that you observe is that there are no sporting facilities like fields where, for instance, learners can actually go out and do some physical education. So what is of critical importance that we need to do to promote uh, the implementation of physical education in our schools, first and foremost, is to actually try and change the mindset of our, of our educators. Because if we are able to change the mindset of our, our educators so that they can actually see the importance of physical education and in terms of how it links to, to well-being and good health, probably they will somehow be motivated to actually implement physical education. And over and above that, as I'm saying, the, 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 the disparities are glaring when you visit the schools. So probably what is of critical importance that you, we need to do if you want to promote physical education is to make sure that we build capacity amongst our teachers to say, how best can you utilize the space that is available to you? Because that's the only space you have. And there's a, no possibilities of having to move your school to another place where you'll get all those best facilities. But the space that you have is the space that you have to utilize and make sure that you, you work with your, with your learners at school level and teach them what is of critical importance when it comes to, to physical education. And over and above that, we have spoken at length in terms of the lack of that requisite skills and knowledge amongst our teachers on how best to teach physical education. Building the capacity of our teachers and training them of how best to teach physical education is actually of critical importance. Without us uh, doing well in that area, there's no way we can, we can actually see physical education being implemented. So that will be our starting point, building the capacity of our teachers, making sure that they know the ins and outs of physical education as it is embedded in, in life orientation. So that's what we, we actually need to do. Train our teachers, make, make them aware of how best to utilize the space that is there available to, to them in our school. I think that will, will help us in a, in a big way. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you, Program Director, <coughs> and good afternoon to, to everybody. I think I must say first and foremost that we were inspired as SATU when we saw the invite as well as the thematic approach of igniting 
passion of participation in physical education. Uh, the, it inspired us a lot because we just asked our, ourselves a question. What is it that went wrong today and compared to our past in terms of physical education in schools? And uh, we, we, we made a differentiation between the physical education and sport itself. Because in our view, physical education is something that each and every child in the school have to participate in. It's not something that is only for talented learners who go and play soccer and play something like that. That's, that's part of it. But basically, each and every learner have to be involved in participating in, in physical education during school time. During school time, and uh, yeah, all of them, we, we were both that. But you also notice the fact that uh, maybe in agreeing with the department here next to me, sometimes it's very difficult to do so because you, you find the disparities that are happening within our communities where there's not even a sport field, let alone a place for physical education equipment. There is no sport field where you can take learners to go and uh, do whatever they're supposed to be doing there for physical education. And the challenge that uh, for so many years now, where I think that has been the demand that schools at least must have a field whether it's a soccer field, the rugby field, and so on, so that learners can utilize that during school hours and participate, run, and do everything. Because to us, physical education is not like you are a person who is uh, talented in this, but a person who is trained to be talented in this thing. That's one thing that we thought is very important, that I think we need to, to go back to there and make sure that school uh, have got facilities across, across, across the communities, not only some schools, but all the schools, especially those schools that are built now. I mean, it's an indictment that you build a school today and you leave, nothing, you leave no space for the, for the sport field there. Each and every school should have a sport field so that you will always be to do. But the other thing that we realized that uh, I think a mistake has happened somewhere. Because in my days, uh, maybe in your days, there was a, speci a specific uh, a course for physical education teachers. And today you don't get that. Universities, uh, I'm not sure whether they're providing that course, so that teachers that are coming out of university are able to come to school as specialized people. Because what is happening, we will not to blame each other, but the fact of the matter is, when the school is doing its allocation for teachers, LO will be an add-on to fill the timetable of that teacher. And they're not giving somebody who's a math specialist or who's a scientist, who have a passion for math and science, who must teach life orientation. And what do you expect there? Obviously, that we're not going to do that. It's not his passion. Then, therefore, you need to have people that are trained specifically for physical education so that they are passionate about doing what they are doing. And if you don't do that, we'll keep on having the meeting, the meeting after meeting, and physical education will be their school. And if there's no physical education, automatically the sport itself is failing because learners are, learners are not used in any form of thing, especially these days where learners are, are using most of the time uh, sports in phones, in tablets, and so on and so on. They don't have that passion, but if you've got a person, who have got a passion, like the teacher who said here in the morning that she's in Mich from Misha's plane and she's teaching physical education, I think that's what needs to happen in all the schools. Meaning, therefore, that there need to be a review on the curriculum and see whether the physical education can be a standalone subject, not a part of the uh, part of uh, LO. So that if you if you don't want to do it, you don't do it, you do all the other parts. What you do is that when come to come of assessment, you just take the learners outside, they jump, they jump inside the classroom and give them marks. That becomes a problem. So the point I'm making here is such that it's important that we make sure that curriculum, there's a review of curriculum and see how to make sure that physical education become part and parcel of, 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 of the curriculum. Physical education, not LO, physical education as it was before. And also the whole important, important thing of making sure that there is infrastructure in schools for physical education. You will tell principals that you don't do sport, have a program for sport and so on, but the fact of the matter, no principal can take money from norms and standards and do a playing field. That's the responsibility of the department to do so. 
the department of sport and culture and the department of education must must come together and have something to how to ensure that we make sure that schools do have facilities for lenders to participate then and then thank you thank you thank you so much uh, uh, respected uh, panelists yes you've heard uh, the first round and the views of our respected panelists you've been sitting out there i'm sure you've also internalized i hope you are really itching to say something you know to to question them cross question i can pose them a million questions but i would like uh, the questions to come from the floor and then to interact in that way so uh, if anybody got a question i'll open it up immediately so that we can have an interactive session but i also want to ask the panelists first is there any one of you that want to speak on what you've heard from your respective panelists is there any one of you that want to talk? For instance, uh, if you look at what uh, the Federation mentioned, Mr. Dolly mentions that, that a lot of the Federations, they've aligned the series of the, 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 the uh, for, uh, with caps. In other words, if you come and play hockey, it's aligned with caps. So the Hockey Federation can easily go into the school and do hockey as a part of a life orientation subject. And if you come to chess, they'll tell you they, they got the same. So the federations, they are ready to go in and assist the schools. And then if you hear what Professor has mentioned, Professor says that the university is open to encourage and to assist with a healthy lifestyle. So the schools have really made assistance in the, in the higher education institutions and Professor Ru of the University of Johannesburg, he says the same thing. And what this must also be noted, if you look at the teacher, the teachers or the, or the pre-service teachers at the university, there's a thousand of them maybe at Stellenbosch, there's even more at other universities. These students will be more than willing to come to a school and to help so that they can also get the experience and the universities can have that connection. And then, of course, DBE says, utilize the space that you have to the best of your ability. I don't know if they mean that is the parks that's in your area or further or whatever, but utilize it. Go to the swimming pool nearby and say, hello, you're part of the community. We want to, we want, you know, we're going to utilize some of the UWC swimming champs to come teach us swimming at the local swimming pool. And then, of course, as you heard what our respected Satu comrade may, uh, emphasize, that each school must have a playing field, at least. You know, we don't expect the world, but give us a basic opportunity to run on a basic field. So those are the things in essence, and I'm sure any one of you want to pose a question or Ishmael, would you want, I think it's good to start with you because you want to push these gentlemen in a certain direction. I don't know where's the woman in sport up here, Karen. But luckily I'm in the middle. <laughs> uh, Ishmael, go for it. Is there any second speaker so that I can line you up? Number one, number two, number three, or you B? You're number two, yeah, B. <laughs> right, thank you. Right. Um, my question is directed at Satu, um, and, and I think it's, it becomes important for us, first and foremost, to find out what, what our unions are doing in terms of ensuring that our teachers who are specialized remain within their subject specialization one two that our principles are all ensuring that as we the discussion that we had earlier that life orientation as with any other subject is given equal status within the schools and ensuring that our principles are not moving teachers around nilly willy really a, 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 a challenge for us. Just to our universities and, and, and the question to both uh, professors is how are we going to close this gap 
of universities moving to high performance focus and sports management focus and losing out on, and this is our observation, on training physical education teachers. Thank you. Thanks, you got nothing for the Federation, Ishmael? Okay, thanks. So, uh, can I take the second uh, speaker and then maybe we can have everything in the pot? So, good day, colleagues. Um, the field of the school, sir. I'm at a school that is two and a, a bit months old, Delft High. The school is built for 1,500 kids. The field of the school, if there's a field, the field of the school is less than a soccer pitch. A soccer pitch is 100 meters by 50 meters. The field is less than that. So how is the school that has been built five years ago cater for that, that you are saying that the school must have at least have a field? In two years' time, that field that the school has will not exist. It's a sand pit already in its second year of existence. Um, I, th I think I must stop. Uh, thank you. Did you get the question? Respected panelists, uh, just uh, by uh, um, Ishmael has posed the question and the principal has also posed the question. So, uh, are we. <laughs> Hello. My question would be for the universities. I just wanted to find out whether the university can make, uh, universities can make sure in their APS that they can make also their life orientation to be a sort of a counting subject. Because when you go to the universities, the APS doesn't count the scores of the, 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 the life orientation. They don't count on your APS as a university entry. So that is to make this subject also very important as a university entry uh, accounting, accounting uh, subject. Thank you. Sorry, just to, before we move, do you understand that question? <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, I think we're going to go for the answers now, and then we're going to get back to the respective uh, uh, lady in front. Okay, so uh, can we start with Satu? I don't know, they expect you to have the answers, and you just... Uh, uh, a union trying to make the world better, so go for it, sir. No, thank you very much. Uh, I'm asking the same question from, 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 the, from my boss here. <laughs> Why are these questions asked from me, not from him? <laughs> because we are involved in the battle of ideas with the department on all these matters. No principal has got a right uh, to, to enforce a teacher uh, to teach LO if the teacher is not specialized in that thing. But until, un until the teacher comes into the union and say that this is what is happening in my school, then that's when we intervene. But we cannot intervene. But what's the use of intervening? Because for me, a school principal who got a vision of the school is supposed to understand and know what is it that you want from the school. And then if you do so, you'll be able to utilize the best people for the best subjects. But it's not happening by the principal. But I'm saying, in terms of us, until such time that the, the member come to say that I'm being forced by the principal to do this and this, but it's not happening like that, as I'm saying. Yeah. Similar in terms of the school on the, on the fields. It's a minimum demand for SATU to have a field. It's a minimum demand. I think we all know here, I guess we're all from Cape Town. There are schools who've got hectares and hectares and hectares of land. Sometimes the, the school is here, but uh, from Claremont to wine, to, wine, to, 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 to Upper Constantia. Yeah, there's a land for one school. <laughs> Why do you find that if there's a school, as we are saying that 1,500 learners this year only, there's a small field. And in our cases, in our township community schools, learners come in each and every year. 
You've got 1,005 this year, next year you've got 1,700 and so on and so on. So that's what he's saying is it's a challenge of redressing those imbalances. And we, we, we want to check as to the people that are thinking about building school, do they think about the holistic of the school? Because if you think about building a school, I think about the school holistically. A school that's going to be like this, this and this and this and this, and then you prepare for all that. Then therefore, you can't have two hectares and then you know that you need more than that, you see. So that's a, that's a continuous campaign and demand that we're having as a union. But unfortunately, oh. it's laying on different Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I think DBE next, because if I quote uh, Jerry, he says, change the mindset of the educators, that's what you said. And then you also said, use the space that is available. I think you're in a good position to answer the question. Yeah, I, I think maybe that's, that's some discussions that we need to also take with infrastructure so that when they build the schools, we, we need to have a discussion around that in terms of what is needed at the school level. It shouldn't actually be a decision that they take on their own to say, this is the type of infrastructure that you are putting into the school that you are talking about. If we have a discussion, probably such problems will, will be dealt with before they even begin. Do you get the answer? All right, thank you for the leadership. Uh, Professor. I, I want to ask, uh, answer Mr. Taladia's question about the movement towards high performance in sports management. I, I think universities obviously need to be linked to, to real life, the economy and so on outside. And the demand for physical education teachers has gone down to, <coughs> apologies, to just about zero at one stage because they did not appoint specialists. And we, we, we consequently moved away from that model where we did not train physical education teachers at all. Uh, but interestingly enough, as we speak here, and I hope it's happening in my absence, we are submitting a new program, or it's an amended program that will accommodate physical education again. So we, we, it's, it's an interesting that we have this conference now. So we certainly are um, revisiting that position. There's, there's an interesting point, of, in my opinion. I, I, I was fortunate to visit Finland. Uh, and, and as people must probably know, to, uh, to teach in Finland, you need a master's degree minimum. You, you can't get into schools. And, and uh, the, 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 the minister, the president, or prime minister, whatever the they system they use, say that how can I pay teachers less than doctors if they taught the doctors? You know, the, the, the teachers should certainly get more than the doctors. So the salaries of teachers are significant. But they work on a principle of uh, sort of problem-based education in a sense. Mm. And, and I visited one school. So in the morning when the kids come to school, there's a hopscotch kind of thing at the door with numbers on. And there's a code on the, in the entrance of the room. So today it's one, five, seven, and nine. So when the children come in, they must hop from one to, to then on the left leg to seven. So they start the day with a physical activity. And, and you know, they make it sort of complex, come back and so forth. So it's a fun thing for the kids to do. But then they've got a, a botany lesson and they have to, to go look at leaves. The children must then go outside and go pick leaves from different plants, climb trees, they've, trees they must climb. So they combine a maths, a, 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 a biology lesson with physical activity because they must climb the trees and walk down to the end of the field. So it's, it's integrated and then they come back and then they must add the leaves. You know, you brought five uh, oak leaves and these six and four. So you add them all up, you've got a total of, I'm just saying, so they integrated also physical education somehow gets the same status as the activities because it's embedded within what they do during the entire day. It's, it's, it's not, uh, uh, and, and it's appreciated for that as well. No, Thank thanks, you. Thanks, thanks, uh, Professor Ru and then uh, Mr. Dolly. Sorry, I just want to add, I think the concern is that there is a gap between some you know, universities qualify um, sports scientists and sport managers and then they become physical education teachers and they can't teach because they haven't done methodology or whatever unless they've done a, a PGCE. There is something like that where you can do a PGCE for a year where you do just methodology. So um, we spoke about that as well. A few years back, the physical education teacher was the manager in the school. He could manage 
athletic meetings, and that's what I was looking for, swimming galas, etc. And they became actually the principals at later, later stages because there was no such thing like our lady at the, in the middle there who complained about she did the honors and there was not much physical education in there. Um, but yeah, so if things have changed since colleges closed down. When college students left, and most of us here, the older dinosaurs, um, were brought up in, phys in physical education at teachers' colleges. And we taught that it was either at physical education or at education colleges or in the departments of education at the universities of which uh, Stellenbosch was the front runner um, for a long time. But then, like in all other, other universities, um, these departments, people saw that there's nothing happening in physical education, it should be a more scientific thing, and they, they left for sports psychology, for biokinetics, for all these fancy codes. So it's only the few of us that actually stayed behind. And um, to f fill that gap, slowly but surely, and I see it now in this event, that we're moving into the faculties of education again, where the, or the teachers and the staff should be trained in physical education and the methodology thereof. It's not sport plus, it's not sport science plus, it's physical education with a methodology. Thanks. Sorry, I just want to add to the um, APS. Unfortunately, we can, uh, can't. It's more the um, decision makers at our universities, at least the dean forum or whoever, they can decide on that. But we have heard from Ismail the struggle they had to keep life orientation alive. And the universities had to, ju to jump. At one stage, we, they said, let's divide the points and give that as an APS score. And then it totally disappeared. So I think the sooner the better we can get the whole package of physical education and life orientation on a higher level, then we can start talking to the APS people again. Thanks. Uh, we're going to take the last question from the young lady in front. And then, uh, I mean, there's this itching question that says, in the past, physical education was like gymnastics only at school. There's a difference between physical education and gymnastics. You mustn't have a beam to do physical education. Um, the young lady. Uh, is there anyone else before we're going to close with the, um, the gentleman at the back and the, and the young lady? And, and, and Mr. O'Connor, by a belangrike vraag. So we're going to have that lady, I, one. Professor, you have to go to university. Do you want to go to the university? No, no, go to the university. Go to the Was it in South Africa, the world is free. What a grap. What a grap, Professor. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but good. Good. Well, for all you stood there, and then uh, uh, John O'Connor, ne? And well, he, he will not say. Okay, good. He can't say. Um, good okay. afternoon, colleagues. Kim Thompson, the life skills advisor for District Central. Um, I completed my undergrad degree at UWC, and the one thing I did uh, my majors were English and life orientation, and um, we. We, 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 we always speak about how post-university, when you are faced with the reality of being in a classroom, we always find that university actually didn't equip you properly um, for teaching because the things that are expected, especially in life orientation, I mean, if you look at life skills in grade four to seven, it has the PSW component, the life, uh, the physic, and creative arts. But the focus were mainly on PSW, so you find yourself in a classroom and then feeling that you actually weren't prepared properly. And then the second comment I want to make is that I was invited alongside one of my mentors from Neptosa, where she wanted me to um, just share some insights around CAPS um, to final year students. And I spoke to my coordinator and the concerning part was that we are in 2022 where CAPS is the basis for the curriculum, but we are speaking about recovery ATPs. But when I spoke to the person, there was no mention of recovery ATPs. 
So the question is, how well are teachers being prepared for the current events or the current um, situation that we find ourselves in, in teaching? Because you find that, yes, there's a curriculum that needs to be taught at university to equip teachers, but then when they find themselves in the reality of a classroom, they find that they're actually not fully prepared or equipped to be teaching. Oh, Thank you. you should have been a panelist. Uh, uh, did you <laughs> It can only be you want to anybody want to answer or you just say you agree. <laughs> can I just first ask a question? Sorry, it's very difficult. I, you never realize how difficult it is to hear pe people if they, their mouths are covered because lip reading is very much part of, of, of you were saying you at UWC and your majors were? And did you do sports science? No, as a, as I did a, a B.A. degree. Okay, okay, and, and you had that little bit of, of, of uh, that, that thing that... that there was no little bit of phys, of phys at nothing, all, nothing, nothing, nothing the, okay, no, nothing. If, if I can just uh, share a little bit, we, we do a very small component in, in the, in the uh, PG DIP program, but in, in my opinion, uh, and I was involved with that, it's, it's fairly meaningless. And in fact, it, it, you, you get a feeling it's plugged in there so that they can say it, it has been done. But it's, it's, I think it was a term initially with one lecture a week, it's seven lectures of, and then it changed to 14 weeks at least. So I, I don't think there's much value, but with this new degree I'm talking about, it feeds, in, feeds into a PG dip, which is specifically focusing on physical education. So there will be, as, as far as that is concerned, there will be a significant difference from our side. Who donkey? The, the, oh. I can't answer the ATP question. What is the ATP? Professor. I'm not familiar with that to answer your question. COVID, it's due to COVID, they stopped that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, sir, I, I think... Just Good to for, uh, for us, not in Dr. Com, uh, yeah, Professor Prat, uh. Just to give some answer to that. I think we shouldn't teach our students in uh, universities to teach a program. We should make them inquisitive. We should make them thinking out of the box. We should make them fighters for this um, subject in the context because I can train somebody for context A and they end up in Z then they don't know to do it. If I don't teach swimming in my uh, courses because they might say but half your students don't know the inside of a swimming pool but what if they end up at a school that has got a swimming pool? Are they going to cover it up? So I think our teachers should be able to go and see like I said this morning, what do I have? What are their needs? How can I plan for that and work out your own thing? There's no plan. It's like our curriculum, or the syllabus we had, third term, uh, um, standard five, you have to do a handstand. Did you do a handstand? Yes, tick off, off you go. And that was physical education. No, we shouldn't stay to that planned system, sorry. Thank you so much. I think uh, time has caught up with us, but John, can you question, wait, is it important? I think it's very yes. important. It's actually directed towards my comrade and colleague from Satu, Mr. Onywa. Um, you know, I come from the Eastern Cape and, uh, and uh, was a president of, of border schools that had more than 300 high schools and more than 700 primary schools at the time and was the cat it was the main catalyst for the formation of the South African Sports Congress and eventually of USASA. And uh, USASA, if people may, many people may not know why it was so successful, but it was chiefly because of his collaboration with SATU and the way that SATU supported USASA and therefore ensured that key teachers were giving their full voluntary time at the time. Uh, because SATU was actually in every conference, in every event where there was school sport, the Satu leadership was also there, showing their support to that school sport movement of the time. I want to ask the question, now that we are all, 
this is the roots of where we're going to start to revive school sport doing it as a proof of concept in the Western Cape and then taking it back to all the other provinces. And I just wanted to ask, would Satu again give us the kind of support that they gave us at the time? Thank you. Just say yes. So. <laughs> He's asking if you're going to give him support in the time of need. <laughs> Yes, only saying Satu gave the support during the time of Yusasa, and that was a, a, a mass-based school sport. So there was cohesion that time. He's asking, will you give the support again now that you are the new leadership? Yeah, everybody say, say yes. <laughs> and I think I will say no. I won't say yes. It is our interest, Satu, to be part and parcel of all the sport activities that are happening. Uh, in fact, if you check even the MOU currently, I was worried when uh, Mr. Chelatia here was representing role players. I've seen the SGPs, but I didn't see the teacher unions. And currently in the, in the MOU, teacher unions are there. And that's why we're part and parcel of the extended team, the committees of sport. And in brief, we support sports when they want us. Yeah, that's why it's happening. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I think uh, the last question there, and then you're going to take us home, Doctor. Can you take us home? I'll, I'll do that. Good. Pretoria too. <laughs> Northwest, you can climb up here. I just, I just want to remind the people the importance of what we are doing here. If you look into the charter of physical education, physical activity and sport adapted at UNESCO in 1978, adapted in 1991, it states that it is the right of everyone, all, to have access to physical education and sport. And the 91, 91 adapted one was set to quality physical education. So our government signed that charter. So it's up at that level that we are disobeying the international rules that's being laid down. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a, that's a great way to end everything. Thank you so much to the respected panelists. Of course, thank you so much, uh, Doctor. We, we have completed the session and over to our uh, respective organizers. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Taladi and company. Thank you, sir. Thank you, respective. I give like a second to <laughs> 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 That's Colleagues, uh, as usual with such interesting and insightful discussions and things we run a bit late. So without further ado, I will call on Robin Ball. And I just want to highlight something that in all of your programs, the informations of the information, sorry, of the presenters are all here. So please tonight use your cell phone and read up on all the top quality presenters we are having at this conference. So without further ado, I'll call on Robin um, to do our next presentation. Welcome and all the best for you. Good afternoon. I hope you can all see me behind my laptop. Height is not on my side. <laughs> Um, and I also just want to ask that you all feel very sorry for me this afternoon because I have the session where the Afrikaans say in is true, mag is full, or is too. So even if you do feel like dozing off, just do it with your nod head in so that I, I know you are, you are with me. So who is, is with me in agreeing that in this room sits everything we need to impact and influence the future of this nation. So I had actually written that statement when I was preparing for this because I was quite expectant of what was coming. But after the sessions today, I'm just like, wow, this really is true. So I'm excited about what's gonna come out from this, this conference. And I believe we're all here today because we know the impact of physical education on the child, on the family, on the school, on the community, and on the nation. 
So at the IOS, the Institute of Sport, we apply the ABC model to everything that we do. So just briefly to explain, A is the facts, the current situation, where we are now. So if we take this back to yesterday, I was in beautiful Pretoria. Um, B is the objectives. Where do we want to be? So A, I was sitting in Pretoria. B, I desperately wanted to be in Cape Town because the ocean is bluer than it is in Pretoria. And I heard there was a cool conference going down. So then I had to go on to see your strategies, your options. What, what are the options to get from A to B? So in my case, I could have driven, taken a bus, flown, hitchhiked, um, and then D, the final implementation. So I booked a flight, booked a car rental, made sure I had a GPS because I had these roads in Cape Town or, or something else. So let's apply this to physical education. A, the current status. Now I was actually gonna throw this out to the audience and ask a delegate to kind of give me their, their summary. But I think, and thank you, Debbie was my backup in case nobody <laughs> volunteered. But I think the other day we've had enough snippets of the status of physical education today, so I'm not gonna go on about that. Um, B, do you, uh, um, the, the objectives. Would you agree, and I know there's a lot of different opinions in this room, and I think if, if we had the time to put this together, we'd come up with a beautiful objective. But where do we want physical education to be? Every child having access to physical education at least once a week of the quality that will have a long-lasting a long impact. So can we kind of settle on that objective for the sake of this presentation? And then C, how would we get from where we are today and I think, Mr. Talati, yeah, you must um, copyright that phrase you used earlier where you said it's a forgotten space. You can keep that for your next book. But that really summed up beautifully for me where we are. How do we get from there to where we want to be? So there's a range of um, things we're going to look at, resources, advocacy, training the teachers, developing the schools. And then D, the implementation. And hopefully from here on, there'll be giant leaps in terms of uh, implementation for physical education advancement. So, oh, sorry, my... If you keep this model in mind as we continue with this, this presentation, I want to ask if anyone here has a really treasured car. Car, teachers, okay, the teachers maybe not. So any treasured car, what do you have? A nine, I'm so glad I understand that one because I could have had something that I have no clue what it is. A 1967 Beetle. Does it still run? Okay, it runs. The day is going to come when that 1967 Beetle does not run and you need to take it to a repair shop. And you know there's a good one in your community. Um, the mechanic, he's trained, he knows what he's doing. The problem is he works in an organization, in a car repair shop that is broken in the sense of um, it's poorly run. There are many gaps in the organization. So do you think that mechanic could fix your beautiful beetle as best as he could in that environment? No. Um, if you think of, of a nurse, a well-qualified, well-trained nurse, she goes to work in a clinic that is broken. Um, there's no direction from leadership, the resources are low, poor work culture. Can that nurse do her work as brilliantly as she knows she can? No. And it's exactly the same for physical education. We have to train up teachers and teacher assistants, no doubt. But the same thing is going to happen if they go into a broken environment, into a school that is not physically ready, that is not developed holistically. Because a, a skilled person cannot function in a broken environment. A skilled person cannot function in a broken institution or firm or business or clinic or garage or, or school. And fixing that is not a quick fix. It requires holistic development of an organization as a whole. So are you with me in that, that concept? Because if you're not, it's going to be a long session except the clock is ticking, I am watching the clock. 
Okay, so the first problem with this situation is that advanced, net, advanced frameworks and standards exist for people development, but very few frameworks and standards exist for whole organization development. So my background is in biokinetics, and when I think of people development, I think, unfortunately, of physical people development, and the BMI chart comes to mind. So how many of you dread that BMI chart? Mm, that poor bodybuilder <laughs> stands no chance against the BMI chart. And all the blank faces here have very clearly been spared the trauma of meeting the BMI chart. But on a serious note, we, we need look no further than the National Qualifications Framework. That is a single, integrated national framework for learning development, for learning achievement. In other words, the development of people. This framework supports the design and implementation of qualifications, facilitates evaluation criteria for compara comparability, and ensures transparency across qualification design and assessment. And I'm going to read that sentence one more time because it's a mouthful. This framework supports the design and implementation of qualifications, facilitates evaluation criteria for comparability, and ensures transparency across qualification design and assessment. And in thinking about the gap that exists in the framework for organizational development, we started asking ourselves, what would a good phys ed promoting school or a phys ed ready school, what would it look like? So UNESCO defines good quality physical education as this, planned, progressive, inclusive learning experience that forms part of the curriculum. Moreover, the learning experience should be appropriate in terms of development to ensure that children receive lessons that are inclusive and appropriate for their capabilities, cognitive understanding, and cultural context, as well as foster positive attitudes that can lead to a more successful and enjoyable physically active life. <laughs> There's a lot of meat in there. If you just take out some of those keywords, planned, progressive, inclusive, I mean, that sentence at the end is, is really the cherry on the top for me. It fosters positive attitudes that can lead to a more successful and enjoyable physically active life. Wow, how many of our schools have that right? So with this picture in mind, a good phys ed ready school might look something like the following. Participation. First and foremost, learners must be physically participating and engaged in physical activity. E -phys -ed, technology, we're in the fourth industrial revolution and how many schools still sit without access to technology and all the benefits that technology brings? Management, school management should actively support physical education and that should filter down the structures Curriculum must be managed, strong relationships with the district officials fostered. Administration and finance, administration of rosters, records, reports, um, together with securing and managing funds that will benefit physical education. Resources, our instructors of physical education need resources, from physical equipment to information resources, and all those resources need to be cared for. And then lastly, capacitation, upskilling the people within the system, the teachers, assistants, the allo department, um, and in management. So with all of that in mind, surely, if we go back to this um, definition from, from UNESCO, we can actually achieve, we can achieve what is on here. So the IOS worked really hard, you can see clickers confuse me. The IOS worked really hard um, on this first issue of a framework for the development of the school as a whole organization. But then we found our second issue. How do we apply this standard? So how does a school 
practically use this framework. And this culminated in the design of an application toolkit that guides the application of standards. So someone has a joke, um, when I got married, they bought me a cooking book as a wedding gift. The book was titled, I'm gonna try to say this, <laughs> Kook met Blatt Young. So um, this was a joke for two reasons. Firstly, I was marrying into the surname Ball. I was a schnauz, so I don't know what's worse. But I was about to become Mrs. Ball. I'm glad you laughed because unfortunately I, I totally missed the joke because I had no clue what the word blood young meant. So the second reason that that was a joke is because of all the things I was famous for cooking or was not one of them. And 16 years later, I still cannot cook. But that cooking book was meant to be a guide for me to achieve the recipe. It was meant to, to direct me to achieve the impossible. <laughs> an application guide. 16 years later, I'm still nowhere in the kitchen. <laughs> so we have the recipe, the framework, we have the cooking book, guidebook, the, the application part of it. Um, back to PhysEd, we, we have a chart, an index chart now as the framework, and we have designed the application toolkit. But again, we found another gap. How to drive adoption and adherence to this development solution? How do we actually have oversight of this from beginning to end? How can we control its implementation? How can we be sure that we are achieving the desired output and outcome and impact? And these questions led to a holistic solution approach um, and we created a quality assurance system based on a logic framework that we called the QMI Smart Pathway. I think that Smart Pathway might have benefited me in the kitchen at the time. Um, so we've got the framework, we've got the application toolkit, and now we have the pathway for a quality-driven implementation. So today I have the privilege of very briefly introducing you to PhysEd Smart. Um, PhysEd Smart benefits the recipient, the learner, um, benefits the end user, the, the teacher, teacher assistants, allo departments, benefits district office, provincial office, school communities, societies, partners and collaborators. And just to highlight a few of the key benefits um, that are up on the, the screen, we have, we have a way to measure now, we have a way to track, we have real-time um, data, real-time reporting, impact reporting. We have a comprehensive database. It's a turnkey solution. It's ready to go. My eyesight's failing me. Um, there's a marketplace, a market community that comes into play, opportunities for investment, and it contributes to the LTPD framework as well as the vision of a healthy and, and active nation. So PhysEd Smart is part of a, a range of products at the Institute of Sport known as Smart IQ. And these, these products and services of the Smart, Smart IQ range are designed to capacitate and develop organizations alongside the development of people. But these products focus on, on developing the organization as a whole. In this instance, it would be the school. And just to mention, one of our well-known products is Club Smart, which is for the development of, of sport clubs. So Visit Smart, another product in the Smart IQ range, um, and on behalf of the Institute of Sport, we are so excited and so ready, together with the Western, Western Cape Education Department, to really co-improve and co-create this product to be the best version so that we can go and transform the landscape of physical education certainly in the Western Cape, but hopefully, hopefully beyond. Phys Smart is about moving schools through cycles and therefore ongoing transformation and development in the context of a Phys Ed ready school. So as we speak about developing the school, um, we're not going out there just to develop schools for the sake of developing schools. It's in the context 
of developing a phys ed ready or a phys ed promoting school. The outcome of, of Phys Ed Smart, simply put, is a ready, willing, and able school. And this refers to a school that has the right capacity, the right skills, the right attitudes, the right um, abilities and readiness to, de to, de to deliver quality physical education. And what sets us apart really is the fact that it's based on standards. Um, and so alongside the toolkit, we have the system that is generating standards, and this becomes a holistic intervention to delivering physical education in schools. So at the core, I think maybe you've picked this up by now, the trend here at the core of Phys Ed Smart is standards. And as soon as we have standards in place, all of a sudden, this allows for change management. This allows for constant milestone measurement, for performance evaluation, for reflection, and for measured intervention. So at a bird's eye view of our product, in the center you will see a little block called QMI, which is Quality Measurement Index. And th that's really how you measure the quality of an intervention. And this entire solution is built upon Quality Measurement Index. On the left-hand side, you'll see the, the main part of the product, which is the toolkit, and it's divided into its three sections, and we'll have a look at them um, briefly in a, in a moment. But it's basically your index chart, it's the application toolkit, and it's the tools and resources. On the right-hand side, you'll see the different services that accompany the product, and this is really where things start getting exciting because we look at things like in-field mentoring, going into the schools and actually holding their hands as we help them to develop. We look at an auditing and grading system that actually verifies their improvement and then um, statuses and certifications. And at the bottom, you'll see this entire process is really supported by a baseline technology um, that just helps manage the entire process, but also increases the reach and the impact of such a solution. So zooming in on the products on the left, we will take a quick look at the toolkit. So firstly, the QMI index chart is built around those six performance indicators that we, we looked at a little bit earlier. And these are really the yardstick to measuring. Um, this chart is commonly known as PE mark now. And this really helps us to measure and track school achievements. And more importantly, to set intervention plans to help schools be successful. The chart is designed on a four-tier classification system um, with each level having its own set of criteria and its own definition. And then um, each performance index is further broken down into what we call the three Ps. People and structures, processes and systems, practices and activities. So for each um, indicator, for each performance indicator, at a specific level, either a green, bronze, silver, or gold, we ask what people are needed uh, to be a, a well-managed school at a silver level. What people are needed for that, and what structures should they fall into? Processes and systems. What processes are, are required for a school to be a, a well-performing school within participation, and what systems are needed to manage that? And then lastly, there should be practices and activities evident when a school is getting it right. What practices and activities should be evident for a school to show that it is well capacitated at a gold level? This chart really is summed up by, by this quote from Peter Drucker who, who once said, what gets managed, what gets measured, gets managed, gets improved. So a quick look at the application toolkit that, that is really a handbook that guides how do you reach those standards? Because it's one thing to have the recipe. I couldn't reach those recipes. It's one thing to have this amazing um, standard that is defined in a chart, but how do you actually attain what is laid out on that chart? And this is a handbook that is built on those six sections of, of PE mark, and it really guides the school in how to attain those, those standards. And then thirdly, the, tool, the toolkit is accompanied by tools and resources, a resource repository that are downloadable, easy to use. The school can customize it to meet their own needs. Um, it comes with 
lesson plans that are um, aligned with CAPS. And this is really just such a help for the schools to actually have the tools required to achieve the standards. So just a quick look at the, the smart pathway that, that shows the quality assurance system in the actual implementation of such a toolkit. Our pathway includes five stations, and it's important to, to know upfront that each station has its own, what we call, practitioner that manages each station. And these practitioners are equipped with their own set of tools and their own quality assurance instruments to make sure that the service they are delivering is of the required standard. So firstly, we have Club Smart profiling, we have toolkit user training, preparing for the audit and in-field mentoring. Fourth station is auditing and grading, and lastly, certification, and we'll, we'll just briefly run through what those are. So the first station profiling consists of two things. Firstly, it consists of registration, so schools would register for the, club, uh, for the Phys Ed Smart program, and this really involves um, comprehensive information from the schools. So already, if you do nothing else past this point, we've already got a, a good aerial picture of the schools, districts, provinces, on important information. The second part of this first station is the baseline profiler, which is a self-assessment that the school does based on all the criteria found in the PE mark chart. And this allows us to see where the school is already sitting, where is the best entry point for them into such a program, and most importantly, it shows the impact of the solution, where we can see up front the school was maybe 50% green, and at the end of the intervention, they've achieved the 100% green um, status. And there we can show real impact. So after they've completed that step, they will go on to the toolkit training. And this is really where the schools are equipped and trained to understand how do you use such a toolkit? How do you implement it in your school? How do you drive the standards that are defined as a part of this program so that they can go back to their schools and actually achieve um, success within this? And the beauty is that, that with the, the baseline technology and the, IO, the Institute of Sports online learning platforms, training can be accessed from anywhere in the country now. The, the third station, after we have trained specific people from the school to use the toolkit, they go back to the schools um, and they, they share how to implement this. The third station is really the exciting one for me. This is where schools get an opportunity not only to prepare for a possible audit, but this is where they actually get to start implementing the toolkit and practicing and, and working with the resources and starting to achieve the different standards. And this is where improvement takes place within the school as an organization. Um, together with this, we, we give the school a management journal, which is really an ordered file that helps them to, to start to keep record of all of the criteria that they are meeting. They can put the evidence in that file. And that file also serves for many, many other useful um, reasons that I won't, I won't go into that now. But that's a file that they get together with an infield mentor who is assigned to the school, and really they just hold their hand as the school works towards achievements. They, they help identify gaps and help, help put interventions into place to help the, the schools to be successful. So the highlight of the Phys Ed Smart Program might be considered the auditing and grading system that really provides a pathway for intervention, for feedback, guidance on closing gaps, and it helps to ensure that schools have a definite plan to develop. This is where, where schools can submit the, the evidence of their criteria online or, or via the, the management journal file. And this is where the improvements are actually measured and verified. And from there, schools will, will receive um, statements of results, grading, and the certification, which is based on the, the four-tier classification system. So they will either be graded as a green status school, a bronze status school, a silver status school, or a gold status school. And the beauty of, of the work that we've been putting into this in the last few years is that this 
entire system, uh, including the auditing, is now fully available online. So just to close, I will briefly um, just mention the, the baseline technology, which is really an incredible piece of technology that integrates with key technology systems. So in our case, the, the, the leading one is the, the technology that manages this entire process and manages the data and the information from the schools. And then it integrates with the online learning platform so that every teacher has access to this from anywhere in the world. And then um, the third one that we're very excited about at the moment is it integrates with a sport league management and player registration system. And in this case, um, we're working towards having a school leagues, similar system for the school leagues available soon. So in conclusion, I just wanna leave you with one, one thought that I hope you will take out of this entire conference. But just consider for yourself the art of the impossible when we have relevant data about agreed standards and measurements at your fingertips. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Ball. Um, just an announcement, colleagues. The bathroom is actually at the back and to your right. Um, through here are the guys that do the sound and the tech. So if you are using the bathroom, please just go to the back. To continue the trend of ICT in physical education, um, please allow me to bring up on stage the next presenters. Mr. Blake Dismore and Mr. Riley Eager. They are the co-founders of the PAL program. Good, good day, everybody. Good day, everyone. Um, I'd just uh, like to start by thanking you all for your time, your energy, and giving us the opportunity to stand here and speak to you today. And it's a great honor to share the stage with everybody that has spoken previously and will be speaking tomorrow. My name is Blake Dismore. I'm a strength and conditioning coach up in Joburg. I have a strength and conditioning gym as well. And uh, I'm a co-founder of the PAL program app. My name is Riley Eager. I'm a qualified chartered accountant. I'm also a co-founder of the Poll Program app. I just want to see what's happening quickly with us. Sorry. All right, just to start in the meantime while we wait for that. So the PAL program is a data capturing, reporting, and lesson planning tool designed specifically for schools to boost the power of the life orientation program. I'm gonna be talking today on the current state and history of physical education, give you some more stats, which we've heard earlier. Um, the physical education teacher, creating an assessment culture in the school, as well as on normative data. Riley will be speaking on an easy to use and practical solution with showing a demonstration on assessments, lesson planning and workouts, as well as reporting. All right. Okay. 
All right, we'll skip the video for now. If we take a look back, what we're looking at here is a global study of obesity done between 1963 and 2008 on all ages and genders. What we can take from this is that there was a drastic increase across all ages and genders over the last 40 years. We understand that these trends tend to lead towards other health complications later down the line. According to the WHO, childhood, childhood obesity is one of the greatest challenges of the 21st century. Obese children are likely to be obese in elder adulthood and more likely to develop health issues at a younger age. Also, that obesity and related diseases are preventable, making this a, a high priority in order to address which affects society down the line in other ways. In South Africa, 14.2%, which is about one in seven, school children are already obese. And there is a trend that 30% of girls in ur urban areas are, are obese as well at the young age. If this continues, 3.9 million children will be overweight by the, age, by the year 2025. The real question is, how do these factors affect academics, physical literacy, development, and the future of these students? If we look at between the ages of 5 and 17 years old, in an ideal world, students should, be, should do at least 60 minutes of vigorous activity daily. This should include activities to strengthen muscles, stabilize joints, and increase bone density. Globally, 81% of adolescents between the ages of 11 and 17 were insufficiently active in the year of 2010. To touch on the physical education teacher, or also the person in the trenches, they are on the front line for participation and creating a physically literate student. Educating students to be self-aware. What I mean by this is being aware and on how to make healthy life choices. Also, understanding that sometimes our emotions don't align with our needs, but being mentally tough in order to create consistency. And this helps in the alignment of goal setting as well. They should expose children to functional movement, knowledge of basic movement patterns, how to identify incorrect exercise techniques, and give guidance on how to fix that. They should expose students to a range of mo modalities and time domains while exercising. They should create an environment where students graduate from school not in Olympic shape, but in the best healthy state possible and competent across all basic movement patterns. To cr talk about creating the assessment culture within the school. The culture should be focused on having a max participation on assessment days. Assessment days should be hyped up prior to the day arriving weeks before as an opportunity not only for the individual to get better but the school as a group. This allows to tailor phys ed programs to address areas of concern by identifying changes from generation to generation. It's not a case of it's me versus you in terms of gathering results. It should be a, a culture of it's me versus my last set of scores. And the fact that I encourage you to do better than your previous set of scores. That way we're working towards a common goal. And then the phys ed staff should try and collect as accurate test scores as possible. There's a saying, there's no bad score, but only a bad test. And lastly on this subject, correct assessment culture can help identify students with hidden talents that maybe aren't participating in a certain sport and give the school and the teachers an opportunity to encourage them to participate in those sports. So for instance, if you find a child who's really good on a cardiovascular out, um, side of things, maybe cross country or something, you can push them towards those sorts of sports. And if we talk on norm, normative data, unfortunately, norms are not widely available to phys ed staff themselves. The most comprehensive norms across the world for all ages and genders come from the USA, Canada, and Australia. And South Africa, unfortunately, has not had a widespread data capturing culture over the past couple of years. By referencing to overseas standards, though, we do lose the accuracy that is specific to the South African environment when testing. So for instance, a child that might be in a cold country versus one that is based in a warm 
setting. There could be differences between those looking at the norms and the scores versus each other. And what we've built is a practical solution for phys ed teachers on the ground to use with ease. And I invite Riley to take you through for that. So thank you for your time. The Physically Awakened Lifestyle Program, or PUL program for short, is a mobile application uh, that Blake and I have developed and launched in 2018. Uh, the uh, idea was born out of a conversation that we had. Blake uh, was a PE teacher many years ago. And during one of our conversations, we got talking about physical education and decided that we would have a go at trying to address some of the issues that he had experienced as a teacher. So our first goal was to harness the power of technology, uh, bring physical education into the 21st century. Um, the, the next item that we identified that we needed to address is physical performance analysis, driving training. So human beings are not all the same. We have different strengths and weaknesses. So when developing a child's physical competence, we should look at being specific to their needs. And flowing from that, the app is designed to create personalized workout programs for individual learners as well as groups of learners, be it in a PE uh, setting or a sports team setting. Uh, one of the offshoots of the app is the establishment of South African norms. If we can test a large enough population we'll be able to gather enough data to establish uh, norms specific to South Africa. In terms of the app, we do have a onboarding process with guidance for both students and um, teachers. This would include how to use the app, how to perform assessments. We also have assessors that are available on request. So if a school requires assistance with doing an assessment, uh, we do have feet on the ground that we can deploy. So for grades one to three, we have a skill and movement preparation program. Uh, this is not built into the mobile application at the moment. Uh, it's just a, a, standard a standard set of tests um, and workouts to develop uh, youngsters in schools, grades one to three. And this is where all the fun stuff starts. So the process for the app starts with the onboarding. And this has been a stumbling block for us in the last few years. In order for a school to use the application, we require certain information about the learners to load into the app's database. This information includes grade, class, learner name, a unique ID, so a student number, ID number, and then two key other inputs are their date of birth and their sex, being male or female, and those two inputs are key for the assessment side of the app where we use international norms as a reference point uh, to determine the competence of a learner. Once a school has been onboarded, uh, they'll proceed to do their first assessment and after an assessment has been completed, you have two outputs, one is a report which is instantly available to both the learner, their parents, and the teachers. And the second output from the assessment is a workout, which is personalized to the individual needs of the learner or the PE class or sports team. If we unpack the assessments a little more, 
Um, we've des designed the program to have six weekly assessments. Uh, this allows the app to refine the workouts that are customized for the learners. Every six weeks we get updated information on the learner's progress. The app's algorithms are then able to refine the training programs for that individual learner. Uh, staff and teachers would usually perform the assessments. However, as mentioned earlier, um, we do have uh, in-house assessors that are able to assist schools with performing assessments. And like Blake mentioned, accuracy here is key. Uh, if a test isn't performed correctly, a result isn't captured correctly, uh, the learner's not going to get the correct workout program, may receive training that is at a level too advanced for them. And then also for the establishment of South African norms, our data capture needs to be as accurate as possible. So when an assessment is submitted on the app, uh, instantly a teacher can pull a report card for that learner for that class. The learner has access to that report card on the mobile application as well as the parents and the workouts are also instantly available. We have another video here. I'm not sure if it'll play. Okay, there we go. So this is a video of the application. A roll call is being performed, so this is the starting point for any assessment. We need to know which learners are present. If any learners are absent, sick, or unable to participate, a reason is supplied. And we then go into the tests. So the tests are, are split into what we call seven aspects, agility, hand-eye coordination, cardio, power, strength, etc. The tests that we've selected in each of these categories are based on the availability of normative data. As I mentioned, we use the norms as a reference point to determine the competence of a learner. And what you won't see on screen is the ability to take body composition measurements. Um, so that would be your waist circumference, bicep, your height and weight, fat percentage, etc. Uh, th that information is only available to the learner. Teachers do not have access to that information. And it's also supplementary information. It has no impact on the app's algorithms. Um, so the customized workouts are based solely on uh, the seven aspects uh, test data. So there's a summary of the tests currently available on the app. Um, we would like to expand this list. Uh, it's, like I mentioned, difficult to, to source uh, norms for some tests. Uh, these ones, we've got norms uh, from the US, Canada, Australia. Large samples were used in arriving at those norms. They are necessarily representative of South Africa, but it is a good starting point for us to work from. So as I mentioned, once an assessment is complete, uh, we then go into reporting, and reporting is split into two different uh, users. The first user who has access to reporting is a learner. They only have access to their test results, be it body composition or the, the seven aspects tests. And a school or teacher, they would have access to the test results, not the body composition results. And a teacher has access to all learners within a class, grade, um, or school. Again, summarized on the slide. Um, the school also has the ability to export to PDFs, so if they want to send out a report card with the term report, they can export that to a PDF, print it out, send it via email. Okay, and this is an example of the teacher profile. Uh, you can have a look at the reporting screen. 
So you choose your, your year, you then have the ability to look at a specific learner, you can compare multiple assessments performed by that learner, you can compare one learner to another, you can compare a learner to the class or the grade, you can also compare classes and grades. Uh, this can be useful in a sports setting uh, where you could you know, if you've got two players competing for a specific position, you could use this data to see, you know, who is ahead in terms of their physical competence. Next up is the workout. So, I guess this is where all the complexity in the application lies. Once an assessment's performed, we, we then get a score out of 10 for each of the aspects. Um, those scores out of 10 are based on the international norms, so it's not to say if you got 9 out of 10, you know, you got an A, or you know, 0 0.5 out of 10, you failed. It is a representation of where you are on a statistical bell curve, so a, a distribution um, of a large population. And we like to look at it as 50th percentile means you are competent. Anything above highly competent, anything below um, incompetent or lacking competence. And on that basis, the app then will create a personalized program to address your areas of weakness. So a learner will get a program that they can do at home. Um, it's a six-week program, three to four sessions a week. And the workouts are 20, oh, sorry, 15 to 20 minutes per workout. And there are two workouts to perform per day. Your PE class has one session per week for the six weeks. And what's interesting with the, the school side of the workout is a teacher or a coach would perform a roll call before the workout. The app will then see which learners are present and based on the needs of the group will create a custom workout specific to the needs of the users being trained. And again, if you apply this to a sports setting, if you split your rugby team in two, for example, forwards and backs, those are, are two very different uh, physical athletes, both with their own sets of strengths and weaknesses, and the app will be able to then create a workout to address the weaknesses in both the forwards and the backs. And we have another video here of the coach profile showing you an illustration of the workout screen. So again, you would have done your roll call, select the class that is being trained. At the top of the screen, you've got a Tabata timer, which allows you to set um, different intervals, different lengths of time, different number of sets. And then the workouts display on the screen in white text. And just to note that all exercises included in the, the workouts um, are included in an exercise database, which we'll get to at the end. And that's a, a comprehensive explanation on how to perform the particular movement, as well as a YouTube video illustrating how the movement is performed. This is the exercise database video. You can either cycle through the exercises at the bottom. There is a search bar as well. You can search for a particular exercise. If you search for push-up, it will give you variations of a push-up. And then you can see a video is available. In closing, 
Um, we, we are a, a young tech startup, uh, launched only a few years ago. Uh, we've laid the foundation or the framework, um, and yeah, there, there's only up from here. We are open and happy to collaborate with government, universities, and any other organizations looking to uplift schools in the physical education space. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you, colleagues. While we just looking at that video, I th it's in important to note that um, we have, in fact, um, tested on a group of um, our teacher assistants um, just to see exactly I needed to understand how the app works practically. And so what you're seeing there are the examples of what can be done. And so we implemented that with, um, with the teacher assistants uh, to get the data from um, from the app, and I can tell you the app works extremely well, and, and it's definitely a, a benefit to our teachers. Um, we're still in negotiations with Powell to ensure that we make it available to all of our schools, all of our teachers, um, so that people can begin to utilize this in terms of the assessment that they will do at schools. We also need to establish norms for South African learners as opposed to using international uh, benchmarks, we need to establish um, our own local benchmarks. So it's work in progress, but it's something that uh, we are still engaging with um, both Blake and his partner. Thank you, gentlemen. We will engage further. Colin, where's Colin? Colin gone. 
I just wanted to tell these guys I love the collaboration between a chartered accountant, a chartered accountant, and a physical education teacher. Isn't that lovely? Yes. <laughs> Colleagues, the last, we've come to the end, and the honor is on, is for our last presenter, Mr. Gary Dolly. And he said, the only thing I need to say is that he's the director of development for South African hockey. And he said, you must get you ready. You're all going to be with him on the stage. Thank you, Mr. Dolly. All the best. Yeah, I, th I think that we need to liven up. I thought, in fact, I was at a, in a funeral, in fact. So let's liven it up again. This is the graveyard shift. OK. And I'm not going to be long. So what I'm going to try to do, in fact, is to put everything that we heard today into practice. And just some comments again. I think sometimes there's so many challenges or excuses, and you'll notice that where we come from, I mean, we can have a fantastic workout right here in your class. Uh, so let's see, I'll show you guys again. I would have loved to do this program in the street, in fact. Okay, so this is our modified program. Uh, and by the way, this is the curriculum. People talk about fundamental movement skills. That is what I need to talk to you about. So I'm gonna show you how to apply the fundamental movement skills within a hockey context. Uh, it is part of the curriculum, right? We talk about preschoolers, four, five-year-old. I'll show you exactly what we've developed in terms of very simple stuff. So don't tell me we don't have ordinary noodle. You can see that. So there we go. For your preschoolers, preschoolers, the... Here we go. Very, very simple. I don't have a balloon here, but let's see if it's going to work. But you can see this is the idea. We talk about fundamental movement skills within the preschoolers, right? The whole question of fighting, manipulation. And you can see again, most of the hockey players or people in the middle are right hand dominant. Hockey, in fact, is left hand dominant. So this whole question of having a bit of a lot of my colleagues here as practitioners are so practitioners. You can see again, when we talk about, you know, this whole question of fighting the ball, you don't need. Right, so you can see very, very simple. So it's modification, and we always talk about, you know, we don't have. So modification is critical in terms of to deliver quality programs within our quantile one, two, and three schools as well, right? But it is also relevant, in fact, at all schools, because the fundamental movement skills are the same. So very, very simple. This is what hockey has done to address the shortage of equipment within the quantile one, two, and three schools. Very, very simple, preschool. Right, so let's get to uh, so, some opening comments in terms of our program, because people talk about the holistic development of the child. So this is what the program is all about, okay? And as I said, it is aligned with the physical education curriculum. So when we talk about the grade Rs, one, two, and three, we'll talk about the fundamental movement skills, and I'll demonstrate that to you very, very, very soon, okay? Secondly, we talk about age-appropriate participation. So we have got that. We've infused this in our coach education. It is also part of our growth strategy. So the same challenges for the last, most probably, I've been involved with SA Hockey for the last 15 years. We've made very, very, very little impact in the Quantel 1, 2, and 3 schools. The other program in terms of the well-resourced schools is going great guns. But in terms of the Quantel 1, 2, and 3, and that equates to about 20,000 schools. And that is the situation, in fact, at all of the federations. Don't be fooled by cricket and by rugby. That's played by most probably 2,000 schools. So your talent pool, the talent pool, there's huge opportunity within the Quantel 1, 2, and 3. And that's the reason why we've gone back and we've focusing on the teacher. We don't have the resources. In fact, 
we only have four people in our national office. So this program, we've turned this program out in 500 schools, right? 40 districts throughout the country. 40 districts throughout the country. It cost us to run this program, <laughs> one million rand. It is not a lot of money. It's not a lot of money. Because, and Isman will tell you, uh, we're on a group, I think we're about 150, on a modified hockey group. It's like a movement. Throughout the country, I can tell you now, uh, in the Western Cape, what we've done uh, in certain areas. Uh, Wisdom Pond, we Athlone, Thay Hiskral. Have a look at the program. So this is the fundamental movement skill. So when we talk about locomotion, we talk about locomotion, we talk about movement. You talk about object manipulation. Oh, hockey stick is an object. And you talk about balance, stability skills. Your stance is critical. So do you need money for that? No. The only balance we know when it comes to the curriculum, and I've seen a lot of the presentations, this is the balance and it's seven. Even at your well-resourced schools as well, because there's a disjoint. At your well-resourced schools, it's all about participation, sports participation. And the, there's no link between the educational value of physical education, the holistic development of the child, sensory motor skills, social skills, right? Good morning, good afternoon, all embedded in the curriculum, manners. And then only we talk about the cognitive skills. So we are worried about the roof, but the foundation, in fact, is not very, very solid, right? So let's have a look at it. Right, so we can, in fact, start, and you can see we can do this anywhere. We don't need a lot of equipment. Uh, can I have a stick there quickly? Stick is modified. So we'll start with locomotion. Just Denzel, let's keep this here. You don't need any bibs. In this case now, we're going to play the green sticks, we'll play against the yellow sticks. It's as simple as that. And we also have different color codes as well. Right? And we play modified, 5v5. You don't need an artificial surface. You don't need, in fact, a grass field. You can play this in your classroom. So you'll see, in fact, we'll be able to play here now. You can see this now. Very, very, very simple. So there's different, in fact, our activation is gonna cost you 1,800 Rand, and then you can play modified hockey as part of physical education. And by the way, term two, term two, grade three, invasion games, that's hockey. It's there, in the curriculum. Intermediate phase, modified games, it is in the curriculum. So I'm talking curriculum. It's just that the education department needs to use the hockey stick or the cricket bat now as a teaching resource as well as the skipping rope, as well as the cricket bat. Okay, so let's get into it. Okay, guys, um, I'm here uh, because I'm helping out, but I can tell you that, in fact, I'm using this exact program in outreach projects with, within disadvantaged communities as well as affluent schools as well in numerous schools. Um, in fact, our coaches are busy right now doing one of those programs down in Redham. Um, so I'm very impressed with the product. That's why I'm here to support. Right, first one, locomotion. Listen very carefully to the terminology as well. That's movement. Moving with the ball. Moving with the ball. That's called dribbling. Simple. So that is locomotion. So we're going to move with the ball. Second one. Right? That's moving with the ball. Then, moving the ball. Moving the ball. In football, it's called passing. So if you pass, the other person must receive. So you're receiving the ball. You're trapping the ball. And then, getting the ball. John, it's called tackling. So we simplified it. Right? Using the fundamental movement skills of locomotion, Object manipulation and balance. I need to stance. Yeah. 
stance. Good stance, that's balance. Critical in terms of all the sporting codes. And I'll show you now the stance, the hockey stance. Very, very simple, right? Got it? So we're gonna just get moving. Let's gonna get moving. It's very difficult to do this, Denzel. Okay. Station one. Station one. Go with the ball. Carry it. Go with the ball. Right? Correct body position. Correct footwork. And my formulation. I can give sustained feedback in terms of Thank you. 
whole body and stimulate, in fact, the right brain and vice versa. So have a look at this. You can see. So immediately now, we're setting this up. Ordinary, lovely, good system, single relay, ideal for assessment. Ideal for assessment. So you can see this is now station three. So I've got five, five, I've got 15 kids already, right, in a hockey station that involves. I've got the five doing the rolling. I've got another five here doing, in fact, the throwing. I've got this, another five. I've got 15 kids. I haven't used any equipment that's cost me. But we don't have. Don't give me that. Oh, I must say. So here we go. Here we go, left one. Right hand, further down. Can you see that now? Look at the body position. Here we go, ready. Here we go. Is the pass. Look at the body position immediately now. Now I can do the assessment. I can stand here now and I can do the assessment. I can give proper assessment in terms of right, what is the body, head, shoulders, knees, and toes, as well as the stick. Proper assessment. Stick is in contact with the ring. The angle between the stick and the floor is 45 degrees. Wow. The ring is in front of the body. Why? Good vision. That's what they so there we go. Ready? Ready? Station. We don't see that. I do a lot of physical education as a practitioner, not as, as a practitioner. Here we go. Watch again. Ready? See now what we've done? We're using a bigger ball. It compensates for any surface. It compensates for any surface. In fact, we don't do this on grass. This is, in fact, basically for any smooth surface. Any smooth surface. So there we go. Right, now I can do the authentic feedback. You can see again, start and say, there we go. do high performance. I'll be running up and down here with the kids coming here. What? And now you can see that was station four running. Station five passing. Station six. Fundamentals of hockey. Now we're doing the tackle. So again. Don't follow, 
What a wonderful way to end the day. I don't know about you, but I am tired of just watching. <laughs> Mr. Dolly, you didn't disappoint me. You said you're going to rock the hall, and you did. Thank you very much. We at the end of our first day, colleagues, for those people that stayed here all the way, we really, really, really appreciate that. And we see Miss Dudley is still here. That's why she's Miss Dudley. Thank you, Miss Dudley, for being here. And I'm going to give over to my beautiful partner for the day. He's not a beast anymore now. He's my partner. Uh, Jimmy Landers to end the day. From my side, thank you. Enjoy your evening. See you tomorrow morning. I've got a strict boss. Be on time, please. Ladies and gents, I won't keep you very long. Um, where's Mr. Dolly? Uh, we played with shirts and skins, so there wasn't bibs. Yeah. Um, I think the excitement at the end probably ties into, as I promised everyone right at the start, the energy Ms. Gordon and Dudley would bring. So I think it combined very well. Please travel safe, please arrive back tomorrow on time, and I'm sure you've got a lot more questions, and we hope that we can answer tomorrow for you. Thank you very much.